Uh, welcome to the initial public hearing for the inquiry into budget estimates 2022 to 2023. Uh, I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on the lands on which we are meeting today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today and anybody who is watching this uh, online. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to make special mention and remind members and witnesses that the New South Wales Parliament has a partnership arrangement with the parliaments of the autonomous region of Bougainville and the Solomon Islands. This twinning arrangement provides the opportunity to enhance relations between our parliaments, exchange information and learn from each other. Many members of parliament, including those who have been fortunate enough to visit Bougainville as part of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association program have found the twinning arrangement to be extremely informative and rewarding. At our hearing on Friday, Minister Elliott made offensive and racist comments about Bourbonville. On behalf of the committee, I wish to apologise for these unnecessary and derisive comments being aired as part of our proceedings. We value our relationship with the Bourbonville Parliament and can assure the people of Bourbonville that the bigoted views expressed by Minister Elliott are not reflective of the views of this Parliament. I welcome Minister Sam Faraway and accompanying officials to this hearing. Today, the committee will examine the proposed expenditure for the portfolio of regional transport and roads. <coughs> Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's hearing is being broadcast live via the Parliament's website. The proceedings are also being recorded and a transcript will be placed on the committee's website once it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings. All witnesses in budget estimates have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness could only answer if they have more time or if certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, and these circumstances only, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, they should do so through the committee staff. Minister, I remind you and the officers accompanying you that you are indeed free to pass notes and refer directly to your advisors seated at the table behind you. Finally, could everyone please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing? All witnesses will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Ms. Minister Faraway, I remind you, you do not need to be sworn, as you've already sworn an oath to your office as a Member of Parliament. I'd also like to remind the following witnesses that you do not need to be sworn, as you have been sworn at an earlier Budget Estimates hearing before this committee, uh, and that is Mr. Rob Sharp, Ms. Camilla Drover, uh, Ms. Tara McCarthy, Mr. Juice de Kock, and Mr. Bernard Carlon. Um, so I will now look, at the, um, look for the other witnesses witnesses to each in turn state your full name, position, title and agency and then swear either an oath or an affirmation. Uh, the words of both the oath and the affirmation are on the cards uh, on the table in front of you. Um, who are we going to start with? I think perhaps you, Mr Fuller. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Matthew Fuller uh, of Transport for New South Wales. Sorry, Deputy Secretary of the Regional Transport Division of uh, Transport for New South Wales. Swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Mr Merrick. Morning, Chair. Uh, I'm Dale Merrick, Chief Operating Officer for New South Wales Trainlink. Solemnly and sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, thank you. Mr Alloway? Yeah, Peter Alloway, uh, Chief Customer Officer for the Regional Outer Metropolitan Division of Transport for New South Wales. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Uh, looking for Mr Hayes. Hayes. <coughs> Hi, Anthony Hayes, um, Executive Director for Community in Place um, at Transport for New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, Ms Wise. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Barbara Wise, Executive Director <coughs> of Transport <coughs> Partnerships in the Regional and Outer Metropolitan Division of Transport for New South Wales, and I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Um, Ms Hayden. I'm Cynthia Hayden, Executive Director, Planning and Programs in Regional and Outer Metropolitan Division and Transport for New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so today's hearing will be conducted from 9.30 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. with a 15-minute break at 11 a.m. Uh, we're joined by the Minister in the morning only, uh, and in the afternoon we will hear from departmental witnesses from 2 p.m. to 5.15 p.m. Uh, with a 15-minute break at 3.30 p.m. During these sessions, there will be questions from the opposition and crossbench members only. If required, an additional 15 minutes is allocated at the end of the morning and afternoon sessions for government questions. Thank you all for your attendance today. Uh, we'll begin with questions from the opposition. Ah, good morning, Minister. Morning, Peter. Um, just a few questions, if I can, to begin with. Um, former Minister for Transport, Andrew Constance, said on the 27th of February 2020, and I quote, it is vital that transport for New South Wales ensures that measures are in place to provide clear pathways to safety for um, community members and emergency service vehicles, um, uh, end of quote. Okay. The um, Regional and Outer Metropolitan Division Asset and Services Plan um, called for the development development of a resilient transport network program. Can you please let us know where that program's up to and how much funding has been allocated to it? Uh, certainly don't have the answer on hand. I might refer um, uh, to either Rob Sharp or Matt Fuller on that point. Uh, the road resilience plan uh, is focused on ensuring access, particularly during uh, bushfires and uh, floods. Uh, there's been a review, particularly in the southern regions, uh, where we had extensive old timber trees falling onto roads and unable to be removed. Uh, there has been a program focused uh, in on clearing those trees. Uh, that has actually enabled uh, a safe passageway through that in the case of bushfires. Uh, that program continues, and I'll just hand over to um, uh, Mr Fuller. Thank you, Mr Sharp and Minister. Um, yeah, as the Secretary has said, the, the program obviously is ongoing, and particularly if you uh, think about the recent events uh, across the state and uh, what we've seen in terms of uh, the resilience requirements. Obviously, uh, resilience is a key component of everything we do in the Regional um, Division of Transport in terms of it starts in the very early assessment and planning of the works that we're doing, our major project delivery, uh, through to what we're thinking about in terms of how we respond uh, to events that happen around the state, uh, not just natural disaster, but other, other events that uh, prompt us to think about access and ensuring that uh, connections, are the vital connections that exist for communities. So uh, we have undertaken a, a, an enormous amount of work on resilience of the network. Uh, there is, um, you know, it, it's been well publicised, obviously, the, the issues across the state in terms of uh, uh, connectivity to different regions at different times during the uh, unprecedented events that we've seen through natural disasters, but also the sustained wet and what that has meant for our network. Uh, but the planning, uh, as Mr Sharp said, is ongoing. At the moment, specifically, there's a number of things that are being undertaken. Uh, planning works in terms of the mapping and uh, assessing vulnerability points across the network. Uh, we, of course, will be working in with the independent flood inquiry uh, recommendations that uh, highlight uh, a state-based view in terms of uh, critical connections and evacuation routes, uh, the other areas of the, uh, of the independent flood inquiry that uh, talk about, uh, you know, different forms of modelling and things. So there's lots going on in that space at the moment. Uh, I think at the moment, uh, sorry, one of the other things that we're, we're doing is uh, we go back after every single event and we assess what has happened on the network and what we can do to improve the network in an ongoing can sense. Minister, can I <clears throat> just zero in now and basically ask... Um, what have you actually done? Is there a list of, presumably, given, given the importance of this um, and the amount of effort you say you're putting in, there would be a 
there would be a, a list of the projects that have been completed, and there presumably would be a list of projected projects that you would complete, say, over the next two financial years. Uh, are they available? Uh, yes, well, we can certainly table those, but obviously through mm -hmm. uh, February, March and April of this year, um, as has already been highlighted by the Secretary and Deputy Secretary, large parts of the network were significantly uh, impacted. Um, uh, so we will get you a list of what we have on hand um, before the end of estimates. Thank you. So what, what you've done, what you plan to do over the next two financial year years, and, and I also ask about the funding allocation, Minister. <coughs> Inform us of what that is. For? Uh, um, for the um, Resilient Transport Network Program. Okay, it's, yeah, yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. um, so is this in regard to the $312.5 million that uh, we announced through the Betterment Fund, or are you referring to mm -hmm. um, what we've spent in the 2021 financial year? Um, both. I'm asking what, um, what was your allocation and um, expenditure, and now what is the proposed allocation? How much is actually... OK, well, it was estimated... Um, yeah, OK, firstly, it was estimated that approximately mm -hmm. uh, half a billion dollars, $500 million, was spent on flood recovery efforts during the 2021 financial year across uh, New South Wales. And in April of this year, mm -hmm. um, I was able to negotiate with the former federal government a uh, $312.5 million transport and roads, regional transport and roads uh, betterment fund uh, for northern New South Wales. This fund will provide funding that is in addition to natural disaster uh, declaration funding, whether that be category B or D funding. Uh, this is essentially the first time in this state's history that we will have um, some form of what could be referred to as a betterment fund. Um, and that fund will assist uh, the 26 LGAs in northern New South Wales that were disaster declared uh, post that March natural disaster and flooding event uh, that, that will assist those 26 LGAs uh, to build back infrastructure better. And, and that is exactly what the community has been calling on. Uh, they, want, they want their infrastructure to be built back better. That will mean that we need to build resilience into that infrastructure, that we will need to build it back so we can sustain weather Thank events you, Minister. more so often. If I if I ask for a, um, a breakdown of the... Um, allocations that have been made from the Resilient Infrastructure Project Development Fund. Would, would I be able to obtain that? Well, I, I will, I will endeavour to get you that information uh, before the end of estimates. Is there such a fund? Uh, well, that is, that is different to the fund that I just quoted from. The fund I just quoted from was, was the Regional Transport and Recovery Package that I announced uh, with the Federal Government in uh, April of this year, and that is uh, separate to the estimated expenditure of half a billion dollars that we spent uh, last financial year. Um, so I will get mm. you to see what more details we have on hand um, before the end of estimates. Thank you. To help me understand, Minister, maybe if you could also um, give us a list, and please take it on notice, of the number of different um, funds that are being drawn upon um, to actually provide um, the resilience that you're talking about. It seems from what you've said there are a number of different funds and, and allocations coming from various, um, um, various sources and it would be useful, I think, for the committee to know what well, those Well, I, I, I think it's something that can be explored mm -hmm. if in more detail, uh, definitely in the afternoon session. But what I would say, Mr Primrose, is that you are right. The government has more than one funding stream and program available to uh, communities across regional New South Wales that have been impacted by natural disasters, whether that be uh, the, the um, uh, bushfire event, uh, where there was specific funding available uh, for those communities impacted by bushfires, um, the, the flooding that has occurred over the last two years, to be frank, and obviously compounding to what was that significant event in March of this year, which triggered my negotiations with the former federal government to establish uh, the Regional Transport and Road Recovery Package. So we're happy to get you... Um, details on the different uh, programs by the end of estimates today, but I think the, re the reality is, is there is a lot of funding available for regional communities. This is in addition, Mr Primrose, to obviously natural disaster declaration funding, whether that be Category B or D funding. It is in addition to the almost oh, 65 to $69 million uh, that the New South Wales Government, through Transport for New South Wales, was able to advance uh, local government areas 
measures uh, in the uh, in a direct response to the March event that was allowing councils the cash flow to be able to reconnect local roads quickly to outlining areas yes, to fill potholes mm, uh, in terms the of funding that they needed immediately to address yes, I appreciate uh, that and, and welcome your commitment to providing that list could that list also please contain um, I'd be interested in the figures of funding available for each of those projects, each of those programs that, that you'll, you'll be providing by the end of estimates. So how about we be clear exactly what mm. you're asking for? So you would like to know what resilience uh, infrastructure packages that relate to road infrastructure yes. is available? Yes. What from uh, this year's budget? Oh, let, let's, make, let's begin with this year's budget yep. and, um, and how much funding is available in each. Okay, okay, well, all right, we, we will endeavour mm. to come back to you before the end of estimates. I appreciate and that, Minister. This. If not, we'll ask it at the supplementary. It would help our questions to be more accurate. Right. Um, and um, can I ask, has Transport for New South Wales quantified road damage that was caused by the recent um, flood events? Um, we have been able to quantify some statistics, yes, on um, our state road network. I've spoken about this, Mr Primrose, uh, in Parliament several times, but just to confirm that the latest stats um, that we have, some of the key statistics is 2,000 kilometres of roads uh, sustained damage. That includes state and local roads. Um, the initial estimates indicate that the damage to the state, regional and local road network from the March events is $1.5 billion. Um, and to confirm, approximately $1.3 billion of that $1.5 is the estimated cost uh, to repair the local road network. That is obviously the road network owned and administered by local government and an estimated $150 million cost uh, to Minister repairs that, to our have state. Have you been able to disaggregate that by local government areas? Sorry? Have you been able to disaggregate that by local government areas? Well, I suspect to a degree, mm -hmm. which you can explore um, later in the day, the specifics, but yes, we are working mm -hmm. directly. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the March event for Northern New South Wales I'm referring to. That, 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 those figures relate to um, uh, the regional transport network. Obviously, we've discussed state versus local roads, um, but it has been informed mm -hmm. by the LGA. So it's where Transport for New South Wales is working and collaborating directly on the ground with those local councils. That is clearly... So you have disaggregated working. it, and um, and that uh, that's a document that is available to the committee? Well, it's internal data that Transport for New South Wales uh, have, and I'm sure that we could uh, uh, supply some of that uh, informed data that we have throughout the day. Um, thank you. Well, how about we, we get that um, when it's available? Thank you, Minister. Um, Peter, can I just... Um, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, Minister, to your credit, you have updated the Parliament about um, some of those figures. The $1.5 billion figure, without checking back to your parliamentary comments, is that slightly higher than the update you gave the Parliament? No, that is... Uh, I would mm. uh, believe that is the most up-to-date data and that would reflect the last about time the I spoke same. about it in yeah. Parliament. Understood. So again, it, it would be, just to be clear, approximately yeah. $150 million to our state highway and road network, approximately, um, you know, $1.3 billion to the local regional, uh, the local and regional road network. Yes, yeah, understood. And that, what about uh, assessments of damage? That's for the March event, assessments of damage for the subsequent events? Do we have those? Yes, what, for Northern New South Wales? Uh, for, well, for our regional road, our regional transport network. Well, yes, Transport for New South Wales uh, are constantly working with local government right across regional New South Wales, assessing uh, flooding and damaged events, whether it be the March event, whether it be the subsequent event after that, whether it be the flooding events, obviously, through 2020 and 2021 also, where, where claims are lodged for, from local government through Resilience mm. New South Wales, through disaster declaration funding to repair that infrastructure. Mm. Uh, putting the, that, those comments aside, you've been very specific on the northern damage to the transport network. Do you have that sort of specific information for the subsequent damage? It's been a particularly rough few months. 
Uh, well, we have other data. Obviously, if we talk about um, across the board, $30 million has been the estimated cost in repairs to our commuter rail lines um, within the regional and outer metro uh, network. Now, that's that's a statewide uh, figure. That's not mm. just... Um, yep. I don't think it's consolidated to, um, to just northern New South Wales. Mm. Um, uh, 73 state roads were closed, obviously, during the, the, the March flooding event. We've discussed the over 2,000 kilometres uh, of damage to state road network uh, uh, from that March flooding event. Um, but yeah, we, we can get Minister, you probably... we're still in March though. Is I'm really interested in that post-March period, given it's been so tough. And as you know, uh, damage on damage is even harder to... So the short answer is yes, transport are working yeah. with local government areas right across the state in the events before March mm. and post-March. Mm. Um, and I, I would ask if, if Mr Fuller has anything yeah. else we want to add, but th there would be more data we could yeah, draw on you. from transport for I New South I appreciate it. Wales. And it's to my colleague's question, what's the assessment of the total of the damage to the regional transport network post those March events? Yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. Basically, um, what Transport has been doing is uh, obviously on our own part in terms of the statewide network and then on behalf of local government is compiling and providing that information into uh, the State Recovery Centre in terms of a statewide view and dashboard about uh, the impact and the cumulative impact on the road networks uh, overall. Um, the numbers that the Minister talk about, uh, some of those are estimates that have been provided by local government areas. They haven't necessarily been quantity surveyed or they haven't had projects that have been developed specifically, but on you know the, the face of it, local government areas have provided us with a breakdown of the Mr. number Mr. of Fuller, issues. Mr. Fuller, this is useful context, but it's not the question you were asked. Do we have an estimate? of the post-March events damage to the regional transport network? We have a cumulative estimate and we can provide that for you, yes. And do we know what it is that you can you provide it now? It, it, roughly it's about $1.5 billion, but I'll get the exact figures and... and that's uh, and on top back. of the March... No, the, the 1.5 is a cumulative total uh, that picks up the February 28, March events and then July events. And uh, July, and it's statewide, it not statewide. just for the north. Yep. And okay. it has been a number that has been sort of being further and further to find. Um, mm -hmm. There was a, you know, if, if you like, uh, in the early stages, some of right. the estimates Thanks. were a bit rougher than what they are now, so there's a bit more detail. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, that number is being uh, communicated mm -hmm. through our, our right. central area that works in with the State Recovery Committee yep. uh, and, and provided on a statewide view. Thank you. Um, Minister, um, many local councils have obviously accessed um, the disaster funding to repair infrastructure, but one of the things that um, causes many of them to scratch their heads is the government decision to not allow them to use their own day labour um, to undertake those works and to require them to use contractors. Um, why has the government made that decision? Yeah, but I, I, I think I was just referring, just referring to my colleague because I don't believe that that is accurate. That it is not mandated that they, they cannot use their own internal workforce and crews. Uh, it's an opt-in option. It is a decision they have, and the reality is, Mr. Primrose, is that we we can't be mandating um, uh, who can and can't do this stuff because there are capacity mm. challenges across regional New South Wales, in particular mm. where there have been natural disasters. We need, uh, we need. As, as many people involved in the process as possible. You know, many hands make light work and the reality is, is that we are working uh, as closely as ever with local government uh, through, um, uh, through our processes to ensure that when we rebuild this infrastructure, we are also offering the expertise, the advice or even additional out-of-scope resources to help them deliver that. Thank you. So, Minister, I can go back to those same councils now and say um, that you think it would be nuts to require them to re use contractors instead of their own. Well, no, my point is, is they have a choice. Yeah, but, but yeah, OK. You say they've, they've definitely got a choice. They don't have to use contractors. They can use their day labour. They, they have a choice. It is a... Is a yeah. Well, that, that, that certainly... If, if, if they have opted in to do that, obviously. Okay. So, well, that, so and, and, that, and just let me finish, Mr. Yep. Primrose. That, that yep. is obviously at the prerogative of the local okay. council yep. as to whether mm. they opt in to that process. It is not something um, that we have defined that is, is cut and dry, that is either a complete yes or a complete no. It is at the discretion of local council whether they've opted in. And, you know, you'd suggest that more council should opt in if they want to use their local workforce. Yep. That, that's um, good news. 
news, and I'll pass that back to the minister. Thank and, you. And, and just, just one last point. Not one council I have met with, and I've met with every, uh, almost every northern New South Wales council from the uh, March event, and also the overwhelming majority of councils across regional New South Wales, not all, but most, no one, not one council has raised that with me. Okay, good. Um, the Premier has been talking about um, build back better for Lismore. Um, what does that look like for road rebuilding, please, Minister? Well, it goes exactly to the $312.5 million uh, program that we <coughs> announced in April. Um, now, that, uh, that is, as I said, the first time in New South Wales history that we will have a betterment fund. Now, I've spoken about this in Parliament many a time, and uh, this is $156 million uh, for a 50 50 contribution model from the New South Wales government and obviously a 50% contribution from the Commonwealth. Um, this is exactly what the local community have been calling for, whether it be council staff, general managers, mayors, business chambers, just community leaders and community members that, that, uh, that communities want their infrastructure rebuilt. And I think they appreciate that with the scale, size and scope of the damage, in particular in northern New South Wales, that we can't rebuild that back immediately or overnight. It will take time. Uh, it is a journey where we, we need to go on that journey together on. But um, if they they do now have the certainty that they have a funding program and pool of funds available uh, to draw down on or to apply for uh, very shortly, that will allow them um, uh, to build back better, to do exactly that, whether it is replacing a timber bridge with a concrete bridge so when the waters reside at the next uh, weather event that that piece of infrastructure is still there and can be reconnecting those communities far quicker than what we've done in the past. Do you have a, um, um, a program and some dates um, for the completion of those you know, individual works? For, for well, that? well, firstly, some of the works we're talking about are incredibly complex. Mm. They are uh, of a scale that even locals in that region and uh, directors of technical services within councils have never seen in their working career or lifetime. So it's going to be a complex journey ahead. Uh, firstly, we have uh, obviously announced that that funding is available. Uh, I have worked uh, with the new Commonwealth Government in Canberra. Obviously, there's been an election, there's a new government. Um, they're getting their head across it. Uh, the government agencies have been working together very closely where we will be opening these applications in the very near future. Transport for New South Wales um, will be doing the assessment and the, and uh, of, of these applications and it's fair to say um, the crew and team within transport doing the assessments won't be surprised of what applications are being put in because the discussions have already been taking place for the last I would say for six, seven, eight weeks between uh, transport and local councils about what are their top three projects that they wish to submit in the first round or, or of this funding uh, when it is open very shortly uh, so they can work with them. We've even gone as far to, to have a new pilot model in Lismore where we have embedded a very smart gentleman by the name of Andrew who is going to project manage all the road in infrastructure, road and transport infrastructure rebuild, uh, manage that internally for Lismore City Council. Mm. He has started and he reports to the to the general manager of Lismore City Council uh, and this model has worked. We have we have tried this before in another council area. Um, Lismore City authority. Council wanted this sort of help. They wanted to be able to have someone help them manage holistically their rebuild and to have an expert in there that, uh, that can deal with the complexity of some of these these rebuilds. Does Andrew the have a last name? Yeah, <laughs> we're just seeking an assurance it's not the former minister. <laughs> it's, not, it's not Andrew Constance. <laughs> right, good. Um, minister, uh, I wanted to ask you about the Great Western Highway upgrade, which I believe does fall within your portfolio. It's always difficult to know which project falls in which transport Talk about it every portfolio. parliamentary sitting. You should know it sits with me. Ms. <laughs> <laughs> um, I understand that the project cost is around $8 billion. Um, yes, 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 yes.
but that the business case for the project hasn't been released. Are you able to tell us what the um, the benefit cost ratio is for that project? Uh, not today, because it, we, the New South Wales government does not release business cases whilst we are in the market tendering projects uh, uh, within within the marketplace. We are in the market mm -hmm. as we speak uh, here today uh, on east and west sections, and uh, uh, but the business case is there. It has uh, been through the in, uh, infrastructure. New South Wales Assurance Gateway process. Uh, it also has a infrastructure, it's also listed uh, with Infrastructure Australia's priority list uh, and with the 34 kilometres of uh, duplic road surface duplication works that we are uh, pushing ahead with, it has an 80% Commonwealth Government contribution mm -hmm. to. Um, so it has been through the INSW and Infrastructure Australia processes uh, and um, it, we, we don't release, you know, business cases on something that is you know, contractually in the market uh, and, and of a sensitive nature, but in time okay, to come... Okay, but in terms of the benefit-cost ratio, can you not tell us that? Um, well, it obviously passes it obviously passes in order to be uh, to pass through the INSW assurance gateway process and obviously to be listed to, pass a lot. to be listed on the in, uh, infrastructure australia <coughs> priority list uh, it clearly uh, it clearly obviously passes the criteria that we have I'm set. not sure that follows um, well i think if if you'd like specifics around the business case and the processes camilla drover is here today and she is um, probably the best person to ask in that respect miss drover can you tell me the number No, and in fact, we're, we're finalising um, the business case for the central section as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we're still uh, confirming um, the costs associated with that, which would inform. Okay, the so we case. don't we don't actually have a number. It's not that you won't tell me. It's that we don't have one. I haven't finalised it. Okay, particularly understood. for that uh, central section. Um, Minister, I understand um, that we haven't had the most stringent type of environmental assessment um, for this project. Um, it clearly runs through one of the world's most important protected areas. Um, can you explain why you haven't questioned Transport for New South Wales' decision not to, to have the most stringent type of environmental assessment for this project? Well, it's um, firstly, Ms. Boyd, uh, we have uh, REFs in place. We have, and firstly, the Great Western Highway is comprised of obviously four major upgrades, uh, and they're all, you know, unique, obviously, in some some part in their nature as well. But we do have the REF processes that are underway, and we have three of them: the Katoomba to Blackheath, which is That's our right. east, east section. We have the Medlow Bath upgrade, which is assessed by its own REF, and obviously the Little Hartley to Lithgow, the west. Mm -hmm. section. Uh, but you don't area. have an all-project EIS, well, do you? Well, no, because we are expanding an existing road corridor, um, and I believe that the review of environmental factors process uh, and criteria is appropriate for uh, is appropriate for uh, the upgrade with the road surface duplication that we're setting out to do. I uh, did engage with the community, and there were concerns that uh, that each individual REF would be only considered by itself, but we made those changes several months ago mm -hmm. where those REFs will be... Uh will be linked in cons in considerations from REF to REF so that there is an understanding uh, of the of the outcomes uh, of what comes out of those REFs on one versus the other. And it's it's fair to say that um, the three upgrades that we're talking about with road surface duplication is different to the central section. It is different to building a tunnel. And as we progress the central section, um, we will move uh, mm -hmm. to an EIS for the tunnel, for the central section, because in my view, um, it would be required as our processes, but it is also a new piece of infrastructure that will have an impact on uh, the environment and it is not part mm. of the existing piece of infrastructure. It's okay. a new tunnel. But so by, by definition, we should see uh, a EIS for the central section. But Transport for New South Wales's own legal advisers recommended that Transport for New South Wales conduct an environmental impact statement for the entire proposed upgrade. That's not been done. Why was that advice not followed? 
Well, I believe that the review of environmental factors uh, process is appropriate uh, for expanding uh, existing road corridors and road infrastructure. Uh, is that on the basis of your extensive environmental science no, it's, knowledge? No, it's, it's, it's based on that we are expanding and enhancing existing road infrastructure. On you are, but you're doing it through the, well, through the Greater Boyd, Blue Mountains World question, Heritage Area. Answer it, but, With um, respect, Minister, your, your answers are very long. Um, the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area, one of the world's most important protected areas, there's been a recommendation that you you conduct an environmental impact statement for the entire proposed upgrade. You've chosen not to do that because you personally are satisfied that it's not necessary because it's a road. No, I, I have consulted with Transport for New South Wales and we, mm. I took on board community consultation and feedback that they wanted the uh, they wanted the um, considerations that come out of REFs to one to be considered against the other which is what we agreed to do months ago which was a change in policy and I did that on the back of community feedback and again myself uh, I believe that the review of environmental factors is an appropriate is an appropriate a process to use when looking to enhance and expand and existing road corridor. That was not I, the legal I, advice I of Transport for I New accept, South Wales, though. I what makes you think that you have I accept that when you knowledge. build new infrastructure that is not part of the existing corridor, like the 11-kilometre tunnel that will form part of the central section, mm -hmm. I accept that we will be needing to do a full EIS on that infrastructure, because that is new infrastructure that is not part of an existing corridor or an existing tunnel, a uh, piece of tunnel infrastructure. What are you worried that an entire EIS for the entire project might show? Because if you understand anything about um, what you know, what an EIS would actually look at, and if you understood anything about, um, for instance, wildlife corridors and the like, you would understand the need to have an entire um, all project EIS as recommended by Transport for New South Wales as legal advisors. What are you worried that, uh, uh, that one would actually show? Not, I'm not worried about anything. I've been very clear. I believe that the review of environmental factors process is appropriate for the road surface duplication that is part of the east and west sections as well as the Medlow Bath upgrade. Um, can you give us an accurate estimate of how much additional federal money will be needed to finance the tunnel? Um, I'll pass over. Uh, I'm happy to talk about um, dialogue I've had with the federal government, but in terms of the uh, approximate costings to date, I might hand over to Camilla Drover. Yeah, so as I said earlier, we're still finalising the business case for the central section and uh, also when we do the EIS for that central section, we'll also understand um, the impacts and the planning conditions. Those two activities will form up uh, what the expected budget is for that central section and therefore we can approach um, the federal government with, with more certainty about what the, uh, the funding gap is. Thank you. Minister, if that funding is not made available or sufficient funding uh, from the federal government's not made available, will you instead be considering having two shorter, um, less costly tunnels, one under Blackheath and one under Mount Victoria? Well, firstly, it has uh, been decided that uh, the vision uh, of the New South Wales government is to create uh, as much efficiency as possible and uh, for uh, the Great Western Highway. And you've heard me say over and over again that you know this government is planning and and has has a real vision and motivation to make the Western Highway great again. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I think an 11-kilometre long road tunnel is the way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it will reduce um, uh, congestion by up to 30 minutes in okay, peak travel times. Sure, I understand and that that's the preference, but if the funding doesn't come through from the feds, is it true that Transport for New South Wales is considering having two shorter tunnels? Well, uh, firstly, what I would say, Ms Boyd, is that on the on the initial advice uh, and findings that have been done on the concept and design of two short tunnels and one long tunnel, mm -hmm. uh, when I made that decision on behalf of the New South Wales Government on settling on what it would look like, uh, some of the considerations were that there was not a great deal of cost difference uh, between having two short tunnels and one long tunnel, and there was also better environmental outcomes for the project to have one long tunnel. Okay, that's comforting. Thank you. Mr. Benasiak. Chair, welcome, Minister. Um, 
Just picking up on your answer to the Honourable Peter Primrose about uh, meeting all the local councils, and have they raised concerns about Resilience New South Wales's role in, in this process, in terms of it making it a lot more difficult in terms of submitting claims and, and, and getting money to them and getting projects underway? Have you heard that concern? With regard to the March flooding event? Or even the previous ones? Um, I have, uh, councils have raised with me um, uh, dialogue that they've had with Resilience New South Wales on the 2020 and 2021 flooding events. I'm yep. talking more broadly across the entire part of regional New South Wales. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say a lot of councils. I would say a, a very small handful have raised with me the grading process, um, the, the work that is done between uh, Resilience New South Wales and Transport for New South Wales. Where um, those concerns were raised with me, I, I have raised them with um, the, the Minister responsible for Resilience New South Wales. Steph Cook, I've also spoken internally within Transport and we've been able to progress some of those issues. But I would say, Mr Vanaziak, that I haven't had an overwhelming uh, view put to me by councils that there is, you know, underlying issues. I have put uh, have had put to me some specific small issues by councils and some of them were actually um, probably more in Western New South Wales. Well, have you said you've been able to progress some of those issues. What ones haven't you been able to progress? Well, in fairness, I think we've actually progressed every um, of the small handful of issues that have been raised with me. I think um, to hand we've been able to progress all of them. But we also need to, to answer your question as well, um, there hasn't been that concern with recent flooding and natural disaster events because... Uh, I've worked very closely with my bureaucrats, with my agency, to ensure that transport for New South Wales is on the front foot, in particular um, post-March events. That's why we advanced that almost, I think it was 65 to $69 million uh, to councils to get them uh, that funding and cash flow straight away within a week of the flooding event uh, to reconnect roads, uh, to, to deploy more crews, to hire equipment. Uh, we're focused very much on getting the job done, supporting them. We sent in geotechnical uh, advisors, we sent in engineers, we've offered project managers. Um, we are now going to the next step in our collaboration with local government, saying this isn't just all about money. Sometimes we may have technical advice, resources, um, or the way we advance that money is we literally paid for it from transport and we, as Transport for New South Wales, claimed it back from the federal government through Resilience New South yes. Wales. So, so it, it sounds from that description in terms of what you've, what you've done in terms of stepping up a bit more, that you've almost sidestepped Resilience New South Wales. No, no, I think in fairness, in fairness, Resilience New South Wales have a massive task ahead of them. They have communities uh, like we've seen in Lismore that have massive community issues with community infrastructure, with a housing crisis that they are working day in and day out uh, to ensure that they address. Um, there was definitely a role um, for transport to, to lead from the front in and around the roads, regional roads and transport space. And that's exactly what we've done. We are feeding our operations, what we do, directly into um, uh, the, the NRRC. We're feeding it into Resilience New South Wales. I update Minister Cook. Uh, I update the Deputy Premier. Um, and it was important that these communities have so much to deal with um, that we, as Transport for New South Wales, as, as regional and outer metro division, we can lead from the front and deal, because uh, we have the right people, the right expertise, the resources, and the ability to deploy uh, those resources with the relationships that we have on the ground to get the job done. Because, let's face it, all the community care about, all I care about, and Transport is getting in there, getting the job done, and making sure we're effective, we're responsive, uh, and that we're getting that connectivity back for those communities. Sure. Can I just... Um, thank you for that. Can I just go to another particular issue with Wee War High School and, I guess, transport's role in that with in terms of the traffic management and... So what was... Sorry, what was Wee the War High School, again? the new proposed Wee War High School site and Transport for New South Wales' involvement in, mm -hmm. I guess, mm -hmm. their view in terms of how traffic will be managed in terms of dropping off and picking up kids, etc., and bus routes. Um, mm -hmm. And so you are aware that your agency raised concerns 
over the proposed traffic plan um, for that new site. <clears throat> I'll just. Um no, no, I'm. I'm. This is. I'm not aware of it, Mr. Manaziak, and okay. it appears that um, the the agency isn't either. Okay. Well, maybe to assist, I might get the secretary to hand you up. A, uh, mm -hmm. But I am familiar of the new Wee War um, High School. I've I've visited that site. Um, I've I spent a fair bit of time in the Wee War community. Very good people, and been able to get a lot of oh, a lot of investment and action in Wee it's, War. It's a it's, great place. It's <laughs> it's definitely uh, mm -hmm. long overdue. Uh, that school. Um, but my concern here directly relates to the safety of the kids. Having stood on enough, uh, stood stood outside a number of schools in my previous career, uh, I, I know how easily it can go wrong when you add kids and cars. I'll uh, take that on notice for the moment, <coughs> Mr. Benaziak, and I'll endeavour to come back to you before the end of estimates. Okay. Well, I've got. I do have some follow-up questions on it. Would you like me to wait? I think if if you wouldn't mind waiting, let me see if we can get. Okay. Um, sure. Unless uh, I think if uh, allow m myself and the agency to perhaps uh, come back to you during well, estimates today um, to allow for those follow-up questions. No problems at all. Can I just um, go to the Tamworth Intermodal and appreciate this is now a project that council has a responsibility for. But I'm my line of question is essentially around Transport New South Wales' role in terms of the upgrade of the line. What they what they knew, how they made their assessments as to the the viability of investing $34.5 million in upgrading that line, um, given that there is still no business case for the Tamworth Intermodal and the business park. Um, so, Minister, can you tell me when, and I appreciate this is before your time, can you tell me when Transport for New South Wales first became involved? in this proposal? Well, firstly, um, the 35 odd million dollar commitment mm -hmm. is for the um the upgrades of the rail, the, the rail uh, reinstatement. Yes. Now that's funded, obviously, uh, as, as uh, from New South Wales government, but that's not funded from a Transport for New South Wales funding program. Uh, it is administered. It's yeah. administered by Transport for New South Wales, but that funding comes uh, from uh, the Department of Regional New South Wales. I, I actually think your question is better directed um, uh, to the Deputy Premier, who's obviously. I, I've asked the I, I asked the Deputy Premier these questions and estimates and, and previously and, and didn't really get satisfactory well, he's, answers. He's, but he's, he's in the other room. Tonight, I know, but so some of those... Head on over. <laughs> I would. Some of those answers raise questions about Transport for New South Wales involvement, particularly the fact that he mentions that you now own that asset. So whether you administer the funding or not, you now own that asset in terms of the, those upgraded lines, which essentially go to nowhere. Because, well, no, no, because no, the intermodal, the intermodal, from all reports, has now been delayed, with no indication as to when it will be completed. So to to, to confirm, the thirty five million dollar investment is is from Department of Regional New South Wales, administered yes. by Transport for New South Wales. It is for the entire project, um, which includes the rail reinstatement uh, yeah, and which works been, on the which intermodal. Been I, I've been there, Mr. Benazzi. So I know exactly I. what you're talking about. I've been there with the local member, Kevin Anderson. The project is finished. The project is but finished. I know. I appreciate and, the railway line is, is. It is now up to Tamworth Regional Council and a private operate a cube uh, to commence operations or to commence their works uh, mm. uh, at the intermodal terminal in Tamworth. And, and the, late, the latest advice I have is that that will be happening in the very near future. When, was, when did you receive that advice? Because well, it was I, in the news, I think it was a week and a half ago, saying it's been delayed. No, no, the, the, the latest advice I have is that it is now up to Tamworth Regional Council uh, with private operator Cube uh, to commence their overall operations and their construction and mobilisation works at that intermodal terminal. Um, and the latest I've heard is that that, that is... Um, uh, that is happening in due course. It's happening in the near future. You'd have to you'd have to direct the question to Tamworth Regional Council. Okay, do, my questions are directed to you in terms of transport's own ownership of this line. You do you agree you own this line that's been upgraded that currently stops before you know before it, the intermodal project. Do you own that line? My understanding is that you do.
I, I, I'll, I'll throw to Matt Fuller to, to answer your question, but obviously we Transport for New South Wales did own the existing rail corridor and line. Now it's about now putting that into operation as an intermodal terminal. Um, so Mr Fuller can can uh, confirm the specifics around that, but the point should also be made that all the works uh, that needed to be administered by Transport for New South Wales have been completed. Um, uh, you'd refer to, I suppose I can confirm now that Transport have been advised that there are some delays in finalising uh, the, the final part of the terminal and executing the contract between Cube, which is a logistics, a private company, and their baseload customers. But that is really a question I think that you need to ask uh, probably Tamworth mm. Regional Council, who are working directly with Cube, with regard to transport for New South Wales involvement, our involvement is now complete. Mm. The works are completed that we administered on behalf of the $35 million investment uh, made via the Department of Regional New South Wales on behalf of the New South Wales My government. concerns are about the due diligence that your agency took in administering that $34.5 million, which I might, my time has elapsed, so unless Mr. Fuller has a quick answer. Right. In, yeah. I, I'm um, very, very happy to say, look, it, it's not just transport administering the funds. We, we were responsible for reinstating the non-operational line that was part of the country rail network, which we have done. Mm. So the $35 million is a regional New South Wales administered and governed program. Transport was delivering our part uh, in, in the line reinstatement, and obviously the, the funding relates to the overall program project and the development of the intermodal as a whole. You had no, inv quickly, you had no involvement in the uh, cost-benefit ratio calculation? We, we would have obviously provided assessments around cost of reinstating the line, including things like the level crossings and the other appropriate uh, infrastructure that was re required to support that. So we would have obviously been involved in terms of the assessment, um, but not in terms of the establishment. It's a question okay, directly, we might, we it's a question directly for regional New South Wales because it's their funding stream and program. It's their criteria. We literally are nuts and bolts operational around line reinstatement, the the works in and around the, the CRN uh, line and network, uh, we have done what we need to do. So uh, I think the, the issue is is that your, your questions um, uh, should be directed really to the Deputy Premier's office because they, they relate to funding and a criteria that is developed through the Department of Regional New South yeah, Wales. We'll, we'll pick up on the due diligence thing in the next slot. Thank you. Back to the opposition. Great. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Minister. Uh, before the last election, we were told that we could have it all. Uh, and one of the specific commitments that your government made in February 2019 was this, yeah. that up to 15,000 kilometres of council-owned roads would be returned to state management That's as part of a broader package of support for local councils to better manage and maintain the rural node road network. So I wanted to ask you some questions about the progress on that commitment from February 2019. Have the independent panel delivered their final report to you? No. When will it be delivered to you? Uh, in the last correspondence with the independent panel, they have advised they'll be in a position uh, to close out their consultation, grading, assessment and deliver uh, the final report to me before the end of the year. Uh, when will you make the report public when you receive it? Well, one, I have to receive it first. Two, I have to review it. Three, I need to take a whole of government uh, uh, approach to that as well. And uh, when I have a government response, uh, well, firstly, once I receive the report, mm. review the report, uh, work through the processes of government around a whole of government uh, response as well as my own, um, uh, the report will be made public at the same time that the government's response is, is made public. Yeah, I and mean, give us some sense of how long that might be. Uh, we've had a... Well, history I don't here. know, Mr Graham. I need to receive the report first. Uh, but in well, terms of in terms of progress, if, if you want to know a bit of a timeline and yeah, where things are, that'd be to, useful. Yep. Yeah. So, firstly, uh, we are working through the priority round. Now, the priority round, as you've uh, often asked questions in Parliament, revolves around the 400 kilometres that have been identified for either reclassification mm -hmm. or transfer um, uh, as soon as possible, or, or as a priority. Yep. Now, 37 recommendations were made as part of the priority round. Transport for New South Wales have delivered 16 of them. They were delivered in tranche one. They were gazetted 
mm, I don't know, I reckon at least probably a month ago now. Mm -hmm. So tranche one is delivered. We are working towards tranche two of the priority round. We have uh, budgeted our quarter of a billion dollars that is parked there for the priority round uh, so we can progress that part of the policy and program. Now, the full round of applications closed at the end of February. Yeah. Now, uh, if you remember and the discussions we've had today around flooding, uh, exemptions were given to flood impacted communities in early March as well. Um, so that did slow down the process slightly because we gave them some additional time um, to, to get back to business as usual uh, and get their application in, but I can confirm that the application period is well and truly closed. The independent panel have received approximately 500 applications, 500 applications, which could be for either reclassification or transfer, or yep. both, um, uh, or a combination of both, I should say. Correct. Um, yep. uh, so the, From the, how many councils? The, the panel, um, I, don't, I don't have that figure. Um, oh, sorry, 78. We 78. do, we do. We have 500 seven, applications seven, from 78. 78 Eight councils have submitted, which forms 500 total applications. But bear in mind that they're obviously, I don't have the breakdown between um, what is an application for reclassification yep. and what's an application Understood. for transfer. Wendy Mason leading that independent panel is working through that process. I know they are engaging with the freight sector uh, and I know they are meeting with our freight transport advisory council that I set up. Yep. They are meeting with them in September also to gauge, uh, to progress their reporting, but to obviously get a, an idea from the freight sector about what is a priority for them. Yep. Um, and beyond that, we will, wait, we, we, we will wait to see the report when it's delivered to me before the end of the year. Mm. So 500 applications, 78 councils, how many kilometres have been applied for either for reclassification or transfer? That I don't have on hand. Do and your I, officials perhaps have that um, on I hand? don't think that the independent panel has shared, I, I would need to check, but uh, I, I don't think the independent panel has shared how many kilometres because in, in, in my last, and I'm happy to say, in my last dialogue with uh, my office, with the panel, um, that what they shared was approximately 500 applications, 78 mm. councils, mm. and they're working through what was a reclassification application and what was a transfer mm. application. And when was that last dialogue with the panel? Just give I, us a rough it, idea. I don't know, a month ago. Yeah. Um, and turning back to approximately your, a month ago. Yeah, no, thank you. Turning back to your views about the priority round, that 400 kilometres of reclassification or transfer, mm -hmm. uh, 37 recommendations supported, tranche one, 16 um, projects completed about a month ago. Mm. How many of those were reclassification only, and how many were reclassification and transfer? Given that. Those 37 were a mix of both. So I'm happy to confirm that of, which you may already have, that of the 37 recommendations that were made in the priority round, uh, 32 were classification reviews mm -hmm. and five were transfer reviews. Mm. So uh, in terms of the 16 delivered in tranche one, my understanding is that all 16 um, were classification. Right. And but that, that is tranche one. Yeah. I, I, have, I have met um, with Transport for New South Wales and, and uh, they are progressing tranche two. Mm. And tranche two, uh, I believe, may include uh, some of the transfers. Right, so tra yeah, tranche two progressing. What was the total cost for tranche one? Uh, that I don't have on hand. Cynthia Hayden may be able to... You're up, Cynthia. <laughs> Cynthia <laughs> Hayden Hayden. may be able to answer that. She's right across um, the reclass program as well. Um, we'll come back to you this afternoon. I don't have that on hand, but essentially it's uh, our own people's time and work in the administration process for Gazette. Yeah. yeah, today, yes, given that they're reclassifications, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, how many of the... One of the curious things about this priority round was this regional road reclassification, mm -hmm. reclassified roads, both in the regions, also in the city. In tranche one, uh, were there any city roads transferred or were these all country roads, regional roads transferred? Um, let me just check that. I believe that there was... Uh, I might pass to Cynthia Hayden. I have a feeling that there, there, is, um, there is one. Yes, one, one in Greater Sydney. Uh, yeah, there is one in Greater Sydney and the balance were in regional 
council areas, mm. um, but we can get you the details and I can refer you to where they are in the gazettes. And where was that road in Greater Sydney? Blacktown, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about Blacktown, Parramatta, Liverpool, these were the But, but I, I think what, what is important to note is that my understanding is it is in the Blacktown area and it is a business as usual reclassification. It was a reclassification. Reclassification. So it wasn't necessarily one that came out of our policy. Mm. Um, it was one, uh, a BAU, really business as usual um, application to have that reclassified. Mm. But it was done at the same time as the... the um, gazetting of the others. Yes. Well, it was recommended by the panel, signed off by yep. you as Minister, and it was in Correct. Blacktown? Yes, it's Blacktown and it's Schofields Road. And how many kilometres was that? Um, I will have Quite to come short. back and confi okay, confirm thank the, you. the, the, the other on that 15, one. we can confirm, are in regional New South Wales, and it's a net change of 81.395 kilometres. Mm. So, as of today, um, how many roads of the 15,000 kilometres up to of the 15,000 kilometres of council owned roads that will be returned to state management, part of this promise, uh, how many roads have been transferred as of today? How many have been transferred as of today? Well, as I've said to you, Mr Graham, we're working through that process. We have the uh, priority round which we've worked through tranche one, uh, 16 uh, reclassifications that have been gazetted. Uh, we are working through the five road transfers that are proposed as part of the 37 recommendations in the priority round. Uh, and we're working through that. And it's a far cry, Mr Graham, from, from what uh, the Labor Party did when last in government mm -hmm. in palming off all these roads you go to back the history, to local councils no with no commitments, minister, no minister. support, no funding. This so is a lengthy answer. Can I give you a shorter answer? Answer, yeah, right. No. And ask if you agree with it. The number of roads transferred of this 15,000 kilometres as of today is zero. No, is I, that I, correct? I would say to you that we are progressing uh, the priority Is round. it a number bigger than no, zero? No, I, I would say that we, again, we have a quarter of a billion dollars budgeted. We have a priority round that Minister, is Minister, that's important context. I'm asking, as of today, is the number zero? I, I confirm to you that we there are five regional transfer applications as part of the priority round. That, that wasn't the, New the question, Minister. The New South Wales Government with Transport for New South Wales is progressing. As of today, how many roads have you transferred? transferred I is the number zero. Today we have we have five applications for regional road mm. transfers. And they haven't been transferred, the have they, Minister? That we Do you are agree with that? Through, You've that already I, made a clear... That I believe will be included, some of those roads in tranche two uh, of the transfer um, and gazetted in the months to yeah, come. Yeah, but Minister, that's in the future when we can have it all. As of today... How many roads have been transferred? The number zero. You've told um, us that. As I've said, well, as of today, it may be zero, but we are progressing five transfers as part of the priority round. On it's top not of, maybe zero. On top it is zero, the 16 isn't it, Minister? Delivered, not 16 maybe. 16 reclassifications that we've delivered uh, in tranche one. Uh, we've got $250 million committed towards this process. Um, and I must say to you, yeah, like, Minister, this, is, this is a far cry. This is, this is a lot of progress considering uh, what, stop what the, there, Minister, the New South Wales the Labor Party Minister, did no, I'm last in government there. and palmed off, just Minister, totally palmed off roads can I to local this to councils you? with no commitment, oh, yeah, no Minister, support, no I, funding. Minister, nothing. I just want to put Absolutely this to you. Nothing. You've been, look, you've been quite upfront in a range of other areas. Mm. You've generally been, been one of the ministers of stats, who's of prepared to, um, you know, tell it how it is. I, I, I think that is to your credit. However, I don't think you're doing yourself any credit by not answering that simple question I'm highlighting here. some fact and um, reality is that I we are you've addressing told us exactly what we have committed to in the priority round. Uh, I've Minister, given you let a me very put the detailed you. Minister, timeline let me put the question of, of to you, what please. we are doing Minister, in this space. there's no need to interrupt. Um, you've said the number may be zero. I'm putting to you the number is zero. That's the number of roads as of today that have been transferred of these 15,000 kilometres. Do you concede that's correct? I am confirming the facts in front of you today mm. that uh, of the 37 recommendations that were made in the priority round, 16 of the 32 class road classification reviews have been delivered in tranche one, uh, and that we have five regional road transfers as part of the priority round, which will be advanced in the, uh, in the coming tranches uh, of gazetting of those roads. Minister, why won't you 
say what is plainly obvious to you, to me, to anyone sitting here, uh, as of today, the number of roads transferred is zero. No, well, Mr Graham, I've, I've answered the question. You've asked exactly of the 37 recommendations where progress has been made. As I said, 16 of the 32 recommendations Minister, for you, classification... You don't get to make up the question as well as the I'm, answer. I'm the question the is, I'm, as I'm, of today, not is it maybe zero, as of today, the number is zero. Do you accept that? I hear the point of order. Um, the... Um, Minister has the right to answer the question um, how he would like to answer the question. If the Honourable John Graham is going to continue with the same question over and over and over again, it's going to be a very, very long day. So I think Oops. the question has already been <laughs> answer, uh, asked multiple times and perhaps we should move on. Mm. To the point of order, it is going to be a very long day. Mm. That's... Um, <laughs> It's not a valid point of order. The, uh, I appreciate uh, the minister is allowed to answer how he sees fits, but it's also the uh, member's uh, right to ask uh, the same question over and over again. If they see that as a, the best use of their time, um, that is up to them. Um, I'm not going to not going to rule on how someone should ask a question. If it becomes badgering, uh, then we can relook at it. But at the moment, it's not. Continue. Thank you, Chair. Minister, I do want to press it only because it is important. I, like, I'm happy to concede that you've got this underway. You've given us quite a good update about what will happen. My point is, as of today, what has happened, the number of roads transferred is zero. Is that correct? Uh, Mr Graham, I think I've outlined a very good timeline, e the exact numbers, what we've delivered, what we're progressing as part of the priority round, how much we've got budgeted. I believe that the next steps are independent assessment. That's why we have the independent panel in place. I've got nothing further to add. I, I refer to my previous answer. I, I agree with all that context, but why won't you say, why won't you tell the public, why won't you tell these regional councils that the number of roads transferred as of today is zero. Why won't you admit that? Well, no, I, I don't accept that we haven't given the community an update. I have been very clear in talking to local councils, talking at country mayors, talking at the IPWEA, talking in parliament, very clear about where the process is up to, where the process is up to, with tranche one, with the reclassification applications, with the transfer applications. We've got an independent assessment underway by an independent panel. Panel. We've given an indication of when that report will be returned. Mm. The, one further point I would but you make... you haven't transferred a single point, road. One further point I you haven't to transferred your a question, single road. Mr Graham... If you're going to keep avoiding the question, no, no, Minister, I'm not I am going to... You, you've also asked me about not, not talking to the community about where this is up to. But it is Minister, totally wrong. I, Minister, I have you met, can't invent I have the question. met the majority of local councils in regional New South Wales. I Minister, I'm going to stop all, you there. I've met the majority of them, and this is not a burning topic. This is not a burning topic. What is a burning topic in regional and local roads policy in regional New South Wales is our fixing local road funding, our fixing country this road funding. This is not funding, a burning topic. Our, the hundreds the of fact bridges that, you that we're to replacing across on this regional New South Wales. I can't Wales, believe you're saying that. The betterment fund that we've been I able can't to deliver. You're but Mr Graham, you ask a question. I am telling you, but in, you say, this in, isn't a burning in topic. The say in Dungog, I have or with local mayors, general managers, community members. This is not a burning issue they raise with me. And the reality, so not the reality about is, the slow Mr Graham, progress on is this. what the community that wants... That flies in the face of the feedback we're getting, the community, the community want roads repaired, mm. resealed, potholes fixed. Transferred. They don't care who owns the road. They just want to fix. Well, this was and your promise. And that is exactly what I am doing with local government. Minister, I am this working was your with promise. them, offering them the right sort of funding, the right sort of commitment, enable them to deliver it. Minister, we I'm need genuinely local surprised government. by local that answer. government I'm genuinely is our surprised. delivery partner. I mean, that is not the message we're getting. Why why did you make this commitment for 15,000 kilometres if no one cares? This is desperately needed, desperately waited for, and you've transferred zero roads out of 15,000 kilometres. That's the feedback we're again, getting. Again, if you'd like me to give you an update on the whole process, the timeline, the tranche run, happy to do that, but I have nothing further to add, Mr Graham, so I refer to my previous answer. Where is this referred to in the budget papers? I was finding it... I may have missed it, but I was finding it difficult to um, locate just the financial allocation for this. 
Um, I'll refer um, uh, to Cynthia Hayden. Do we have that in the... Um, yes, the regional New South Wales budget um, document, and right. it's um, in that page, and it identifies 193 million of capex over two years. Okay, fantastic. And if uh, Ms. Hayden, either now or later, if I could just get the page number, that'd be helpful, given you've got the mm -hmm. got the reference. Um, Minister, will there be a future round once this uh, next round is done? Well, I think it will be important once we have the independent advice in the expert panel come back to us uh, on that report to see um, um, mm. as to what the, the, the total uh, kilometres uh, <coughs> have been either requested for reclassification or transfer. So I think we need to let that process take its course before we make any further an policy announcements in this space um, around um, uh, expanding it beyond the current and full round that we have underway mm. now. About two minutes. So, so just, just quickly, Mr Graham, it is, it is <coughs> back again in that regional New South Wales budget paper and it's page 19. Thank you. And it's down bottom left hand corner. Minister, in light of the um, recent ICAC report on pork barrelling, <clears throat> um, in relation to the independent expert panel's report to you, you have the so final um, sign-off. Um, can you tell us what criteria you're going to use to decide um, that you may overrule some of the recommendations of that independent panel? Well, we put in... Um an independent expert panel um, to do the grading, to do the assessment, to engage with stakeholders, uh, and I'll be taking their considerations very seriously. <coughs> I will be, I think it is appropriate uh, for government uh, to be using a you know, a independent panel at arm's length from government that can review this process. But Wendy Machen exactly at the Roads Congress said and confirmed, um, and you have also confirmed it today, that you'll have the final sign off. So, which means that you have the ability to accept or not accept some of those recommendations. In light of the ICAC report in relation to pork barrelling, what public clear criteria will you use to decide whether or not you reject some of the recommendations, if you, if you wish to do so, of that independent um, um, expert panel report? Well, I will be taking the advice uh, and the recommendations of that of that report when the panel uh, delivers their report to me very seriously, and I'll be making the decisions that are in the best interests of this state and for uh, the commuters and communities. <coughs> are you Southwest. prepared to enunciate now what criteria you will use? I refer to, to my that previous assessment. answer. So you won't. Okay, that's pretty clear. Okay, thank you, Minister. I might just pick up where I left, Mr. And through you, Minister, Mr. Fuller. I just want to go to Transport Sydney South Wales' involvement in this upgraded line, this enabling infrastructure. What involvement did you have in good, the benefits cross ratio? Yeah, thank you for the question, Mr. Benaziak. I think, um, uh, look, I'd have to get detailed uh, information from the team as to some of those uh, early investigations and exactly what was pro provided. But um, at a higher level, what I would say is obviously the uh, the cost of the reinstatement of the infrastructure, the rail line, would have been a critical component in the assessment of BCR and the business case more broadly because it would have related to the overall project cost. So we would have certainly been uh, with our partners uh, at the time, John Holland Rail, who were managing the country rail network, providing information and assessment about what it would have taken to reinstate the, the rail line, and as I said, the other supporting infrastructure that was important to the community, things like uh, reenacting some of those level crossings, um, looking at intersections and things around them. So I'm sure that our team uh, advised on the infrastructure upgrades. Uh, beyond that, I'm sure in terms of the other commercial considerations uh, with the freight and logistics company and Tamworth Council, they would have taken their own deliberations around those aspects that would have fed into the BCR. You would have had no deliberations on, on freight? From uh, your capacity? Look, I, I'd, I'd have to check uh, on exactly what was provided by our team. As I said, the obvious ones come to mind are in terms of the infrastructure costs, but um, that, that, that would be my understanding at this point. But we, we'd be happy to take on notice and check sure. if there was any other mm -hmm. involvement. Yeah, on notice, can you... I imagine you're familiar with this document. 
freight to motor demand forecast from 2016 to 2056. It's mm -hmm. your, it's got your logo on it. Can um, you just take on notice as to whether that was considered as part of your consideration? Sure, John? happy to take that on notice. You. Minister, are you familiar with that document? Is that transport 2056, did you say? Yeah, 2016 to 2056. It was. It was produced I'm aware, in 2018, so well before I'm our time. Aware, I'm aware of the document. I haven't read the document, okay. but I'm aware of the document. It's, it's, it's a great read. Um, it totally pokes holes in the, the intermodal's uh, economic viability, but we won't go there. Um, moving on, just picking up on the, the transfer of roads, Minister, you, you talked about uh, five roads as part of the priority around. Are you able to tell us what those five roads uh, were and whether armadale Kempsey Road was part of that? Uh, no, um, I don't think that those roads have been made public and they won't be made public until um, um, the gazetting of those roads. Okay, sure. Because um, just, just bear in mind, there is a bit of work that needs to happen, which is occurring right now, between Transport for New South Wales and the local councils that are involved. There needs to be site inspections, grading of those roads, and uh, there needs to be an agreement between government, transport and local government around the the condition of the asset before it's before and when it is transferred. Sure. Okay. So just going to Armadale Kempsey Road. In prior to the last election, the local member, the Honourable Adam Marshall, told residents, and he put it up on his own Facebook page, that if he was elected, the road would be immediately transferred to state government control. Clearly, where we are now where we, we have no roads uh, officially transferred. Um, um, would it be fair to say that uh, the Honourable Member uh, misled his community? No, no. Um, I work very closely with the member for Northern Tablelands, uh, um, actually heading up to his electorate on Friday, uh, Ms Spinaziak. So, so how, how did he not mislead uh, the community no, no, when Armadale Kempsey the, Road? No, he hasn't, no, he, he hasn't. said He said it was going to be an immediate transfer after... If he was elected, it would immediately, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what the def okay. definitional meaning of immediate is, yeah. straight away. So clearly, mm. either he was, mm. at yep. the very least, ill-informed or poorly informed, but mm. more leaning towards he, he misinformed or misled his community that this was going to happen. So firstly... Um um, Adam Marshall, member for Northern Tablelands, has raised um, uh, Armadale Kempsey Road with me, just, just so has the member for Oxley in Melinda Paver. They've both uh, raised this with me. They're important roads to both those communities and connectivity. Yep. What is important to note, though, that Armadale Kempsey Road has had uh, a significant amount of damage and has received a significant amount of uh, disaster, natural disaster funding. Um, they've also received funding uh, via, via our Fixing Local Roads program. Now, as part of the transfer program, we cannot transfer a road that currently has works or funding attached to it. It can't be. So whilst, whilst Mr Marshall is right that he is committed to seeing uh, the government progress that road to be transferred at some point, at some time, um, um, he may not have realised that a road cannot be transferred whilst it has, in particular, uh, any sort of grant funding attached to it or works in progress. Now, uh, Armadale Kempsey Road has a significant amount of disaster, natural disaster funding and has had fixing local roads funding attached to it as well. So we need to finish and see uh, those works finished before we can have an assessment inspection uh, before any possible transfer of that road can occur. Okay. But, but One I, also, of those... I also note both those local members have spoken to me about mm. that road and both those local members are comfortable um, with where we are sitting on that road now in terms of the funding that has been made available. Uh, some of the works, I referred to Andrew before, Andrew is the individual that helped those those local council areas manage, project manage, that very project. Mm -hmm. We have learnt a lot of how to manage road projects from that Armadale Kempsey Road, and that's exactly what we're planning to do, is to get that finished, and that will allow it to progress to the next stages. And one allocation of funding, I believe, very early in I think 2019 was $4.5 million for that road. But my understanding that that money was conditional on council being able to use their own funds to get 
that that road up to when I when I say council, Armadale Council getting. In, in what year was that? I think I believe 2019. Straight after, this, shortly after the election, that 4.5 million dollars that the local member promised was delivered, but it was conditional that council had to use their own funds to get it up the rate up to a level of serviceability before that 4.5 million dollars funding was approved. Can you confirm that? Well, now what I would confirm is that. Um, that commitment, yes, um, it was before my time yes, as, as the minister. That. So I'm not going to comment on, on what was before my time because I, I'm not across that detail. But what I can confirm with you is over the last few months, through natural disaster funding, we are investing hundreds of millions of dollars into that road. Uh, is, there is, is, that, there, is there is significant money attached to the rebuild of Armadale Kempsey Road, um, and the local members have been consulted and are fully across uh, uh, that funding and what is occurring with how we project, manage, and rebuild that infrastructure. So um, I, I think there's uh, there's a significant program happening on that road. Okay. So is the, the disaster funding you, you you speak of is that separate to the the budget announcement of two hundred and twenty seven million dollars? I believe. No, it would, it would be the same. It would be that. It would that's be the, the same. That's the total. That, that, that is what has been budgeted uh, towards uh, funding that we've received to go into that road. Okay. Just, I just wanted to check whether there was, there's lots of pockets of money floating around, Minister. I just wanted to. Lots of investment. Lots of support from. The I, I just want to be clear of like yeah. what the what the Kimberley total is. So we're saying 227 million. Do you? have a, you know, a, I guess a sense of what that would entail? Is, is that going to completely fix Armadale Kempsey, Kempsey Road? Well, that, that has what has been estimated as a cost and, uh, uh, and investment needed to get that road back to scratch. Um, so that, that, that is why that funding has now been directed uh, to, towards that road uh, to get that, uh, that infrastructure rebuilt. Okay. And do we have a project timeline yet? Uh, I'll have to take that on notice. I will come back to you um, during the course of the day um, on a timeline on uh, how we are going project managing that piece of road infrastructure. Thank you. But I, what is important to note when we do this is that we have put specific resources into place to manage that because a couple hundred million dollar rebuild to road infrastructure is a massive task for any local council, no matter how small or big they are in this state. Um, and we have put in additional resources in around project management um, and expertise to help do that. So, so that it, it isn't just left to council to do that because the reality is that those councils involved have raised concerns about how to manage that. And when I made that reference to Andrew, he has now in Lismore, but he has uh, been managing Armadale Kempsey Road for some time and he has trained another individual up within transport to take over. And that is an example of how we are using you know, outside of the box sort of resources to assist councils with this sort of infrastructure rebuild. That's that's pleasing to hear, Minister, because I, I know the local local members of the community have raised with me, and also have raised with uh, the local member their concerns about council's capacity to take on such a project. So it's pleasing to hear. Probably happy to come back with a bit of an update during the course of the day on a, on a timeline and the yep. resources that we have committed to that project because they're public. I'm happy to talk about them because it's a good news story, Mr mm. Benaziak, about overdue. how we are trying to rebuild this infrastructure. But we also need to accept that it's probably been impacted again over the last few months by natural disaster again. That is why you need to have those resources to manage what is a very challenging rebuild of road but infrastructure. But you, you, you would admit that this is a road that has been plagued with problems well well before you know, the most recent floods over the last couple of years. It's been a festering sore for the community for the, the community are frustrated. It is a piece of road infrastructure that has had plenty of challenges, and that is why when you have um, challenges, uh, you need to find solutions, and that's exactly what we're doing in how we support local council in managing, project managing the rebuild of uh, Armadale Kempsey Road. Sure. Uh, are you the minister responsible for the Singleton Bypass, or is that someone else? Oh, that's me. Oh, excellent. Um, Nothing against the project, Minister. My concerns are centred around the uh, the acquisition process. Obviously, community the landholders are obviously concerned about 
that process and, and it not being fair? You're, you're aware of those concerns? Um, the local member, a really hard-working local member in Dave Lazell, um, has has um, has raised with me. Um, cons you know, constituents have met with uh, the local member to raise their concerns. Um, we have a very defined process around compulsory acquisition uh, and PANs uh, and how um, that process operates. Uh, that process is the same process for any acquisition of any property that is required as part of our infrastructure build. Um, across the state. In terms of perhaps outlining that process, I might ask Ant Hayes, because he is right across how that works, but... Um, I'm, reason I'm reasonably well familiar with the process, given I sat on the acquisition mm. Uh, mm. inquiry. Um, I guess the evidence that we heard during the acquisition inquiry, and not specifically with Singleton, but overall, mm. was that the community found, yes, there was a process, but it was more, I guess, the tone and how that process was administered by individual uh, Transport for New South Wales uh, staff. Um, and I draw your attention to, in a, a newspaper article around their concerns, they, uh, they claim that a threatening letter from Transport for New South Wales was sent to one of the landholders um, about coming onto their property. Now, have you investigated as to w what the details of that threatening letter were or whether the letter was threatening at all? I've, I've never seen or, or had uh, this, you know, uh, accusation of a threatening letter referred or, or put in front of me. Happy if you've got a copy to have a look. But um, oh, I don't have a copy of the letter. I've just got a, co a copy of the article where they made this accusation. I, I haven't seen a copy of the letter you refer to, um, and I suspect that without seeing it, I, I don't want to make, um, you know, too much of, of a prejudgment on what that is, but I, I would think that it is a challenging circumstance when we have to build... Uh, when we have a vision like we do as the New South Wales Government, when we go to build legacy infrastructure for this state, in particular in the regions, um, it's never an easy task because uh, it, it is a big job when you build legacy infrastructure, but at times it requires um, uh, parcels of land to build that infrastructure. There's a very defined process on how that works, um, and I would, uh, you know, if you have a copy of the letter, if we, ha you know, I'm happy to look at it, but is it a legal letter or is it a threatening letter? Oh, I would I, I, have to I see the letter for yourself I'm just, um, to make that judgment. Well, perhaps on notice, can you get back to us as to what this letter was? Because it's no, only mentioned. No, if, no, I'm not prepared to take it on notice. But if you if you present a copy of the letter or the article uh, to me, I'm, I'm happy, happy, to present, to happy to present the come back to you during the course of the day uh, with with some response. Thank you. I'll present the article to you. Um, appreciate that. Um, you know. Yeah, there are challenges when you're building infrastructure. I don't think the landholders are, you know, concerned about the infrastructure per se, but just how they're treated through the process. They're, they're accepting of the fact that the bypass needs to happen, but just how they're being treated through the process. And uh, they've made an accusation there also that Transport for New South Wales has essentially lowballed them mm -hmm. in terms of the offer, um, that it is well below what they've got in terms of private valuations. So perhaps on. Are you prepared to, on notice, come back to us and give us a response to that accusation? I, I think, I think it is fair to say that. I think it is fair to say that uh, uh, Camilla Drover is here, who can also answer these questions with Ant Hayes, but. Um, if you, you said earlier, Mr Benazic, you understand how the process works, so you understand how uh, the valuer general is involved in that process and their determinations, and that is what government have to turn to when, when uh, uh, you look to uh, compulsory acquire land. That, that is part but of we're the not process. At the, we're but, not, at, we're but, not at that part of the process, but, are we? But I, I, would, I would defer your questions to Camilla Drover and, and Hayes. They will be able to answer you know, exactly the timeline of how it works and what triggers are there as part of the process. Uh, again, I've just been hey, presented. Ms. This is quite a long article. Mr. Drover, have you, you lowballed the, the, the landholders at Singleton? Can you respond to that accusation that you, your department has offered them a price well below uh, independent valuations that they've got? What I can say is we have been engaging with those landowners for over two years. We obviously um, acknowledge that this is a sensitive issue when we're acquiring people's homes, yeah. and particularly in regional New South Wales, where it's often their uh, home but also their place of business. Mm. Um, it also makes some of the valuations more difficult because of that. 
Um, so we, we have had that long engagement with them. Um, if we can't reach agreement, we have the compulsory process. And in that instance, we don't decide what compensation is paid. Uh, it's a value of general that, that... But we're not... Can you confirm that we are not at that process, at that stage yet, are we? we you are still in the negotiations with them. Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that I have, I, as the minister, am not involved in the negotiation period. I can only... Now, let me finish, Mr Benaziak. Mr Benaziak, I have signed off on the compulsory acquisition of property across New South Wales for our infrastructure projects, and I believe that Singleton... Um, there would be properties in Singleton. I don't know which exactly which ones, but there would be properties in Singleton that I've signed off uh, that have to be compulsory acquired. At one notice, can you provide some level of detail as to what those properties you have signed off on, Minister? So we get a sense of where we're at to where we're up to with the acquisition process? Yes, we can provide details on the acquisitions, but also if we require access as opposed to an acquisition. Mm, yes, because sometimes things. we use yes. the, the mm. Roads Act to mm. gain access as opposed to an acquis as acquisition, yeah. and that may be uh, one of the issues in this instance, but we'll take that on notice. And, and just to confirm, the, the, the Minister has absolutely no involvement in negotiation. I have no involvement at all in what the compensation or, or, or co <coughs> you know, value is. Um, the yeah. process is right. so rigid that it has to point to the value of general yeah. uh, and then once it gets to that stage that is what is is utilized and um, obviously as Camilla has has highlighted um, it's a very rigid process um, we can certainly on notice provide mm. details about some uh, of, of the quantity of per perhaps of, of parcels of land that have been acquired but um, throughout the course of Minister, the day. with respect you are the Minister for Regional Roads um, we're not part of the government you are, you actually have the opportunity to lobby to change these laws internally. This is something that has is not new. These issues have been around for, you know, decades. Um, these people are being treated incredibly unfairly because of legislation that you are partly responsible for alongside the other transport, transport ministers. You can't just sit there and say, you know, oh, it's a really rigid process. We know that, we just had an inquiry. What are you going to do? to make sure that the people in Singleton can have a better deal? Well, firstly, um, we have an extensive infrastructure build underway. Um, there are two issues here uh, around the value of general, which, to be frank, is a, is a much broader conversation, and it's not directly um, it's not directly linked uh, to my portfolio. I have to use the value of general's recommendation as part of a process um, when acquiring land, uh, and and that is what is occurring. But uh, the, the process is the process, and uh, I think it is a different conversation. If, if, if we want reform in that space. Do you, do you support reinstatement, are you like for like? Mm. Um, well, I would refer... No, I'm going to refer to my previous answer. I've got nothing further to add in that space, Mr Benaziak. Do you support the um, the people who are losing their farms being compensated for the loss of income from those farms? I accept it is a challenging circumstance when uh, land has to be compulsorily acquired because it's more than just a land. It's more than bricks and mortar. It's more than just a piece of dirt. It's people's home. That's it's right. It's their home, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, but when... We, we have a process for a reason. We have a value of general's recommendation for a reason. It's a and, and I uh, currently, with the infrastructure build, I, I, am, um, I am rolling out on behalf of the New South Wales government and the people of regional New South Wales, I have to follow that process, a conversation about changes or reforms to the way that we, you know, use or point to the value of general or use their recommendations is a very different conversation. Um, and, Just to and clarify, we're not at the value of general point. We're at the point of Transport for New South Wales lowballing um, people and then trying to um, encourage them to accept that offer so you don't have to go to the value of general. I do encourage I, you to read the um, this committee's report um, where we explain in I detail. I referred to my previous answer, Ms Boyd. Um, it is tea time. Isn't that lovely? And I believe we have scones. Um, so we will come back. I oh, know. It's, uh, yeah, it's um, it's a life of luxury. Uh, so uh, we'll be back at eleven fifteen. Thank you. <laughs>
And we're back. Okay, mm. I will start again with questions from the opposition. Ms. Primrose. Mm. Minister, um, I understand it took about nine years to complete the Sydney Harbour Bridge, just a little over. Um, I'd like to ask you a question about the upgrade to McCain's Falls Road Bridge in Bathurst. Um, I recall that it was first promised and funded by Minister Duncan Gay in 2012, it first appeared in budget electorate reports in 2014-15, um, still going on. Um, I understand from the locals um, that they've been told they expect it to be finished this year. Um, can you confirm that um, um, it will actually be open to traffic this year? I will take it on notice for the course of estimates and try and get you an answer on that. I, I live in Bathurst, for the record. I, I know of I know of the road and bridge you're talking about, but um, I, I will just uh, reconfirm um, the the timeline and come back to you in the course of the day. And, and if you would, Minister, um, if it's not this year, when and why has it taken so long? I will find out what the current timeline is uh, for open to traffic date and come back to you um, with that uh, during the course of the day. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> now, a lot of regional councils have very old bridges, as you know, Minister, that predate the 1940s and 50s, um, timber bridges that are the target of the Fixing Country Bridges program. Um, will the government extend the guidelines for fixing country bridges to reflect the poor condition of the many concrete composite heritage and steel bridges across the state that are also in need of repair? Can we change the criteria? Um, well, firstly, fixing country bridges has been um, quite a remarkable project. Um, hundreds and hundreds of timber bridges are being replaced across regional New South Wales uh, with new concrete structures, uh, whether they be small bridges or big bridges, um, which is really, really important because uh, this is infrastructure that local government uh, in many ways probably doesn't have the rate base to, to support, in particular <coughs> multiple bridges when you look across areas like Kyogle, for instance, or uh, up and down the coast. Uh, we've obviously had <coughs> round one. Uh, th uh, thanks, Minister. But in, any chance of answering the question? Will, will it be extended? Well, firstly, we, we have... Uh, there's an extensive amount of timber bridges across regional New South Wales. They're also uh, concrete even, composite yeah, heritage. But and even, even with our latest round of 2A that we announced recently, um, and we will be progressing another round, I, I would hope, uh, throughout 2022, um, there are still timber bridges to replace. So my priority is to ensure that we get as many timber bridges replaced across regional New South Wales. We've made fantastic inroads to do that, but there's still work to do, and this government is committed uh, to, to rolling out additional funding to replace timber bridges first before we look more so broadly at no. concrete structures. So, so the answer is no. Okay. Well, no. The the, the answer is is this government is committed to honouring our commitment with timber bridges. We still have work to and do. The, the question and, and was: Will the government extend the guideline for fixing country bridges? How many bridges did Labor replace when they were last in government? It would be zero. And still It'd be bridges zero across the state. You, you've been you're. You're a reputable member of the House, Mr Primrose. You've been around a long time. Um, how many, how many timber bridges... Concrete how bridges. many timber bridges did Labor replace when you were back in government all those all those years ago? It would have been Zippo. That's yep. how many. So the question... Is, is, is your... Minister, your answer is that you do not propose to extend the guidelines to um, concrete, composite heritage and steel bridges. That's right, isn't it? My answer is that we have round one, round 2A in, in the marketplace now. We are replacing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of timber bridges across regional New South yeah, so, Wales. Yeah, okay, and get, we still have more yeah. funding available. We are working directly with local government in and around bridge builders, capacity um, um, okay, restrictions okay, and Minister, constraints. So I, I, I accept the answer's not. OK, you don't have to keep rabbiting no, that, that, on. My answer, Can I ask you, why, you cut me off before well, I finish the answer. So. Well, what is the answer, Minister? Is it yes or no? Well, the answer is, is we are committed to supporting local government right across New, regional New South Wales to replace as many timber look, bridges as possible, I'll, I'll leave it and to we've the, got hundreds and hundreds of bridge projects underway. I've hundreds. asked you, <laughs> Minister. I've asked you a specific question, okay? Um, and you've said very clearly, and I have no problems with you fixing 
Timber Bridges, Minister. I'm sure no one here does. We're actually opening our 100th bridge Excellent. very shortly. Oh. 100th well, bridge but, very shortly. But I, I ask you about concrete composite heritage and steel bridges um, across the state that are also in need of repair. Okay, you've, you've answered that question. Why did the New South Wales government approve the Cutterjee Bridge under the program in March 2021? Um, I'll take that. I'll actually refer to Cynthia Hayden um, with that question. All right. Uh, thank you. Could you just <coughs> clarify the question, please? Why did the New South Wales government approve the Cutterjee Bridge under the program in March 2021? I'll have to double check our records in relation to that bridge and the timing. Um, it's not one I have on hand, but if you can wait, I'll come back with some. You may not have it on hand because the government withdrew funding for the Cudderdee Bridge under the program in May and June 2021, just two months later. Again, I'll wait just to get some more detailed information, but uh, my understanding and recollection of that is it wasn't a formal approval of that bridge, and I believe it was in relation to the bridge not being predominantly timber as per the guidelines. M Mr. Mr. Premier, is this bridge in the Bega Valley? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm... <laughs> I think you'll find, which we will come back to during the course of the day, but there was more than just the New South Wales government removing funding. I uh, bear in mind that uh, uh, these decisions, as you've outlined in the timeline, were before I was the Minister for Regional Transport and Roads, but there were also challenges uh, that local council faced and were unable, in, in my understanding, to deliver the project. And it wasn't a case, it wasn't a case of the New South Wales government uh, pulling the funding, it was a case of local government returning the funding back to New South Wales government because they couldn't deliver the project. OK. Yes, the council did. Let's pursue this again, but yeah. I'd like to know those but details. This was raised with myself when I visited the Bega Valley early this year and spoke with the mayor. Uh, he raised uh, his disappointment mm -hmm. that council were not in a position uh, to work with government to deliver that project mm -hmm. and why the funding yeah, was yeah. returned to the New South Wales government. The funding wasn't pulled. OK, the council has undertaken extensive work. Um, on this bridge to try and get it back up to a standard as the bridge is clearly nearing the end of its functional life and is subject to deteriorating condition. Okay, Council um, has said, and I quote, it is in danger of a potentially catastrophic structural failure unless remedial action is taken. So, end of quote. So, what, what's actually, what are you doing to assist Council in the process of, to make it safe? Well, I've, I've, as I said, I met with the Mayor earlier this year. I have said that uh, uh, that it is disappointing that Council were not in a position uh, to complete the project that they applied for and had to return the funding to the New South Wales Government. Uh, my door is open to work with that Council, just like any other Council, mm -hmm. into the future. Um, there are obviously heritage considerations in and around that bridge, to my knowledge, and from my visit uh, to the Bega area. So um, I'm certainly happy door is open happy to talk to that council, have a good working relationship with that council, and I believe we were able to deliver more investment uh, through uh, fixing country bridges round 2A recently, where we were able to get that council at least another one or two bridges um, as part of their bridge building replacement program. So there are still good things happening there. Door is open to talk about the existing bridge. OK. Um, I note that in the timeline of works, um, May, June 2021, um, um, State Government withdrew Cudderjee Bridge from the funding round as additional time was needed to undertake all the necessary steps before construction could commence, um, including community consultation. Um, so um, that means that Cudderjee Bridge um, is, is a bridge that could be funded under this program? I'll certainly refer it um, and the criteria to Cynthia Hayden, but uh, to the point, uh, Council were in a position where mm. uh, they could not meet the, the criteria and, and guidelines and, and timings under that program uh, and mm. return the funding to the New South Wales Government. When do you expect that some work might be undertaken, given this is the major coastal route between Trathra and Bermagui? 
Again, my, my, my door is open. Um, mm -hmm. I have made additional funding available through fixing country bridges round 2A only a short time ago, and I plan to roll out the rest of the funding through a additional round later this year. My door is open for local government to be talking to my office, to the team within mm -hmm. Transport for New South Wales. Um, we're, we're inclusive people. We, we're happy for them to re happy for them to work with us in this space. Um, but again, it is their piece of infrastructure, it will be up to that council and that community uh, to come to government uh, with proposals and, and we will do our best under existing funding programs to give them the opportunity uh, to seek funding from the New South Wales government to put towards uh, infrastructure repairs and upgrades of that bridge. Did the council raise with you the issue about um, the issue of reclassification of um, the bridge, allowing um, it to actually apply for funding. Reclassification of their asset to what the state government? To, to allow it to be eligible for funding. I don't believe in my discussions with council earlier this year that that part uh, of I don't believe that was raised with me. The, the bridge was raised, the funding, the, the position and situation council found them in under their application for round one. Um, um, but it is fair to say, I, I don't think that that was raised with me. I'd have to ask Cynthia whether that's been raised with the agency, but not with my office. Um, I'm not aware of any of a request in relation to that. Um, and further to the Minister's advice, the bridge was withdrawn by the Council, um, and that was as the bridge was proposed to be a renewal and not a replacement due to its heritage status. Therefore, it didn't meet the conditions and criteria of the program. Will the New South Wales Government reclassify the Tathra Boomagui Road, including its five bridges? I don't know if that has been um, as part of the reclassification and transfer process. I don't know if that road has been submitted to the independent panel uh, for consideration. OK, we'll come back to this when you give me that information. Great. Just quickly, Mr Primrose, um, McCain's uh, Road and Bridge um, has experienced a slight delay due to flooding. Uh, the most recent flooding, which has occurred right across the state, including my hometown of Bathurst, uh, we are scheduled uh, to be open to traffic November 2022. OK, you might want to get people to correct your website, which as I will take that on notice, but ago, um, still says September. Yeah, okay. well, so it, uh, but we've had recent flooding as of a week or two ago in that region, so maybe that's why but November this year. Minister, I wanted to turn to the um, uh, to your involvement in the train dispute. You'll be happy to hear that we won't be spending uh, as long as we have in the past on this uh, issue in some other forums. Um, you originally, when we uh, questioned you here, were not particularly involved. I think it would be fair to say. I think that would be a fair reflection um, of your early involvement, although more recently you appear to become much more central to the government's engagement with this set of issues. You've been publicly commenting. Um, if, could you just give us a sense of what is your, how would you describe your current involvement in the uh, negotiations in the rail dispute in this set of issues? I'm still Certainly, Mr Graham. Firstly, um, the Minister for Transport the current Minister for Transport and the previous Minister for Transport have always been the lead minister mm. in uh, negotiations <coughs> around the new enterprise agreement. Um, Minister Tudor Hope, uh, as the Minister for Employee Relations, uh, obviously looks at, uh, is involved in this process as a, a whole of government approach. Yep. Uh, and I am involved due to uh, the new intercity fleet um, yep. being a topic of conversation and negotiation in the EA bargaining process. Um, my, yes, it is fair to say I've been more involved recently uh, because I attended a meeting of the combined rail unions on the Thursday of the last parliamentary sitting week. On that Thursday, Minister Elliott was unwell and not mm. in Parliament. And out of respect, to be frank, to the mm. CRU, um, uh, and to ha I felt it important that a transport minister attend, so I attended. At that meeting, I gave a commitment to Alex Classens from the uh, RTBU that I would go away from that meeting, work with them on finalising a deed, an mm. agreement uh, on the new intercity fleet, including the modifications to that fleet. Um, and I did exactly that over the course of the following week and a bit. Uh, and got to a point where deeds were presented to that union. Mm. 
Okay, is it fair to say, th that's a useful clarification, is it fair to say you're the lead on that aspect of this, that <coughs> lead the um, uh, new intercity fleet? I think it's fair to say, as of today, um, I am looking after uh, the new intercity fleet considerations because I have given a commitment that I would following yep. that meeting with the CRU and, uh, in particular, the commitment given to the RTBU. Uh, and Minister Elliott um, is the lead minister in and around the enterprise agreement, um, intensive bargaining uh, meetings, and um, the, you know, the overall um, EA negotiations. Mm. So, can you confirm? Right now, that the government's position is that it will rip up its offer to make alterations to the new intercity fleet if there's a single day more industrial action. Well, I think what is important to note, and I, I just received an update during the break, that uh, the, the Premier of New South Wales, Premier Perrottet, has uh, made public statements today, um, has made public statements today that uh, we will be presenting uh, the combined rail unions with an enterprise agreement this week. At the same time, we will be presenting uh, at at the same time, we'll be presenting the RTBU with a, another version of the deed uh, on the new intercity fleet. And uh, we will need to, to be progressing the EA to a vote. The Premier has made it pretty clear that if industrial <coughs> action is taken between now and an enterprise agreement vote, that he would... Um, uh, that he would, one, remove, um, remove the commitments that are made to the new intercity fleet, uh, and he would rip up the agreement, and the New South Wales government would be pursuing uh, action through the Fair Work Commission. Right. So, and just, um, the Premier says this ends today. So, if there's one more day of industrial action, those two things flow. The uh, negotiations around changes to the, train, the trains, the new intercity fleet gone, uh, the enterprise agreement ripped up, terminated. Is that the government's position as we sit here today? Well, the government's position is that uh, the combined rail unions will be presented with an enterprise agreement this week. Um, what is important to note for context, Mr Graham, is that in my negotiations with the RTBU over the last you know, week, two weeks, and they were done in good faith, mm. and to be fair, they were very productive meetings. Um, I referenced that we were very close. We were very close. Um, part of those discussions was uh, from the RTBU that they wanted to go back to some intensive bargaining meetings. Uh, I was able to work that uh, to, to come to fruition this week because the meeting, the intensive bargaining meetings that are occurring right now that have occurred since Monday were not scheduled. This was an additional commitment from the New South Wales government that I was help, able to help facilitate with Minister Elliott. Mm. They have been very productive. The mm. Secretary mm. is here. He's been involved in some of them. Mm. Um, uh, so they have occurred. What is What the Premier has made very clear, and I am 100% supportive of the Premier's position, is that commuters have had a gutful they are sick of the industrial action, um, and we need to allow for peace on our public transport network. So, Minister, so the, can the, I, the Premier can has I been ask? very clear. No, yeah. no, let me I, be very clear yeah. about what my position is, because yeah. it is the same position that the Premier of this state has, and that is the next steps are a enterprise agreement will be presented uh, to the combined rail unions later this week. At the same time, my involvement is that another copy or another version of the deed, an agreement on the modifications to the NIF, will be presented at the same time as the EA agreement. And it's very clear that if we see any industrial action, any protected indu industrial action between now and when that vote is to occur, which will take a number of weeks, the Premier has instructed his ministers that we will rip up the current enterprise agreement. The NIF modifications will be taken off the table and we're off to the Fair Work Commission. So let me ask this question as a commuter, as someone who was jammed onto the train this morning, is do you feel discussions have been productive? Well, you this is now you a probably setback. weren't on a commuter, probably wasn't this, on a train this morning this because the poor commuters couldn't get on minister, a train minister, they couldn't get on a bus the question, because please. of the bus strikes. They were probably stuck in the traffic minister, uh, congestion that occurred on our road network. Minister, I'm just commenting on my experience this well, morning. I had the so, same experience, yes. Mr. Mr. Gray. Um, I'm asking you this. You've said discussions have been productive. This is a setback, isn't it? This today... The fact this is where it's got to is that is it fair to say 
that's a setback. No, it's not a setback. I think, if anything, um, this is bringing the issue to a head because uh, what has been evident to me throughout uh, what I would describe as productive... Right, productive. Now, let me finish, Mr Graham. What I have found uh, that is evident from the productive, mostly productive meetings that I have had is that this issue needs to be brought to a head, that the saga has to end. The Premier has been very clear today. And this is the government um, bringing it to a head. This is, that, is the that's government fair bringing to say. it to a yeah. head because... Thank the commuters of this city <coughs> and this yeah, state want this to issue to brought to a head, and the Premier has been very clear today, and I support Mr. the Premier Farrelly and my, my, I think my you've parliamentary made that clear, yeah. and ministerial colleagues uh, with their view that the deed and EA I just want to put, put these couple extra questions to you, just so we can... Cause I think you've been clear about your position. I think, I think we're not in any doubt about that. Uh, Minister Elliott, when he talked about the path of the dispute when we questioned him last week. Um, when I asked him, uh, as a commuter, I just want to know how long will this be before it's solved? He said, look, it could be solved next week. That's the best case. Or the worst case is it could be six months. Given it won't be solved this week, that's what you've clearly told us. How long will it be till this is solved, well, in your view? And, and you can explore these options with the secretary uh, in in the bureaucrat section uh, section later. But let me be very clear: the premier is bringing this to a head because the commuters of this state wish for it to be brought to a head. They want peace on the public transport network. Let me finish, Mr. Graham. The EA will be put to the combined rail unions at the end of this week, mm -hmm. sometime in the next day or so. Minister, I've let you put no, no, these views, but, that, but I that just that want to, as a, I just want to know when process. will I be able to catch yeah, the train to work process, Mr. on Graham. time. That's, that's the that question, there, that, that, from, But that is the question I just want you to answer. Minister Elliott was really clear. Yeah, but go, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain to you the time as a minister, point of order, point of order. I'll hear the point of order. The Minister is being directly relevant to the Honourable John Graham's questions. I would ask that the Minister be allowed to answer the question in full. If we... If we yeah. Sorry? If, no. I was going to say, if we don't talk over each other, it would be very helpful for Hansard. Um, but given the limited time available, Mr Graham, um, if you could direct the Minister um, in your questioning. And, Minister, if you could be directly relevant. I accept all the context you've given, Minister. I just want you to give... Uh, Minister Elliott gave us a really clear answer. I just want your sense. You're the Minister. Um, how long... Uh, for commuters, how long could this take before this is solved? What's your sense today? Well, from my perspective as a Cabinet Minister, because it will be different to the Labor election strategy that you have with the RTBU, no with the this. CRU, answer with, with the union... Millions movement, of commuters want Mims to know the answer clearly, here. Uh, clearly is I incredibly involved with. There's no need from, for abuse, from a, from a Cabinet Minister who is involved in this process, again, we will present an EA to the members of this combined rail union <coughs> within this week, within a day or so, at the same time a deed will be presented. That will kick off the EA vote process, which will take a number of weeks. Minister, so this is detail, detail, to you, detail. Mr. Graham, when will I be able it, to catch the train on time? It will be... The EA vote process will take a number of weeks. What the Premier has been very clear about today... When will the train if, come on time? Mr Graham, you've asked a question. It is a complex question. I'm giving you... I'm giving you a very definitive answer, and you are interrupting me which is this This must form the same election strategy that you have with Alex Classens, we'll with the RTBU, that. with the CRU, come with This Chris is Mins, the question commuters want to know. The commuters are seeing through it, Mr Graham. They have had a gutful. Okay. They've right. had an absolute yeah. gutful. There's just politics. no need for this. Yeah. So, sorry. OK, order, order. We are now into um, yeah. the crossbench time. Um, but Minister, I, I will ask you, this could all go away pretty simply, couldn't it? Again, the Premier has made it clear that that we will have an EA presented to the members this week at the same time as a deed. That okay. will kick start... Now, let me finish, Ms Boyd. That you don't even know what my question is yet. The, the, that, yes, but it's going to be along the same frame as Mr Graham's well, question. Well, that's a bit offensive. I, I the, the, tend the, to have my own is, the reality is, is that the EA vote uh, will, will go through for a period of weeks. Mm. The Premier has said we need to allow that process to take its course mm -hmm. if in that time frame, if in the next few weeks, yep. whilst that EA vote process is undertaken, mm. if there is protected industrial action, the Premier... The Premier of this state will 
instruct his transport ministers, one, to rip up the EA, yeah. the NIF comes off the table and we are going to the Fair Work Commission. This okay. is all on the unions of this yeah. state. How short -sighted. They are the ones that cancel these trains. All right, they that wasn't my question. That cause the disruption to this state, to mm. this city, and the commuters of this city okay. and state Order. are not going to prepare Minister, to listen to this. Minister, you've to, had to plenty have of time to provide an longer. answer to a question I didn't ask, so I'll now ask the question. Um, this could all actually go away very quickly if your government just agreed to make the modifications for safety reasons that the unions are requesting. Isn't that right? That agreement to modify the new intercity fleet has already been agreed to. It already has been presented to the unions and they have not executed the deal. But that's not agreed no, no, to. No, Ms, Ms Boyd, we have already agreed as the New South Wales government to make the modifications to that train. We have gone as far in, in our deliberations and uh, negotiations to put a timeline on testing, a timeline on mm -hmm. how we mm -hmm. progress that. This is not a matter of whether the new... Are these the, the modifications actually requested by the union? or are these yes. a different set? No, these are the modifications that have been requested by the RTBU. Which you should really have made anyway. No, well, the, these... We, we don't accept... What, what I accept is what the National Safety mm. Regulator says. The National Safety Regulator has said that that train, in its current form, is safe to operate on the network. What has been... Obviously, additional concerns mm. have been raised from the RTBU with me, with the New South Wales Government, with Minister Elliott, uh, and as part of the EA bargaining process, we have uh, agreed agreed to modify the train as part of the EA bargaining process. Why wasn't that done six months ago? No, we, had a, we had an inquiry, we had a hearing day for this particular committee where we heard very clearly that although um, these trains had passed the, the, you know, basically that minimum standard from the safety regulator, um, that your own department agreed that those trains could be safer. So those safety improvements are not new. They were requested by the union a long time ago. Why wasn't it just done? Why didn't you spend the you know, 200 to 300 million dollars on the modification instead of deliberately mothballing these trains and denying the people of New South Wales the opportunity to travel on them? We have not deliberately mothballed any of these trains. These trains still have in-country and pre-provisional testing to occur. The people who have mothballed these trains is the RTBU. These trains are parked in rail sheds across New South Wales who are where they cannot be used. But you you could have heard me, Ms Boyd, in Parliament talk about the, the type of correspondence I get from commuters across New South Wales mm. of what they want in a new train. Yep. Remember? Coach back seats, USB mm -hmm, connectivity, mm -hmm. accessible Something toilets. That's safe and doesn't everything allow people to everything fall between that commuters the want, platform that train and the offers. The, doors. Now, who I listen to is the national safety regulator. Well, we just had that discussion. Sa clear, that safety is a relative level. That that train is safe. I, I, am not safety train, is relative. I am not a train or rail safety expert, and I'm never going no, to claim but to you be have one. People but in your I department will, who are. I will, and they. Those experts within Transport for New South Wales, mm. along with my office, along with my uh, the guidance I take, I listen to who is the National Rail Safety Regulator because they're the experts. Now, not the, the people the, who, the who drive the trains every day, not the people who have been about modifying the new intercity fleet mm -hmm. is a concession that the New South Wales government has made to the RTBU to the RTBU in order to finalise an agreement to get those trains on the track in order to try and bring to a head and finalise the EA bargaining negotiations. It's true, though, Minister, because, that it's yeah. your government's stubbornness that has led to this situation because was, you have failed uh, union to listen to the experts, to the rail workers, to your own department and make those modifications earlier. This could all have been avoided. The idea that you then put it onto the unions and onto the workers is extraordinary. No, no, Ms Boyd, it's, uh, it is not the New South Wales government's stubbornness that, that has, has caused for these trains to pass. I'm glad you admit up. how stubborn it is. It is. It, it is the RTBU in collaboration with the combined rail union stubbornness. Like, we, we need to remember the RTBU and combined rail unions said that they would not negotiate, that they would not accept any form of EA until that new intercity fleet 
was going to be modified. Make it that, safer. That, no, that, that, that it was to be modified. <laughs> had this that discussion. It was to be modified and that it was to be, uh -huh. um, it, it was to be changed. And yep. they wouldn't agree until there was a legally binding deed and document that held the government to that commitment. That is exactly what we In have negotiated. In the face of the government exactly lying, saying it was going to cost a billion dollars, RTBU, all sorts of rubbish. It is exactly what um, the RTBU have have said that they're not in a position to sign. It's all been about um, it's all been about modifying this train until we agree to modify the train, and then we find out what it's really about. Mm -hmm. and it's not about modifying the train. It is about an EA. It is about extracting uh, concessions from government that have nothing to do with the new interest. So that's fleet. why the because government. Well, sorry, just let me stop you there. So that's why they the have already signed the deed that so hang on. presented them. So that's why the RTBU members rejected the $18,000 bonus. Is that right? Because that, that's all they were concerned the about was money? The have said for a long period of time that it was all about modifying the new intercity fleet. They wanted to see a legally binding commitment okay. from the New yep. South They're concerned about safety. to do that. Yep. And they said that when that is done, mm -hmm. that would be the, you know, that, that would bring to a close Should have been done six action. months ago. That, that would bring to a close their action and yep. their campaign. Now, we have done that mm. and it is not the end of their campaign. We have seen continued and yet they don't, they're not protected industrial off with action, your offers even of with an quite agreement, a legally binding agreement mm. from the New South Wales government. Minister, I can't help but think you're just saying the words you want to say and not actually listening to my questions. The protected the question. industrial action. So I'm answering the question. One, one would say right that it is not about no, the just saying, stop. fleet anymore. It is about a combined and strategic um, strategy uh -huh. by the combined rail unions to bring disruption How to the city of Sydney, yeah. to bring disruption and instability stability to the New South yeah. Wales government. This is about a Labor strategy. This yeah, is not no. about safety on trains. Okay, what no. has been evident to me no, recently no, yeah. is that is that the, we have figured it out and the commuters of this state have figured it out and they see it as clear as day that this is all about a strategy, the year of the strike. It is oh, all about okay. the next state election. Order. I'm going to stop you. Very, very, very long answer. Um, Great answer. <laughs> it just went on and on. Yeah. Um, you have an answer answered I have the very direct question. Um, this was all as a result of the stubbornness of your government for not doing these modifications to begin with. What we have now is a process where your government is demonising the workers of this state and trying to turn people against them. The people aren't fooled. People don't think that this is the, the fault of the unions. They think it's the fault of uh, the Great government question. of New South Wales treating them so poorly for so, so long. How can you justify all of the statements you've just made when you know full well that an offer of $18,000 as a bonus to these workers wasn't enough for them to drop this action? Well, Ms Boyd, I am not going to be held responsible for the mm. stubbornness of the RTBU in conjunction with the combined yeah. rail unions. You talk about an $18,000 offer. I have put on the table in a legally binding document mm. to the RTBU uh, the, modif the agreed modifications yeah, you've already, you've already to said this. intercity fleet, <laughs> and that was not executed or agreed to by the union movement. Explain that. So that means to say it doesn't matter whether it's about the $18,000. It doesn't matter whether it's about just, the it's modifications about to the new intercity right, fleet. Okay. This is not about any of those considerations. This is about a consolidated and strategic s strategy mm -hmm. of the year of the strike and to destabilise the yeah. New South Wales government and it's to very cause massive to disruption to the commuters of this city and very this convenient state. Line. And this no, is all about Labor's strategy for March next year. And you talk about commuters... You take no you Commuters about siding with the unions. I, I, I don't believe that. We we I think the, the worm has turned. I think the union is under significant pressure because the commuters of this city and state are not going to put up with this rot by the unions bringing this city to a standstill anymore. Outrageous. Um, it is. Honourable Matt Benassia. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, uh -huh. So are we in a position to talk about WeWar yet or we... Um, let me come back to you on WeWar. I have received... Where are we up to? I can go to something else. If go, go to something else. We'll come back, but we are working oh, on it. You, you, 
Am I right in saying you are the minister that has responsibility for freight? Correct. Yes. So when I showed you this document, which I'll pass up to you now so you can... Yep. You said you haven't read it. I know of the document. I've been referred to the document. I haven't read it from cover to cover. Have you read it at all? No, I said I, I have read, I've read bits and pieces of it. I understand what the document is, but I haven't read it from cover to cover. Okay. What, uh, as the Minister responsible for, for freight, what's your understanding of Port Botany's capacity at the moment? Well, with, as the Minister for Freight, uh, as the Minister for Freight, I'm responsible uh, for everything up until it gets to the port. Right. Ports are under the jurisdiction or under the ministerial portfolio of Minister Elliott. Okay. Um, but that doesn't mean that I haven't shown an interest. It doesn't mean that I'm committed to working with the freight industry on end-to-end -end options. Mm. Um, we have the Pibilis review that is currently underway that, um, that relates directly to um, the functionality and efficiency of port operations. That, that review is currently underway um, and I'm working with the industry industry on how we find efficiencies, whether that be on our road or rail network, to the port. Um, and we've seen challenges recently, even with the flooding events, um, uh, the flooding events and what has, the challenges that has created in getting produce and commodities uh, from paddock uh, to port and obviously paddock to plate. So one of the other points I would add, Mr Benaziak, is since coming uh, in as the Minister for Regional Transport and Roads, but also the Minister responsible for freight. Um, I have set up the Freight Transport Advisory Council, which is a, a multi-mode ministerial um, um, council that reports to me as the Minister for Freight, but we have representatives on that committee uh, in the road freight space, rail freight space, but also uh, New South Wales ports and Ports Australia and Newcastle ports are all represented on that council and are working on giving government uh, the best feedback feedback on multi-modes uh, of freight across this state and how they intersect and how we can continue to support uh, New South Wales being a massive freight hub uh, and what we can do to so find efficiencies in our policy has, decisions into the future. Has that feedback from that uh, consultation with, with, what was the freight? FTAC. FTAC. Yep. Has that feedback included the fact that one of their major concerns is that they can't actually get containers to to their location and back in time uh, to meet the time frames that these container companies actually place on them. So the issue is not on the railway network itself or the road network itself, but the issue actually is that Port Botany is at a point in its capacity or over capacity that it can't actually deliver the containers to the exporters to put for them to put stuff on and get back in time. Well, firstly, I accept there's huge challenges for our exporters in and around um, the ports in that if you miss your port, if you if you miss your slot, if you miss your container slot, um, with global demand uh, and, and our import and export traffic, uh, it is a huge challenge. Do you accept, but, but do you what, accept what, that? What that? I accept is that, firstly... Yeah. We go back to trains again. Ports, if you're asking specific port-related questions, they will have to be directed to Minister Elliott. But what I can say that I know that I'm trying to assist in this space is, one, Freight Branch, which is a, freight, a, a, a division within Transport for New South Wales. Uh, we have had that moved within um, Matt Fuller's jurisdiction to allow the Minister for Freight to have more oversight of end-to-end -end options, including what we can do in that space to support our uh, port operations. Uh, we have of FTAC discussing these very points right now and how they intersect with road and rail freight operations. And thirdly, um, Freight Branch are involved in the Pibilis review, which is currently underway, um, which relates to ports and Minister Elliott. But as the Minister for Freight, I do inform myself of what is happening in that space because it is really important to the As broader Minister freight for industry. Freight, do you accept that if you look at page 23 of that document with the table, we're looking at a 213% increase in commodity forecasts uh, for 2056, that you know, you're going to have to look at other options besides Port Botany uh, if you want to keep those efficiencies and again, you, you want to keep people exporting uh, across the world because they're, they're not, you're not going to be able to wring out any level of efficiency uh, out of Port Botany to, to compensate for that 213% increase. 
It's just not. A, it's just not possible. Will you admit that, Minister? Well, I, what I what I say, Mr. Benaziak, is that these challenges uh, I am working with industry on as much as I can in my portfolio area. Um, we have given the freight industry um, a, a platform to raise, discuss, work through these issues and, and give guidance to the New South Wales Government around feedback. Um, again, the PIBLIS review is underway, which directly relates to the efficiency uh, and operations of ports. Uh, and I'm going to allow that process to take its course. Um, with some of your broader questions, I suspect, um, around specific ports in this state, you'll have to direct them to Minister Elliott. OK. In my remaining three minutes, Minister, are you aware of the Future Transport Technology Roadmap? Which is part of which plan? What's the document you're referring it to? It looks like that. There's specific regional initiatives, so I imagine you have responsibility. What, what, is, it, what is it called, Mr Benazia? Because I can't see Future it. Future Transport Technology Roadmap 2021 to 2024. I believe Mr De Kock might be able to help Yes, sure. Uh, I'm assist with that document. Through you. Uh, That's fine, yeah. Can you up update us in terms of the regional initiatives? Where are we up to in achieving those regional in regional initiatives, given that we're probably 18 months away from you know, the end date of that document? Uh, thank you so much for that question. So that's uh, the, the Future Transport Technology Roadmap. Uh, we released that about a year and a half ago. And it uh, it's, uh, positions uh, transport to be a leader in adopter of uh, tr uh, transport technology. And it contains six priority areas. And uh, actually, uh, to reflect the importance of technologies in the regions, that's, uh, one of the six priority areas is actually regional technologies. And uh, the roadmap has a number of initiatives uh, in that that are, are well underway. Uh, for example, the transport connected buses, which uh, provides uh, the 16 uh, cities uh, with um, uh, buses uh, that um, uh, but passengers can see uh, where they are, uh, how, how the occupants is. That program is well underway. Uh, we've rolled it out already out, uh, for, I believe it's 13 cities, and uh, rem uh, the remaining cities are soon to be rolled out. Uh, it's um, it also... Uh, on, no on notice, can you tell me what those remaining cities are? <laughs> Uh, I can. That is, the remaining cities are Orange and Griffith, and uh, I, uh, they're expected to, to be uh, uh, launched uh, next month. Okay. And so that will provide, uh, in total, uh, 1,300 uh, uh, buses in this uh, operating in the in 16 regional cities, uh, and it gives uh, customers real visibility of where the bus is. Uh, it gives visibility of the timetables, and it also gives operators uh, visibility of how their how their buses are operating. It's a great initiative for both operators and regional customers. And uh, in my final remaining minute, can we just confirm that this this document makes no mention of flying cars? <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Excellent. Can't have a chance. Just, just That's very quickly, on. Madam Chair, um, and Hayes, we have some feedback or a response on we War in your next session. Okay. Well, we might have to leave it till the afternoon. I need to go to a, another meeting. But thank you, Ms. Yeah, well, and Hayes will be able to thank you. inform a response for you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, oh, I might just steal your last minute then. Have you got a... Go for it. Yeah, excellent. Um, sorry, just coming back to the uh, apparent deed um, that was sent. Apparently that's not been received by the unions. It was a, a promise to deliver a deed, but here we are on Wednesday and we still don't have any deed no, being received um, from the no, unions. Uh, indeed. Uh, a just deed. Another, another government stunt, isn't it? No. <laughs> Ms. Boyd, Ms. Boyd, don't be like that. Um, uh, the deed was the deed was presented to the RTBU last mm -hmm. week. Um, yeah, that's I, the one I, though I that needed clear, to be amended. I was very I clear. Alex send you. I was very oh, clear. I wish I was on Alex's little oh, phone. This time. No, John he doesn't. Yeah, apparently. Left out. <laughs> Sorry, Minister. No, so a deed was presented to the RTBU last week. I was very clear on Friday that the deed that was presented last week was not acceptable to the RTBU, and That's it was right. disappointing that they couldn't sign that. Mm -hmm. uh, they have since they have since uh, uh, offered a a modified or revised mm -hmm. a deed uh, that we are working through. Oh, and, okay. And, and so as I said, yes, but the deed doesn't relate the changes. No, without trying to talk out of school, the the mm -hmm. the change. Changes to the deed that you yeah. are referring to yep. don't relate to the modifications. 
That's not, that, that's not what you said. Uh, you the, the said that there, there is an agreed deed that has been sent to the union there, there has and been, then that has somehow they, they've not responded. But that's not actually true, is it? They've no, not they, received no, that anything. that is true because the modifications that have been agreed to in that deed have not changed. What the union is seeking is other clauses to be changed in that deed that tie uh, in mm. to the enterprise <coughs> agreement. So the, on the Sunday... Agreement, no, no, Miss Boyd, let's be very clear. The discussions and negotiations mm -hmm. are around the modifications, the actual modifications and timeline and how yep. how yep. we will manage that moving forward when, sure. when an agreement is reached. That's not th relevant. Th that has not changed at all. So on Sunday, the New South Wales government wrote to rail workers saying that they would agree to the safety concerns and would send a signed commitment. As of today, no signed commitment has been sent. No, it, so when you were saying that an agreement had been made and, you know, it's up, you know, why are the unions not accepting it, blah, blah, blah. That's nonsense because they haven't even received this signed commitment. That, that, that's totally inaccurate, Ms Boyd. Again, I presented a deed that was unacceptable uh, last week to the RTBU. They have come back with a uh, with a change to clauses within the deed that do not relate specifically... That's not what you no, said. Ms Boyd, you, you asked a question. No, and you're, you're not answering I'm trying it. to give you the answer. This is complex. You can't just come in as an outsider to understand how complex okay, the negotiations are. but you are. can't come in here and misconstrue I'm, I'm not what that deed was. I'm you made out in accurate. the last round of, of questioning that this was all in the union's court because the government had delivered this signed deed and what the hell's their problem was basically my, it, my impression of what you said. And yet it turns out that you haven't signed, you haven't sent that so, signed so commitment to, at to, all. Because we're going around in circles. To summarise to summarise, and to best answer your further questions, because my previous answer were accurate in today's session, the changes Order that the RTBU requested mm. uh, after my presentation of the deed mm. late last week mm. were agreed to by the government in the event that the RTBU, in, in partnership with the CRU, withdraw industrial action. Where's the signed commitment where, letter? Where, where they, yes, but that offer was put back to the combined rail unions, specifically the RTBU, that the government would agree to their final change mm. to the deed. You can see how this but looks like a But the government agreed, the government agreed to that change if, if the combined rail unions withdrew mm. their industrial action today. Okay. Now, now the combined rail unions, specifically uh, the RTBU, mm -hmm. um, said that that was unacceptable, that they would not withdraw their industrial action. Right. So, so we're you, taking you, this as clarificatory evidence. No, no. We, we say, we say, I've been very clear about this. You haven't been very clear. I You've have made out that clear. it's the unions that are holding out. But it out. is the unions. But you haven't delivered the signed commitment letter, no, no, correct? We, we have agreed to mm. the changes. We have agreed to the changes the RTBU requested. In, and, and the condition was that, that the CRU withdraw their industrial action for today. Now, that was not done, Ms the, Boyd. That was not done. So when you say that... The um, message that, the government sent on Sunday clear, was that it oh, would send a signed commitment letter. Where's the signed commitment letter? It was presented. The, that offer was presented from Minister Tudor Hope on Sunday. That was presented to the RTBU... A signed commitment and to letter. ..and Unions New South a Wales. A signed commitment letter. A signed letter to Unions New South Wales... Not the commitment and letter. ..and the RTBU that we would agree to their final change... So to not the Lord commitment letter. Ms Boyd. Ms Boyd. The, yes, the, the agreement was we would we would agree to the to the final change to the clause mm -hmm. if the unions withdrew their industrial action. So do you think as a commuter, Ms Boyd, that it is fair that the government has conceded, Mr. given given the RTBU what they want, all we ask is for peace on the public transport network. The yeah. unions have effectively got what they set out to achieve yeah. no, they in they the modifications a to the new intercity fleet with a legally binding deed that they could execute mm. and they turn they around and say, no, nah, industrial action, yeah, no, it, it they remains got for Wednesday. What, it remains for Wednesday. Told everyone so that they I'm got. sorry, but the voting public and the commuters of this state yeah. are not going to put up with that. No, and, why would you say they are not going to put up with that? Well, 
if they get that kind of mis misinformation again, from the government. Reference the Labor Party at the state oh, here we go. And at the federal election. Uh, so I, I love I these deflections. These you, are my favourite uh, uh, of the I deflections suspect, from ministers. The attack on, on the question. Go ahead. Part of this strategy about the yeah. year of the yeah. strike. Yeah. Okay. And that you, yeah, you no. find pleasure no. in, in commuters of this state being totally yeah, disrupted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that casuals going for their first casual shift. Do you can't think people believe this, Minister? Or, or this people is that very need unbecoming. to get to work can't get All to right. work. Like, Enough. I heard a story on Sydney order. Back Radio this no, morning. No, Minister, order. Oh, it's the opposition's order. time. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, I might turn, if you're comfortable with this, to some other issues. But you, d you don't want to talk about the I'd, I'd just, your, I'd, your mates and the Indians? I'd just take okay. the offer if I were you. Um, I want to ask about the government's changes the to the signage that applies to speed cameras. The government paid for uh, the signage, which is now on top of the cars. How much did taxpayers pay? I'd have to refer to um, um, to Tara McCarthy on the specifics about exactly what that cost. But what I will say is a little bit of context well, from, well, from the I'll beginning. Well, I'll ask that you're directly relevant, and we might ask Ma no, no, Ms. McCarthy. No, you no, know, directly to, relevant to, yeah. to the signage. Um, to the cost of the signage. The, well, to the signage that... Um, in, as the incoming Minister for Regional Roads, um, from the community feedback, I was pretty clear um, that we needed uh, to find the balance, and the balance was uh, to have our mobile Minister, speed Minister, I'll, I'll draw you back to the cost of the signage. I think you preferred that McCarthy. to Ms McCarthy. So you don't want to hear the others. Yeah, look, can I say that the cost of the signage was done within the existing contract, and it was $2.6 million. The cost, that, that's the cost of the contract or the cost of the signage? The cost of the signage was $2.6 million, but it was done within the existing contract. Um, what do you, well, we might return to that in the, um, in the session. Thank you, Minister. I might um, turn to the government's uh, future transport 2061 plan, the draft plan, the plan that uh, has since become reasonably public is the way I'd describe it. Uh, in relation to one of the uh, discussions in there, it says the draft transport plan, this is the 10th of February 22, 2022 version, marks sensitive New South Wales Cabinet, not for further distribution, says this. More than 80% of the rural road network has a default 100 kilometre per hour speed limit regardless, regardless of safety protections. Speed limits across our rural network should be assessed and adjusted to best suit road conditions. And it goes on to give some examples, including as we're approaching uh, level crossings where perhaps the limit there should be 80 kilometres on the approaches. Uh, is the government considering, are you considering as Minister, lowering speed limits mm. across the rural road network? Um, well, firstly, uh, thanks for the question, Mr Graham. The Future Transport 2061 plan is a draft plan. Um, it is where we are updating our future vision for transport across New South Wales, and regional New South Wales is in, will be included in that plan, as well as other portfolio areas like freight. Um, but the reality is, Mr Graham, that it is a draft plan, and I will have more to say when the government has more to say when we announce what is the final plan uh, for Future Transport 2061. Minister, I accept, that, uh, I accept that answer in relation to the transport plan. I'm asking something slightly different, though. Given that the draft plan says that, are you considering lowering speed limits across the rural road network, as I'm, is referred to I'm in the draft I'm not going plan? to be talking about um, um, a draft plan that, uh, that isn't the final plan, and I just prefer to my previous answer. <laughs> Let's separate the two things then. Let me just put the question to you without this reference. Minister, are you considering lowering speed limits, perhaps to 80 kilometres an hour, across the rural road network? I refer to my previous answer. Well, your previous answer gave no answer at all to if, this. If, if you would like to talk about speed zones across regional New South Wales and how we review speed zone changes and how they're done on merit or on consultation or feedback, I would refer you to the process. Mr Carlin can answer those questions with regard to the government's policy position in 
written around future transport 2061. It's a draft report that isn't finalised. Mm. You're referring to some documents that uh, that are not actually have been made public. And I'll have more to say when we finalise the future transport 2061 and the portfolio areas of mine that are relevant in that future plan. Thank you, Minister. And I'm familiar with the process, but I might just note for the record you've refused to rule that in or out. No, um, I've, I've, ask I've, I've, asked you, I've asked you to... You've given your I answer, have Minister. referred the question given your answer. to an expert who can well, give you the how we review expert. speed changes in regional New South Wales. That's I'm very, very, very tricky, a very, very tricky statement, Mr Graham. And for the record and for Hansard, uh, I have given you the ability to <coughs> ask a, an expert in Mr Carlin with years of experience to outline the process on how we review speed changes in regional New South Wales, are you elected? Process, are you elected not to take that option and to provide a tricky statement, Minister? Are you aware of a grant that was given by John Barillaro uh, in Narromine out of the Regional Investment Attraction Fund uh, to develop flying cars in New South Wales? I'm aware of an announcement that was made in Narromine with the then Deputy Premier and Minister and, and then a member for Dubbo, now member for Dubbo, um, but that's the extent of what I know. It is not within uh, the funding program of Transport for New South Wales. I believe that the question should be directly referred uh, to, to uh, the Deputy Premier's office and, and the agency of and the And just Department to establish your alibi, you weren't there at the... Announcement. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah. No. Uh, but you, you're broadly aware of it. And I don't think I was... When was the announcement? I don't think I, I was 8th a minister. 8th of July 2020. You were no, not, I wasn't no, a minister no, either. No, exactly. Um, but uh, there was some suggestion you were there, but I just want to clearly establish on the record your alibi. I think we both agree you were not... Who suggested? You were not present. Um, it's only you suggesting it. Is this serious, though, that uh, we might have flying cars... In New South Wales, well, you'd Is have to in and around in and around Jetsons? the funding, the Jetsons, yes, in and around the funding for um, what you describe as flying cars and and the narrow mine investment. Pose those questions uh, to the Department of Regional New South Wales. But what I can say, and we have Mr. De Kock here that can answer uh, more broadly, is that in, in, he's already, in within he's transport, already, I think you'll be most unwilling to do that. The flying in, car the, no, no, no. In in transport for New South Wales uh, and my portfolio area, not that far. From from Narrow Mine, we have our emerging vehicle technology facility at Tudel, mm. um, home of Hazelton Airlines, mm. you know, a very reputable, long serving uh, business in the regions. We've been able to convert Tudel Airport into an um, emerging vehicle tech facility. You're talking um, like a fan of these <coughs> ideas, Minister. That's This is the sort of big talk that it produced it's not exactly talk. this. We're, we're delivering. Exactly it's not this talk. grant. We're the delivering. reason I'm asking you is yeah. this is in the future transport strategy. It promises, in fact, flying cars in New South Wales by 2026. I'm not talking about... Given we can't run the trains on time, given the trams don't Here work at all... Here oh. we go. Maybe given you've got a duck when you're on a ferry, oh, well. are we seriously well, going to have vision, flying cars than you in the next term of Parliament? So, Mr. Mr. Graham, what I'm talking about is actual funding, actual commitments, actual delivery. We have. And what I'm asking no, about is your you've, strategy. You've, you've asked a question. You're talking but, about something entirely. Else. I'm not referring to transport, future transport 2061. I am referring to our emerging vehicle well, I am referring to it. in QDAL that we have delivered on, that we have autonomous yeah. vehicle testing, that we have direct collaboration Minister, you're with the private sector. We agree. Sector. You're talking about something else. I'm asking about your strategy that promises flying cars in the next term of Parliament. Is this serious? It's not. It's it not sounds within, like a joke. I've said to you that uh, I have said to you that the funding, the criteria, the rollout of that program mm -hmm. is directly related to the Department of Regional New it's South Wales. It's in your strategy. The Deputy Premier don't laugh, and his Minister, very don't hard laugh. working this is in your strategy. are in the next room. Maybe, maybe you should fly over there, <laughs> fly over there and ask the questions to the relevant Minister oh, you because you're, you're an experienced individual, Mr Graham, and you are here and Minister. you're not Minister, even asking can you the correct rule questions out? to can the correct minister. Out? Fly over to the Macquarie room, fly over there and, and ask oh, Minister Toole. Minister, can I just ask you a couple sure more questions for you? 
the government having a sky toll program <laughs> when they introduce these flying cars. I refer cars to my in the previous answer, Mr. Term of Parliament. Can I mean, are you seriously sky saying to us, signs, John. Minister? <laughs> this is in your out. draft strategy. Are you seriously telling us that in the same amount of time that it's taken us to not fix the new intercity fleet, we might have flying cars? Oh, mm. Mr. Graham, um, I refer to my previous answer. We need a fifth. I'll turn to the, the issue of taxis along with my colleague. Minister, you tend to get along mm. pretty well with most of your colleagues, is my observation in the House. Popular bloke. Who do you blame, given they blame each other, Minister Keane or Minister Elliott, for the fact that taxi plate owners have not yet been compensated? Mm. Well, firstly, it, it should be noted that, that uh, our point-to-point -point reforms are progressing. Um, we, need to, we need to progress uh, and finalise our reforms and what the final transitional payment and package looks like to the taxi industry. Um, as the Minister for Regional Transport, I am here to represent regional taxi <coughs> operators and plate owners in regional New South Wales. Um, it's exactly what I've done. And, and to clarify, Mr Graham, I've met with the New South Wales Taxi Council face-to-face -face a number of times, a number of meetings. Meetings. My office, I think, but also, and also keep in touch Who's with the Taxi Council you, weekly. What's your view about I, I have this? Met, I've met with um, regional taxi plate owners, operators. I've discussed it with local government as well. Um, the reality is, Mr Graham, that mm. I have reflected the consultation I've had with regional taxi operators into a submission, into the processes of government, and those processes of government are, ta are being worked through in due course. OK. Um, can I talk specifically about ground-based vehicles, taxis? Um, um, can I quote from Mr um, Jeff Ferris, President of Country Taxis, quote, why is it taking so long for the Treasurer to support the need for fair and proper compensation? $1.6 billion has been taken from licence owners in New South Wales because of a New South Wales government decision with a number of these owners in regional New South Wales with multiple licences. The industry is unable to move forward. How do you answer that? Well, firstly, well, I, I, again, I would say that I'm here to represent the views of regional taxi plate owners. I have met Mr Ferris on a number of times, the same as Mr Rogers from the Taxi Council, as well as regional plate owners, co-op operators. I've, I've had a lot of consultation in this space. I have reflected the views and consultation uh, with regional taxi operators into the submission. I've represented those views and what I thought was the right approach. They have been put into the submission. They has uh, gone through uh, the processes of government, uh, and we are all working towards finalising our point-to-point -point right. reform, uh -huh. which will include what the final transitional payment looks like. Um, the taxi industry was supported during COVID with COVID-specific assistance. Um, $145 million has already been dispersed and paid to industry um, from the PSL. And for the record, Mr Primrose, um, I remain committed to ensuring that regional taxi plate owners do get a fair and in, and in some ways a generous transitional payment. When? Whenever. When it was going through the, the processes of government and uh, ministers are keen and, El uh, and Elliot and myself are working through those processes so we can finalise the transitional payment and we can finalise the reforms to the point-to-point -point industry. These operators are talking about leaving regional communities, which means they won't have taxi services. Um, so it would seem to me um, and them that the issue is the length of time this is taking. So I ask again, when do you expect that a decision will be made? I don't need a day, but these people are asking when, when are they actually going to get an outcome of this process? Yeah, well, I, I would like to see... I, I will continue working through the processes of government. I, I, I do not sit on the Expenditure Review Committee. Uh, neither does Minister Elliott. That, that, that is uh, obviously for senior ministers, including the Treasurer of this state. We are working through the processes of government uh, of what the final reforms to the point-to-point -point, uh, industry looks like, which would include a transitional, the final transitional payment. Uh, I've even gone as far to understand uh, 
how you disperse a transitional payment and the tax obligations for taxi plate owners in that space. Like I have done the research, I have reflected the views of regional taxi plate owners into my submissions. Uh, Minister Elliott is looking after uh, the views, concerns, considerations of metropolitan taxi plate owners. So you'd have to ask him uh, questions that relate to, to the metropolitan area and plate owners. But for Mr Ferris that you refer to, who I've met, uh, for Mr Rogers of the Taxi Council and for the numerous taxi operators that I have met with and discussed these reforms to, uh, I have reflected the views uh, and those considerations into the processes of government and into submissions, um, uh, working in collaboration with Minister Elliott's office. Do you agree with them that this whole process within government is taking too long? I say that we, we need to follow the processes of government. I want to ensure and remain committed uh, that regional taxi plate owners do get a generous and fair transitional payment. Um, again, if uh, uh, again there are processes of government, uh, we are working through those processes, and I would hope that that uh, we can finalise our point-to-point -point reforms um, as quickly as possible. Um, in February, the taxi industry submitted a proposal on behalf of the um, entire point-to-point -point transport industry for a change to current policy. Did you read that? Um, I will... I'd have to refer back to which document you are referring to, because there has been a lot of work done in this space, a lot of consultation, a lot of meetings. Um, I will come back to you on that on notice. OK, it's been seven months on and the industry is still awaiting a decision. Um, when do you think they'll get a response? I'll refer to my previous answer. OK. There's a significant shortage of drivers in the industry. Um, what are you going to do to help address this issue? Uh, well, it is fair to say that the industry has raised concerns about uh, taxi drivers who are re-entering the industry because taxis have seen an uplift uh, on the back of uh, some form, you know, as we're seeing COVID recovery, um, whether it's in the city or the regions. So there are taxi drivers, uh, or previous taxi drivers, who are returning either back to Australia or back into the industry. Uh, and there are some reforms or there are some ways government can assist in getting more of these drivers back on, you know, into taxis and on the road. And uh, I would refer to Tara McCarthy um, and Yo's team um, if you want to specifically talk about some of those changes uh, that I have taken from the feedback with the industry and we are trying to work through now how we how we can assist industry to get these drivers to return uh, behind the wheel into the industry sooner. Well, there's one particular issue I'd like you to address and that is currently you need an Australian driver's licence for 12 months in the last two years to be eligible to drive in the point-to-point -point industry in New South Wales. In Victoria and South Australia it's only six months. So are you proposing that, that, to That is exactly some of the consultation I've had with the industry. The point-to-point -point commissioner is also within the industry and available to discuss these, um, these changes or challenges. But the, the challenge you have described has been raised with me from the taxi industry and transport for New South Wales, and I'll hand over to Tara, because they are looking at this right now. Yes, so we, we've received representation from the taxi industry um, and the rideshare industry more broadly in relation to their concerns about the difficulties getting drivers. Uh, we have been working closely with them to look at a number of options uh, for a variation to the, the current requirements. Um, we've been working closely with the point-to-point -point commissioner. Uh, we believe uh, we have an option and the point-to-point -point commissioner is currently considering that and will take that to government for consideration. Are there any proposed timelines on this? Uh, my understanding is that's imminent. Okay, what's imminent that the matter... The, the imminent that, that transport is working, as, as Ms McCarthy has said, um, on a change uh, and how... Uh, and we are working with the point-to-point -point commissioner on this and it, it is in the near future. OK, well... You know, forgive me, but um, we discussed earlier on the glacial nature of the roads reclassification program. Um, people would like to know that it will move a bit faster than that. Weeks. Weeks, OK. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, just, um, if I could just refer, if I, because I just mentioned the issue of... Um, um, the roads reclassification program. Um, the 
A resolution that came out a couple of weeks ago from um, Bega Valley Council in relation to a matter we discussed earlier. Um, and the resolution of the council was, the council urgently seek an update from the New South Wales government on the progress of the regional road transfer and classification review, which may impact future management responsibility for the Tartha um, Bermagui Road and consequently Cutterjee Bridge. Um, how would you respond to them? But what specifically is your question, Mr. Premier? My question is they're seeking an update. Um, well, I, about I would the give them the same the update that I gave you today, Mr. Primrose, and it is the same update. I believe um, I have been on a panel uh, uh, with um, with Wendy Mason, the independent <coughs> chair uh, of or the chair of the independent panel of the, of the reclass and transfer panel. Um, I would give Bega Council, Bega Valley Council, the same update I gave you today, so they could understand how we are progressing this program, uh, when we look to have uh, the report back, what the independent panel is doing right now, um, and again, how we are progressing the priority round so, so Bega Valley can see that, um, yes, we've got a commitment there, yes, we've got funding there, we are progressing the program, but whilst at the same time working with that council and all the other councils across this state on broader road funding, on road repair, on natural disaster declaration funding. Like, there, 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 is more, there is more to road funding and considerations for councils than just the road reclass and transfer program. They need the support which they are getting through our funding programs, through direct collaboration uh, with government, whilst at the same time we are progressing the commitment uh, around the road reclass and transfer program. It's also worthwhile pointing out in my life Last point is, Minister, um, that um, you indicated that no councils had raised this issue with. No, no, no. I, I, I said very few councils. Very few councils. Very few councils. Well, um, Bega Valley Council's definitely one of them because they're concerned about. Yes, and, and I believe they've written to me on it uh, from memory. They've written to me on this as well. But they're concerned about um, that bridge. Thank you. Um, thanks. I'll just ask um, a couple of questions and then I'll hand back to the opposition. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Minister, about the Inland Rail Project. Um, the, you know, the initiative and the goals um, are well supported um, across political parties and, and also um, across the state. Um, but I understand that there are a number of local um, areas that are a bit concerned about the impact on um, regional towns. Have you had any um, councils approach you with concerns about the way that the Inland Rail Project um, is going to impact on their town? Well, firstly, for context, prior to being the Minister for Regional Transport and Roads, um, even as a parliamentary secretary and backbencher, I I've met with members of the broader community that have concerns around um, uh, around the Inland Rail project. And I have been able to, in some of these instances, organise uh, meetings with the, the, the then interim CEO of Inland Rail ARTC uh, and those community members. I've been able to do my bit um, to make sure that their voices and concerns are heard. It is worth noting it is a Commonwealth Government funded project and ARTC Inland Rail are uh, uh, administering and rolling out this project. Transport have um, involvement, obviously, around acquisition of the corridor and, mm. and in and around uh, funding commitment with uh, grade separation and level crossings. But in terms to, to the specifics of your question, it is really a question that has to be uh, put to the, the Commonwealth Government because it is their project, it is their program and they are rolling it out. So could I ask you, for example, um, and I accept I accept that you've played a role in, in coordination um, in some cases, That's that sounds great. Um, but in the instance, for example, you know, Wagga Wagga City Council is very concerned about the impact of the Inland Rail project there. Have you spoken with the Wagga Wagga City Council in relation to this? I haven't. I met the, the Mayor of Wagga Wagga City Council, uh, Dallas, I've forgotten Dallas' surname, but mm -hmm. recently when I was in Wagga visiting uh, and making a government announcement, um, I can confirm that uh, Joe McGurr, the, the, the member for Wagga, has spoken to me in the last seven days regarding concerns that he has in and around the inland rail 
corridor mm -hmm. uh, and some concerns he has for the Wagga Wagga community. Um, my office has been incredibly responsive and proactive to Dr McGurr. We have committed... Um, Obviously, we have explained to Dr McGurr that this is a Commonwealth Government project. This is not one that we have complete oversight with. We have involvement, as I said, in and around land acquisition, uh, grade separation, <coughs> level crossings, uh, and, and our funding and commitment in that space. But in terms of the corridor, uh, I've explained to Dr McGurr that that is uh, uh, representing Wagga Wagga City Council that he will have to direct that to the Commonwealth. And my office, I think, has gone as far to organise Dr McGurr a meeting um, uh, between him and the CEO or senior personnel from Inland Rail ARTC. Um, so I was in Wagga, Wagga um, about 10 days ago uh, and saw for myself where, I guess, where this... Um, at the rail, at the existing um, rail, um, and where we're now going to expect these far more frequent um, and you know larger, longer trains coming through once the inland rail project has been um, uh, completed, um, and the way that the level crossings will need to be coming down and um, really blocking quite frequently high traffic areas within Wagga. There's a real concern that it's going to sort of split the city in two. Um, are you saying that there's no role for the state government in trying to ameliorate that impact? I'm saying, that, and as I said to Dr McGurr, um, that is a question in relation to the corridor. Um, the corridor is not set by the New South Wales government. The corridor is set by the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. uh, and then inland rail, um, ARTC need to obviously abide by planning laws and, and, and any other uh, considerations. But um, the question really goes to the corridor um, and as to whether the rail should be going through cities like Wagga that you've that you've mm -hmm. referred to, and, and it is a it is a question for the Commonwealth, and that is why I have said uh, to the local member for Wagga Wagga um, that we have, and I've just had it confirmed, that we have arranged a meeting for Dr McGurr and ARTC Inland Rail in the coming weeks. So just to confirm the, the nature of the state's involvement then, so if, for example, the community were to, were to say, you know, we would, we would like a tunnel under or we would like a bridge over or we would like something else in order to reconnect I our our town, is that something that's within the state's responsibility or no? I'll, I'll pass on to the Deputy Secretary, Matt Fuller, just to answer those questions, maybe specifically about what our involvement is, but more broadly, as I've said, grade separation, level crossings, some planning, property acquisition um, as part of the corridor, but the corridor is well and truly set by the Commonwealth. It's their project, but you might um, be able to just elaborate on where directly our involvement is. Thank you, Minister. Um, look, um, Chair, the, uh, the Regional Division of Transport through our Western Division has been extensively engaged with the Inland Rail Project. Uh, they work very closely with them to, to, to try and help uh, identify and, and work through with the communities any of the concerns around uh, what's going on within the corridor. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a number of ways we've been doing that. Um, as the Minister said, some of that's around uh, assisted. The state has provided the process for property acquisition as one, uh, and so we've been helping there and making sure that, uh, you know, community concerns around making sure there's independent property managers assisting landholders to can I Sorry, can I just bring you back to the, just in the interests of time? Sure. Um, what I particularly am interested in knowing is what the state can do to ameliorate some of the worst impacts of this. So, for example, can the state put conditions on the development um, to ask uh, the Commonwealth to build a tunnel or a bridge or do something else? Um, um, my understanding is that uh, planning uh, are able to... They're, they're the ones that are assessing the project. Uh, we've worked very closely with planning on a number of examples where uh, we, we have flagged uh, issues that we'd like to be seen yep. addressed differently. Um, I, th I think where your question comes from around the Wagga situation is about the treatment of level crossings mm. and, uh, and, and the state and our team have been working very closely with Inland, Inland Rail on prioritising the grade-separated level crossings 
Uh, Can you explain our, what that is? So the grade separated is where you have road that goes over rail mm -hmm. to avoid that issue that you talk about in yeah. terms of cutoff when a train yeah. comes through and the traffic comes to a stop. Yes. So grade separation uh, is something that we've been working very closely with. There was mm -hmm. a recent uh, announcement from the federal government to further support the rollout of grade separation on the inland rail project. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been helping and, and I guess, informing inland rail on what we'd like to see in terms of those prioritised grade separation crossings. Uh, at the moment, there's been four that have been agreed. Uh, yep. But we would certainly, and the state's position has always been, that we would like as many grade, separation, grade separated crossings as is possible yep. um, to take place to avoid the sort of issues that you talk about, along with the obvious other issues related to safety. So, and that would go a long way to addressing those concerns, if we could have a grade separation crossing in Wagga. Um, just to clarify, though, is that something that could be made a condition on this project? I, I, I don't, my understanding is it's not something that could be made a condition. We've been working uh, cooperatively with Inland Rail mm -hmm. to try and influence and inform as many yep. of those crossings as we can and build cases uh, to seek the funding that would be uh, commensurate with that. Okay, thank you, that's very useful. Back to the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Minister, are you aware of this issue with the Regional Seniors Travel Card where if the balance falls below $5 and is unspent in 30 days, then the cards are cancelled and the funds forfeited to Transport for New South Wales. I'm not aware of that issue, but we... Um, Yoast, yeah, um, I'm not aware of that specific issue, but Yoast um, de Kock may be able to answer the question, but I think it is worth noting how successful this regional seniors travel yeah. card has been. Um, but why are we taking the, that Mr. $5? Graham, this is the same card that your party opposed. I, I, well, I want you to opposed it. Minister, I, you're not aware of this issue. Um, why are... A million cards. A million well, cards have gone out since, and, since the start of this program. And how much have you taken back, I guess is my question, Minister. How much money has been taken back off people that was promised and delivered to them, now reclaimed? I'll pass over to Mr. De Kock. Yeah, thanks, Minister. And as the uh, Minister said, uh, the, re uh, the re uh, Regional Seniors Travel Card has been uh, really successful after a two year trial. It uh, has been expanded, and as the Minister said, nearly a million cards have uh, been uh, distributed, and, uh, and there's a $250 card uh, for, uh, for uh, regional seniors to pay on uh, travel expenses. Um, and the balance is $250. And, and Mr. De Kock, I'm, yep. I'm well aware of this. Yep. How much money has been taken back off people? Uh, I don't have those figures at my at my fingertips, uh, so I'll have to take it on notice uh, how how much exactly that w would be. All right, thank you. And um, we might return, given, uh, Minister, I appreciate your answer, that but it's not an issue you're aware of, so it might come back can, to that. Can I just confirm for the record, session. Mr Graham, that um, it, I have actually, to memory, I sign a lot of correspondence and I read all of it before I sign it. I haven't seen this yeah. this raised with me yeah. at all, and I've just checked no, no, with I my office that. and I don't think we've received, so we'll certainly maybe go and look into it. It could yeah. be some sort of technical issue, but happy to look into it. No, good. I, re I really appreciate that answer, and we might raise it again this afternoon afternoon to get some more details, but I, I, I appreciate that answer. I do want to turn to the regional travel and regional apprentice and uni travel card uh, as one of the $42 billion of new initiatives by the Treasurer. This $98 million two-year pilot uh, was announced. When will the program commence? Um, well, you will be as excited as I am when I um, announce this in the near future. $98 million um, and will I be obviously excited? has been my set aside um, for this really important card. Um, I've read we, the budget, we, on, the, on the back of the success of the Regional Seniors Travel Card, yes, I've been able to work up uh, what will be the Regional Apprentice and University Travel Card. Um, we're finalising the criteria and the application process and how to roll this out in particular in a way that, uh, that will work for the community. Um, we'll have a lot more to say in the very near future. Can but you give also, us some sense also of another timing, though, really minute. important minister, initiative no, around sorry, minister, cost I'm, of living. No, no, I'm going to stop you there, Minister. Massive I'm going to address... You have to be directly relevant. I've asked you when. I, I mean, is this... Like, one of the ways to deal with this would be to have it in place for next year. Is that the goal here? When will this be in place? I will have a lot more to say about when the application process will be open in the very near future. Mm. OK. How many people are expected to take up the... Regional Apprentice part of this card? I refer to my previous answer. Well, your previous answer gave no detail. This is budget estimates. Can you tell us, as Minister, do you have the first clue how many people are expected to take this up? I have 
I can confirm that $98 million is listed in the budget papers the budget. Uh, for the regional uh, apprentice and, and uni student travel card. Um, we are finalising the criteria and what the application process will look like. Minister, and I'll have allocated a lot more to money. say in the near future. Do you when we even announce, know? Uh, once, once we announce when the application process You're avoiding the question, uh, will Minister. be open Do you even and know the criteria how many has people, been finalised. Do you even know how many people are expected to take this up? I refer to my previous answer. Which gave no detail. This is budget estimates. I'm asking about a program in your control. You're proud of this program. How many people are going to It'll take be it up? Really, when, when I announce it, shortly, again, you you're will avoiding be the question, as excited Minister. as I am, because this is an important cost excited. of living measure that this government, that the New South Wales Nationals, working with our Liberal colleagues, will be <laughs> delivering Minister, into you're regional the New South Wales. That you're not across it's your all brief about here. putting you're not, budget you're and not money doing back yourself into any the favors pockets here. of our hard-working apprentices of and no. un, regional uni students who have who who do face costs in in delivering their course in in making making sure that they can complete those studies. Um, we're finalising the criteria. Minister, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll have a yeah. lot more to say in the very near future. But you can't tell um, me and today when we get to that how point, many people you will be are expected as excited to benefit. as I am. Yeah, but you don't know how many people will benefit. Is that a fair... I'm not using budget announce uh, budget estimates to make uh, you know policy announcements here. Again, I confirm uh, for budget estimates today, there's 98 million dollars in the budget. We're finalising the criteria. Right, thank you, and Minister. The application I've, if that's process. all you've got to add, we'll I'm move excited on. about it. Really excited Minister, about it. Minister, we're moving um, on. We'll have given a lot your lack more to of say shortly. We're moving on. Minister, um, can I just have a look at the fixing country roads program? Um, now, is it the case that in 2019, $80.3 million was taken from that Fixing Country Grants program? And that you've recently announced that that's going back. I can confirm that um, the $80.3 million in the final round of what has been a very successful $543 million program uh, delivering uh, uh, funding into regional communities for lane widening, bridge enhancements, with a very clear focus around freight movements and, in, and enhancements for our freight industry and shoring up our supply chain. That is what this fund is for. I can confirm that the $80.3 million um, uh, has been uh, made available and applications are open. Yeah. Now, before it was taken out, um, um, back in um, 2019, there were something like 69 applications um, from local councils. Um, they have now been told that they need to resubmit those applications. Is that the case? Yes. OK. Which, which I think is fair, Mr Primrose, because I think this would be the opportunity that if there is a uh, change in cost or delivery around those projects that were sitting there that they may want to put uh, resubmit. Um, they're invited to do that. I have written, uh, I believe, to a lot of the local government um, uh, areas across the state, advising them that the funding is available, encouraging them to resubmit uh, those applications and to take the opportunity to see if there is any changes in cost uh, while they're doing that. But also, it, it shouldn't be just because they're sitting there that they're the ones we look at. Priorities might have changed in these local government areas for those projects, or they may have been able to secure other state or federal funding already for those projects. So I think it is a prudent way um, to advise that the, the funding is there. Uh, it is going to be a round six, I believe, of fixing country roads program. Um, and um, let's let's get this uh, let's get these applications in, and let's get uh, the grading to occur, and, and we'll, we'll roll out these announcements and support councils. <laughs> The, Yet again, the in addition to our fixing the applications road had gone in. Councils had spent a lot of time and money and resources um, putting them in. Um, now. Yeah, but all they have to do is update their application and resubmit it, Mr Primrose. It's like, I, I don't think that that is an unreasonable ask on local government, and we have our, our Transport for New South Wales team working directly with these communities and councils, uh, and, and if they need some assistance, if they need some assistance uh, in time, or if they need some assistance in a bit of extra resource to help do this, or scope, or if they want another set of eyes to look over their proposal to make sure that they're on the but right the path... the years have rolled on here, that, Minister. That, that, some that, 
many of these staff might have left the council. Some of that, all that knowledge has gone in the years it's taken for you to deal with these issues. Yes, well, at the end of the day, Mr Graham, we have round six of our Fixing Country Roads program. I announced on the 22nd of August that uh, the $80.3 million that's made available in round six is open, uh, and I encourage councils that had previous applications in to uh, have, a, have a look over their proposal. Is this still a priority? And if so, resubmit it. Can I ask you where the $80.3 million appears in the budget papers, please? Now... Yeah, 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 yeah. So it is a decision of the Expenditure Review Committee since the budget was uh, published. All when was that decision made? Um, I will come back to you throughout the course of estimates when, at, at which ERC meeting, which I think I can find, of which date that that occurred. Miss, we might be able to find that. Out, Rob, yeah, but um, it, it was over the course of the last eight weeks. Yeah. So since the 21st of June, in the last eight weeks, and what triggered that decision? Oh, well, it, it was a proposal that I've been working on and put up and, and um, um, to make sure that the $80.3 million uh, is returned back to Transport for New South Wales and that we open round six, which is a commitment that I made that I would be doing, I think, maybe even at my last estimates appearance. But um, as, as the Minister for yeah. Regional Roads, I want to make sure that we've got as much funding available to our regional communities for road repairs uh, in light of what has been a challenging time as well. Oh, I'm full um, credit actually, to you, Minister, getting it so I, I can it's confirm. not often that one gets to bounce the Treasurer just weeks after the budget. Was this new funding? Uh, 19th of August is when um, the ERC decision... Yeah. And was this new funding? No, no, it's, it's, it's funding via the Restart New South Wales Fund. Right, OK. So, so this, this $80.3 million yeah, is, is, uh, is part of the overall is an $543 million dollar fixing country roads program right. uh, that this government committed to. We've already, to date, uh, spent $462.3 and million. Dollars, ask, yeah. And that has committed to 325 Minister, projects, Mr So this, you're, so you're telling us this is an allocation from the Restart New South Wales? Well, Fund. Well, that is allocation. where the funding was returned from. Thank you. Which, which I think was on the record from last estimates, to be frank, so I don't think that's new information. Um, but what is important is uh, the $80.3 million is now being made available as of the 22nd of August for applications. Yeah. Councils are encouraged uh, to, to dust off those applications, make sure they're still a priority, make sure they're still within budget, and if not, adjust it and submit it. Okay. Um, has the government members got any questions? No? Entirely satisfied. Excellent. More than satisfied with this, Minister. More than satisfied. Um, thank you very much, Minister, for your attendance. Thank you. Um, to the extent there were questions taken on notice or supplementary questions, yeah, the yeah. committee's secretariat will be in touch. Um, we uh, say goodbye to you, but we will return at 2 o'clock um, with the rest of you. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.
Okay, excellent. Uh, welcome back to this afternoon's session. Uh, before we commence with questions from the opposition, I'll just invite uh, Miss Tracy Taylor, which is who's joining us via Webex, if she could please state her name, position, title, and swear either an oath or affirmation. On mute. Sorry, Miss Taylor, you might need to put yourself off mute. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Tracy <coughs> Taylor, I am the Chief People Officer and Acting Deputy Secretary of Corporate Services for Transport New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the truth <coughs> now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. I will now hand over to the Chair, or we will hand over to the Opposition. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy Chair. Um, I may um, just begin by asking if you have any updates from the morning session. A number of questions were taken. We're told we'd be getting some material. I just thought I'd check. Any feedback? I'll referee the children. Uh, I'm on kick off and uh, just to state in, in terms of your uh, question about resilience funding this morning, uh, two things. If I could just clarify, we, we have specific resilience funding arrangements that have been in place post bushfire and as the Minister spoke about the $312.5 million that has been allocated to the fund uh, that is occurring now. Uh, but I guess resilience is dealt with across the whole operating budget and as well as in our capital budget. So it really extends to every project that we're actually undertaking across regional New South Wales. Um, should we clarify uh, that your question relates to those two specific buckets related to resilience? Specific buckets. Right. Yep. Thank you. Um, in relation to your query on Cutterji Bridge, we're still waiting on some information. If we can't get it back to you this afternoon, we'll take it on notice. Thank you. Uh, Anthony Hayes, and my uh, response was regarding Weewar Primary School. Um, and forgive me if I read it, because I'm not familiar with this, or not particularly familiar with the subject. Um, Narrabri Shire Council um, didn't support, or does not support, the installation of a pedestrian crossing on the Camilleroy Highway, and the proposed kiss and drop zone in the submission um, was also deemed to be unsafe on the Camilleroy Highway, um, and that was also not supported by Narrabri Shire Council. Um, the original design had a student drop off on the Camilleroy, which was opposed by our, ourselves, Transport for New South Wales, and the Shire Council. Due to the nature of the highway, traffic volumes, heavy vehicle composition, um, Camilleroy is obviously designated as an oversized transport route and a road train route. <coughs> so the original design um, didn't quite, um, didn't satisfy the appropriate needs. Um, in terms of the, the warrant. Um, we are now working with Narrabri Shire Council and the Department of Education for a dedicated kiss and ride uh, and drop off zone to be installed on a local road on George Street um, as an alternative solution. We might come back to that when it's my turn. Right. Okay, no, no others? Okay, I might just begin. Um, one, one issue, and it's a very localised one, but um, it's of interest to me because of my duty electorate, and that's subsidised school transport scheme for flights from Lord Howe Island. Um, students from Lord Howe Island who travel to New South Wales schools have issues getting flights and are often forced to take off extra time from school in order to access flights. So can I ask whoever is responsible, are you aware of issues being experienced by isolated children living on Lord Howe Island under the school student transport scheme? And I can list some of the issues if you wish. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. And we do have a school student transport uh, s uh, scheme in place that has uh, over half a million active uh, active uh, s uh, school travel pass entitlements, and uh, and that also includes uh, special arrangements for s school children in Lord Howe Island. Um, but I'm not aware of any issues uh, of uh, of the scheme that uh, you just mentioned. 
Okay, um, well, that concerns me because I am, and there's a whole number of parents who basically what parents want is to be able to book flights themselves and to be reimbursed by the subsidised school transport scheme or have a dedicated human contact in transport for New South Wales to address their needs. And I mean, I can go through uh, quite a few concerns um, that have been raised, but can I, can I ask you to please take um, the question on notice and just um, come back um, and um, if there are if, if you're aware or not aware of any specific concerns, just from correspondence you've received, because I, I've got a whole lot of um, um, students um, who, uh, and their parents who've raised specific concerns, and um, it, it, it's not a political issue, it's simply just a way of, um, they're saying the booking arrangements are clunky and outdated, and, and they've got some sensible suggestions. So if you could look at those, that, that'd be... I'm very happy to take that on notice. OK, thank, thank you. you. Right, I might, I just want to turn to clarify some of the um, evidence that was given this morning and some of the issues we were asking about. The first of those I might uh, just deal with is the um, uh, flood damage estimates. And I'm asking uh, Mr Fuller because I thought you gave quite clear evidence. I heard a, um, a difference between what you told us and what the minister told us. I don't expect you to comment on that. Uh, I think that wouldn't be fair to you, but I just want to make sure I understood what you told us, what evidence you're giving us today sure. about that. So was that, uh, so $1.5 billion in damage uh, in total, and that's on state roads and regional <coughs> roads. And is that correct? Uh, yes, Mr. Graham, that's correct. So what, what I uh, think we should do is just take on notice the latest available figures that we've provided right. to the state recovery committee because yeah. we, as I said, we have been providing updated data pretty consistently. Mm. So, uh, of course, as we've gone on, mm. uh, as the Minister highlighted, we had an initial assessment that was around that $1.3 million mark. Yeah. Um, we understand now, you know, more fully that basically our latest estimates are about $1.3 billion mm. on the local and regional road network. Correct. And yep. as the Minister talked about, another 150 thereabouts on the state road network. So yes. if you combine the two of those, we're in yeah. that circle one and a half. Um, but as I said, I think it would be good for us just to make sure that we come back because it is something, they were initial estimates, they have yeah. been refined. Yeah, and I think time. you made that so. point in the earlier <laughs> session. I, I, I understood that clearly and I agree with... Uh, um, uh, I heard clearly the comments you put on the record and I, they coincide exactly with what you've just told us. And just to clarify, so I accept that you've taken those on the on notice you'll come back with specific estimates. But just to clarify the numbers you've just given us, I understood they were the um, figures for the three events, um, that is February, March and July. Cumulative total as at July, um, based on all of the natural disaster events all of those. that occurred in the And they're statewide figures, not North Coast figures, yeah, okay. And, and it, I probably <laughs> should say is the, the figure hasn't moved a whole lot since July. There was much less damage in that July period. And also, as we've refined, some of those estimates have come back a little. Um, so, it, you know, as we get more detail, both from our local government partners, uh, it was important, particularly in the early um, response to the flooding events, particularly in the north of the state, that we gave local government the chance to really, you know, send in and for us to uh, collate information mm. on the the extent so that we could really inform the response, mm. um, particularly around what the Minister spoke to this morning in terms of the funding arrangements we advanced mm. and a range of other things that our task force that we set up uh, initiated in the early stages in response. Right, thank you. So I might come to the reclassification issue shortly, but I think I'll hand to my colleague first and then um, <laughs> come back to those if that suits. Yep, thank you. Right. I'd just like to ask briefly some questions about the bus service alteration requests. <coughs> um, can I ask how many requests um, Transport for New South Wales received last financial year for um, a bus service alteration? Uh, we'll actually hand to Barbara Wise uh, take this question. No problem. Um, and are you specifically interested in, thank you, in um, regional New South Wales or I can... I'm happy overall. to be disaggregated for both. That'd be okay. Good. Well, we will need to take that on notice, but happy to provide um, 
provided details okay. around well, that. Let, let's begin then with just regional. Have you got those figures? Not, not on the off the top of my head. But it can get. Um, there is a little bit of backwards and forwards um, when we do get a request because sometimes not <coughs> sufficient information is, and then sometimes it doesn't actually turn into what we would call a bus, a bus service alteration request. It can be an inquiry. So I can provide. I will need to provide on um, notice the details. Okay. So. My request then is in relation to the last financial year, how many requests have been finalised? Yep. Okay. Um, how many requests were received? How many have been finalised? How many are still outstanding and what was the average wait time? For the financial year 21, yep. 22. Yep. Okay, not um, a problem, we'll take that. Now, as. can I ask you then generally, bus companies are reporting that it's taking two years to get routes approved. Can you tell us if that's correct and... and why is it taking so long to assess the applications, if it is? Um, well, I'm not aware, personally, of any that have taken that long. Um, they're occasionally... They do get put up as a request, um, kind of, repeatedly. Um, say, for example, because this, lots of students move schools, particularly at the start of the school year, um, you, we will often get a very similar request resubmitted each year. So it, um, sometimes that occurs, but I'm not aware of. Um, How long would you say it would take on average? On average, I would have to get you some details. <coughs> but it, it, from from the very, f as I said, because it can be there can be some backwards and forwards. Um, it may be that from when the actual final submission to a BSA, it would be a number of weeks um, or months. A number of weeks speaking. or months? Yep. Okay. Um, um, what we've been advised is that many of these requests are for desperately needed additional services in high growth areas. Um, do you... Um, do you think it's acceptable for transport providers to be funding these additional routes because of the delay? <clears throat> I'm... In terms of... Well, certainly in high growth areas, we deal with requests routinely for when there's high growth residential areas going into schools. I'm not aware of operators funding these themselves. <clears throat> we... In the event that that did occur, we would certainly reimburse operators as part of a contract adjustment once it was... Um, okay. Once it was sorted <clears throat> out. There's probably not a lot additional questions I can ask without having the data. So if okay. you could give me the data and we might look at this again at some supplementary hearing, if we can, in relation to this. Um, you got yes, I might go to reclassification, then I'll hand back um, yep. to you. So um, if we can just turn back to that reclassification issue, I just had some more detail. Uh, the first... Uh, look, essentially, the <coughs> main thing I'd like to... Um, understand which I was having a bit of trouble as the numbers were flying around was what has actually happened with the expenditure here. Um, so how much, um, what, what is the cost, I guess, of the priority round? Um, so I can advise in relation to tranche one, which was the 16 classifications yes. that we have progressed. The costs are less than 5000 That relates to TFNSW employees. Less than $5,000. For yeah. tranche one, yes. OK. So, and that's... And, and would it be fair to say that's how much has been spent prior to June 22? No, that's in relation to tranche one. There have been other activities in relation to other stages where we've started yeah. to work on inspections, etc. So I'll have to take on notice um, to get back to you with those figures. Yeah, so, so well, let me ask the question again more broadly. How much has been spent on reclassifications to June 22? I will have to program. take... If we can get that information before the end of the session, we'll provide that, otherwise I'll take it on notice. Right, OK, that would be very welcome, but this is, this is just the standard budget reporting that um, uh, we would expect. How much has been allocated for this financial year for this program? Mm. Thank you.
I don't have the breakdown from specifically within the budget, um, but the budget paper identifies mm -hmm. 193 mil in capex over the two years. All right, but there must, I mean, this is a signature commi commitment from the government. There must be a al budget allocation for this financial year. I'm happy, I don't mind, um, if you want to take a little yeah, bit of time we'll, to we'll find get that it, confirmed. but I would expect to be able to ask how much has been. So I might just explain what I would like to know, and then I'm happy if you want to take a little bit of yep. time. I just want to have a clear understanding of to June, just the standard budget reporting, how much have we spent to June 22? How much has been allocated this financial year? And how much has been allocated over mm -hmm. the forwards? Expecting that, given what is printed in the budget, <coughs> I would have thought that's only next financial year, but I, I may have mis misunderstood that, but I would have thought it's spent to date, allocated this year, allocated next year. But I just want to have an understanding of what are those figures. We'll come back and confirm that. Right. Thank you for that. Um, and just uh, the only other thing I think that would be useful to <coughs> clarify, oh, th there are a couple of things. So I do just want to come back on that question. So we know there's 500 applications. We know there's 78 councils have made them, but we just don't know how many kilometres have been asked of road. That, I was surprised by that answer. Uh, it is an independent panel. and We don't have visibility of that detail. Okay. Um, how, uh, what are the terms of the members of the independent panel's appointment? That is, for how long are they appointed? I can get you the details. It is published, um, and I'll confirm, but I understand it's through to the end of this year, but we'll confirm the actual date. Through to the end of 2022, yeah. Uh, Mr Graham, just to clarify, there was a recent extension granted uh, to panel members to, uh, by three months just to uh, basically to pick up and to take into account that uh, many of the councils had asked for an extended period yeah. of time to put the yeah. submission forward Understood. because of what was happening in the, um, obviously in the environment around them. So, yeah. no, um, understood. so there was a, a three month extension granted. Yeah, okay. But they, uh, and then the expectation is they'll have delivered their final report by the end of the year, they'll finish their role. That's the expectation. That's what the current uh, terms of reference indicate, yes. Yes. Mm. And so it could obviously could change. I mean, I think that's, there's, there's nothing to stop the government changing that. <coughs> and that, uh, to, does that mean that question that uh, we were starting to get to, but there was a lot going on, um, is this, they'll make their report, this is the final round, isn't it, for councils wondering, and this is a question which has come up on the ground, is this my chance? If I've missed this, have I missed my chance? The answer really is yes. I, I will defer to Miss Hayden because I think there's Very good. still some opportunities and discussions that are being undertaken with local government. Yeah. I'd probably distinguish the difference between the classification process and the regional road transfer, okay. which are two separate things. Yep. Uh, so the regional road transfer is a policy that the government hand out there and essentially this is part of that last full round. Um, I suppose it's a conversation and discussion for government beyond that. The reclassification process is actually an ongoing BAU, yes. essentially yeah. clean up. So yeah. councils can <coughs> still submit um, for you know reclassifications. Yeah. Uh, but, but when it comes to the 15 thousand kilometres that might be transferred, that should be transferred, that will be transferred, um, that opportunity is now closed. Is that a fair statement? As part of this process, the full round was yes to yeah. identify any proposals from councils for transfers as yeah. part of this full round. Yeah. And then they'll do, the independent panel does its report, then they're thanked, wished well on their way, and, that's, um, and then it's over to government, the minister and those processes. Thank you. Um, can I ask about one of those issues, which was um, reports from Albury saying they had been discouraged from applying as they were a um, regional city rather than a regional area. That was the message they got. I mean, possibly unfairly, but that was what, what, that was what they felt they had um, mm -hmm. uh, been told. Um, are you aware of those concerns? Have those concerns been reflected elsewhere? Um, I'm not aware of those concerns. If there are concerns, I expect that they were raised with the panel directly, who are managing the process. But uh, that council is eligible um, and would be, you know, invited as were other regional councils for the transfer <coughs> and all councils for the reclass process. And sometimes when it comes to transport projects for border communities, they are treated differently in the way we assess projects, particularly the benefit, where the benefit flows. Does it flow in New South Wales or Victoria? Is there any difference in the way that regional, that border 
councils, border communities or border mm -hmm. um, projects are treated under this program? Uh, not as far as I'm aware and definitely not within the guidelines, um, but the actual process for the assessment is with the panel. Mm. Yes, yeah, so they may introduce something in their final report, but there's nothing that you're aware of. No. Okay, and um, oh, I think that is, yeah, so if we can come back with those financial figures, yep. that will be very helpful. All right, thank you. Can I just ask some briefly um, some questions about fixing country rail? Um, the um, I note that um, having a, had a brief look at lunchtime on the website, um, I couldn't see any details of the 18 successful projects that were funded under the $17 million allocation for 2020 that was announced in February 2021. Um, um, is there a reason that they're not there? Or have I just missed them? I, I think it's fair to say that the website probably requires an update, but uh, I'll hand to Miss Hayden because I know she's well across the detail of the uh, number of projects, in, including the 26 that, that have been completed. Um, yeah, look, the uh, apologies, the website is um, requires an update. We can provide the information around that round to you. If not today, we'll take it as a question or notice. Uh, my time's up, but I'll, I'll come back to that after. Yeah. I might just invite Mr Hayes back. I've just got a few follow-up questions on uh, the Wee Wall uh, school project. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so my understanding, um, I, I note that you mentioned that you're working on a new proposal, which is a kiss and drop on George Street. Is that the same proposal that was originally put forward um, on the planning portal, which included compulsory acquiring two residents to make make room for this kiss and drop facility. Uh, I would need to take that away. I'm I'm sorry. I don't I don't have that level of detail. No, so I don't know. Okay. Perhaps on notice. Would you be able to? Um, obviously, this will probably be on notice as well. Um, did Transport for New South Wales support that original proposal? Um, to acquire those residents and put the kiss and drop on George Street. Um, take that on notice. Yeah, if it didn't, why? Um, and any any level of detail as to why that proposal was withdrawn, or you know, the community are concerned because they they saw that as the best option uh, as well. Um, I think probably. Oh, just, I guess, has Transport for New South Wales seen uh, TT, TTW, I'm assuming who is the contractor for these projects, their response to your concerns? Have you seen that? I might pass that up to Mr Hayes. Because um, obviously part of Transport for New South Wales concerns was that it, the design wasn't really future focused in terms of the growth the growth needs of the school, um, and the contractor's response was, "Well, we can state the we can state the bell times um, in terms of students exiting the venue." Does Transport for New South Wales see that as a viable option? Well, I'm not I'm not terribly familiar with the with the proposal, the initial proposal. Mm. So, if I can take that away, we can, yeah. can certainly look into that. But um, yeah, initial response would be that you know, we would always be looking for a, a, a safe mm. place where kids can cross the road and that you know, wouldn't be dependent yeah, upon yes. a bell. <laughs> yeah, staggering, staggering bell times doesn't navigate you know, bus, buses and you know, the need for parents to pick up two kids across multiple year groups. So you know, that's, that, that response is probably a bit nonsensical. We were, we were certainly um, fairly negative about the proposal to, to park on the other side of the highway though and that yeah, um, that scored very lowly when our safety assessment was undertaken. Yeah. Um, okay. So you you renegotiating a new design is that that's obviously pushing back the approval on, on the planning portal or yeah I don't have a time I'm sorry at the moment yeah it doesn't doesn't provide that information at the moment other than that we're we're in discussions right now with the council and the department of education. So thank you. I might uh, just quickly turn to, where are we? Um, sorry, 
I just rubbing up the... Oh, um, while I'm bringing that up, uh, the Wool Track Road, which is the road between um, Cobar and uh, Ivanhoe, about Ronald, is there any mm. uh, indication as to whether funding will be granted to have that sealed all the way through, given it's, a, it's an important freight route and becomes impassable uh, in, and in bad weather? I think Mr Benaziak, we would have to take that one on notice for you and just uh, check whether or not there's been any submissions made and uh, how we've responded to those. Yep, sure. Um, OK, thank you. I've just mm. brought up the question I need. Um, there's been con concerns mm. from uh, residents in Menindee, uh, both to my office and to my colleague Roy Butler's office, about the quality of repairs done uh, to... or well, quality of work done on, on the ceiling of Pincari Road. Um, basically showing that after 12 months of, after the work's been done, um, they're already in a need of, you know, drastic repair. As, as the Minister tasks the department with looking into the shoddy workmanship and what can be done? I might um, just see if Mr Hayes has got any information on Punkeri Road, but uh, can I just say more broadly, um, uh, without reflecting on workmanship, uh, we've had a number of challenges on works that have been recently completed uh, under various programs across the state because of obviously what's been going on in the environment with weather. So there has been um, some projects that have needed revisiting in terms of their uh, their pavement, the ceiling, um, because of the unprecedented wet. So, um, Mr. Hayes, do you have anything specific on Pukeri Road? Right? No. You've, have you, you've had no representations from the Minister to, to uh, look into it? I ask because my, my colleague has, on numerous occasions, requested the Minister to look into it and has received no response. So I'm wondering where the breakdown is occurring. We'll, in we'll terms certainly of check with our Western region, and, uh, and and I'm sure they'll be able to provide us with a quick response. We can uh, perhaps get back to you through the course of the day. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think that pretty much covers me. So I'll throw it back to Mr. Primrose. Mm. Uh, thank you. I just like to continue, if I can, in relation to fixing country rail. Um, thank you very much for. Yeah, um, taking on notice, um, providing details of the successful projects. Um, can you tell me, why didn't the program run again in 2021? Happy to. Would you like some information on the 26 successful projects now? Because we do have oh, those yeah, on hand. Yeah, you, um, so I'm we could... We could happy yeah. if you'd like to yeah, yeah. So, so, table um, them. We can certainly uh, uh, potentially table sorry. the list. Yeah, if you could just table so the that list, that'd, can, be, that'd be useful and we could go through them. Um, so the, the basically, I mean, if I... Um, I'll get this just um, maybe emailed across the, with the list that we have of the 26 projects. But uh, there's a number of projects. They range in uh, order of about $60 million in magnitude down to about $60,000. Uh, they include the 174 kilometres between Juni and Griffith, the main line, uh, allowing a 25... Sorry, 25 tonne axle load uh, carrying capacity on that rail line. They include uh, the important link for the new Wagga uh, intermodal and um, special active basin precinct in the Riverina. Uh, they include, uh, sorry, the upgrade of the rail corridor and Berry to Bomadary, 13 kilometre corridor and the apex tunnels to a class one track. Uh, we've got, a, as I say, there's 26 projects here uh, of varying size and scale, uh, all uh, meeting the objectives of the, of the program and have been uh, completed uh, in, in the recent past. Okay, and they were included in the $17 million allocation for 2020? No, so um, what we'll do, and there is information available on the previous rounds um, on the website. If not, we can make sure that you've got the full information. This isn't an annual program. Um, it is actually a program that is um, essentially through uh, Transport for New South Wales delivery, looking at the New South Wales regional lines. Um, a lot of what you'll see around previous projects have actually been around development and business cases. So last year, we were actually doing development and business case activities, which is 
uh, informed, um, you know, essentially future rounds. And if you look, and we can demonstrate in the previous rounds, a lot of the development activities resulted in announcements or, sorry, resulted in delivery of projects in the future rounds or further rounds after that. So essentially a lot of the earlier rounds were development and design. Um, we concentrate on that and then we progress and request delivery funding. Thank you. So what, what's been the actual expenditure since the 2020 round? Sorry, just one second. So under the full program, we have We've got uh, committed for this year 42.5 million. I'll have to go back and just double check the, the full commitment um, of, of what was spent in the previous years. But uh, overall, we've got 42.5 million this financial year, 58.2 the next year as well. Um, and then all funds prior to that. And if you give me one moment as I go through my notes. one moment, I'll just come back and confirm um, the commitments okay. that have made. If, if, if it's easier, a lot of my questions, um, the next few, relate to expenditure and it probably would be of assistance and you may wish to take it on notice too. What I'm interested in is, you know, for each financial year, what's been the allocation and how much has been expended um, since the program began, basically. Uh. And my understanding is that um, there's been about 400 million allocated. There's been 400 million for the whole program. Yep. Um, we have not allocated 400 million. We've allocated 229 million, and we can provide you with the breakdown of each of the rounds um, and the expenditure. That, that, that would be useful. Please, I don't yeah, expect we, you to yeah. have that at hand. Okay. Uh, we'll take that on notice, but Thank yeah, you we very can break much. down each round and expenditure. Thank you. Um, can I ask? And I'm asking all of these questions through the, the secretary, and please put them to whoever you think is appropriate. Um, the, um, in uh, Infrastructure magazine, the minister recently announced that Riverina Rail was going to be delivering a series of projects totalling over $70 million in funding. So how much of this was new funding and how much of it was projects that had been announced in previous rounds? Yeah, we'd have to take that on notice. Oh, very happy to. Um, again, I've got... In the land on the 19th of August, it was reported that um, Mr Murray Henderson from Wilga Park in Tullabagil said the Lake Cargelico to Angari line, which is more than 100 years old and in need of an upgrade, fits right under the fixing country rail umbrella but can't get a look in. Um, can you comment on why that might be the case? Uh, look, the uh, program does have an assessment criteria and uh, that includes uh, productivity and safety benefits. It also looks at growth and the economic benefits that flow. So it would have to meet those hurdles. Uh, and uh, from my perspective, it would appear it hasn't. But uh, have you got a comment? Uh, no, um, uh, we can come back in any detail around Cardelico, but uh, I'll say from from an assessment perspective, it's probably not meeting the requirements of the, the freight benefit. This is also under restart funding, so it doesn't meet, need to meet a BCR of above one. Um, so that may also be why yeah. it's not. Could you the... come back, because that would be help us assess you know, those, those criteria. Um, another one um, you may wish to take on notice too. Given the significant flood damage on the Tullamore Road between Lake Cargillico and Dubbo, which is still being used for freight, um, um, can you explain whether a connection from Lake Cargillico to West Wyalong um, might be included and might be of interest? Uh, we'll have to look and assess that. Um, I can't answer that right now. Um, I've got questions here from regional primary producers who are trying to get regional freight infrastructure updated, but they can't... Um, see what happened since 2019. Um, essentially, the, the, the concerns that people have are that they don't understand that because there's insufficient transparency. Now, in part, that may be related to the fact that there are no 
as you indicated, the actual website hasn't been updated. Um, so um, I might leave, rather than go through each of those, I mean, you've already undertaken to, to update the, the website, so I'll... And, and Mr Primrose, I'll be very happy if you've got um, contacts there and uh, yep. our primary producers, we'd be very happy to get in contact with them, understand what their issues are, consult with them further okay. and see if we can assist. Appreciate that. My final question then, and thank you for that, under this <coughs> heading is, is any of the money under this um, program going towards level crossing safety to do with inland roads? No, this is a, a separate funding and program. Thank you. Great. Um, I might uh, turn back to ask Ms Hayden if you, I was just going to ask about those, um, any update on those financial figures? Uh, no, I don't have those. Okay. I think if we could take it on notice and we can give you the detail. Yeah, well, if you, if you can keep um, uh, trying over the session, that'd be welcome. Um, I might turn then um, to... Uh, the issue, just an issue about the road maintenance backlog or the transport backlog in uh, regional New South Wales. Um, so, Mr Sharp, I might just ask you to direct uh, directly where appropriate. Yes, I'll just uh, pass to uh, Mr Fuller to comment. Yeah, great. Sure. So, I, I, the NRMA, before the last election, put out a report dealing with the local roads backlog. It was the funding local roads report addressing the infrastructure backlog in New South Wales regional and local roads. It was published in January 2019. It identified a $2.2 billion funding backlog in 2016-17. They said, this is, these are their figures, not um, my figures, that was an increase of almost 30% from 2014-15. Uh, and I believe they also said regional councils were uh, responsible for 1.7 billion of that. I'm interested really in how that compares to the assets and services plans uh, and the agency's assessment mm -hmm. of what the backlog is uh, now. I might just first ask you to give us any information you regard as uh, useful. Sure. No, thank you, Mr Graham. I think uh, from memory in the NRMA's assessment, that dealt with uh, roads in totality. So mm. I'm, I'm Correct. pretty confident it picked up local roads and regional roads. Correct. Yep. Uh, obviously, our asset services plan uh, picks up the state road network. Correct. Yep. Uh, and within that plan at the moment, where and we, what that highlights is an asset uh, maintenance backlog of about 5% of the asset value. Mm -hmm. That's been fairly consistent uh, with really the, the greatest uh, influencing factor in the recent time, the, mm. uh, the events that have taken place yeah. uh, in the last couple of years. As you will appreciate, it's uh, been a challenging couple of years for anybody dealing in, uh, in the regions, but specifically mm. for our teams and yeah. no, our absolutely. partners that are yeah. uh, managing the, the regional network. We, um, we, we have taken steps, though, obviously, to ensure that uh, we, can, we can address that and, and, and start to bring that down. Mm. Um, one of the things that that we've done just recently is, uh, you know, reallocate and prioritise funding to our road maintenance budget mm. uh, in this next 12 months of an additional $90 million, which will help us deal with things like pavement condition, vegetation management, some of the obvious things that have come mm. up after the events of the recent months. So, um, so it's an additional $90 million in the 22-23 financial year compared to the 20. 122 specific to that category that we've yeah, reprioritised within the division budget. So um, obviously identifying that uh, you know our road network has had uh, has been under duress. I think is probably yeah. fair to say. Yep. Um, our teams, uh, I should say at this point, and just acknowledge they've done an amazing job of just keeping the network um, available to people mm. Uh, mm. And as it stands right now. And I think we, we can join you in making that acknowledgement. I think that's welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they'd appreciate that. It's um, as it stands right now. There's uh, one state <coughs> road that. Uh, remains closed and that's the section of the Janolan Caves Road that is five mile yep. um, and will remain closed for some time given the complexity of the work that's required there yeah. uh, and uh, our teams have done an amazing job of getting connections back for communities. Glad to you mentioned it, I was going to ask about it later. So, you, uh, yeah. so to, just, just uh, I, I guess to clarify because I thought you might ask about mm -hmm. that one uh, Two Mile has been uh, reopened it right. does have some traffic control yep. uh, so there is a single lane access down there given mm -hmm. the recent um, slips that we have had on yep. Janolan Caves Road mm -hmm. that we've been working very closely with mm -hmm. the Caves House and the management mm -hmm. of the Caves um, um, and, uh, and the team's been able to reinstate yeah. that 
you know, I, I think pretty quickly. Um, so they've done an amazing job there. Um, we do have some other roads that are under controlled access. Um, uh, some of the, the challenges that we've had through the state, particularly in relation to some of those east-west corridors, we've been working very closely with communities to maintain those connections uh, and to give them access. Um, so as, as of today, how many roads are under controlled access? Oh, I'd have to get back with that exact figure, but to give you a couple of uh, live examples, mm -hmm. you know, we have single lane access on some of those corridors like Camberwarra Mountain, um, mm -hmm. Moss Vale into Kangaroo Valley, yep. uh, Waterfall Way on the north yep. coast. Yep. Uh, there's, there's a number of sections where we still have yep. controlled access just to ensure that those corridors are kept safe. Yes, yeah. So um, acknowledging that, acknowledging the $90 million uh, that's been allocated now an increase over the last financial year, um, the Regional and Outer Metropolitan Division Assets and Services Plan uh, 20. 21, 22 to 2030, 30, 31 had the overall 10 year funding shortfall, I think from these would have been June 2019 figures at 805 million. That was pavement repair, bridges, roadside assets, traffic facilities. As you observe, state roads, not local roads. Um, what is the updated figure? Uh, that is compar comparable now. Uh, are you talking in terms of maintenance backlog for you? Or I'm talking uh, here about the overall, what was identified on in the earlier version of the assets and asset and services plan at that point. Um, I, th I understand for a 30 June 2019 figure of mm -hmm. 805 million. Uh, what is that figure now? Uh, look, I don't want to misquote a figure, so perhaps we'll sure. take that on notice and just uh, come back as to uh, as to how that's moved. Yeah, and I might indicate it's on page 69 of that report, if that's helpful. Um, so really, I just want to, we should have a more up-to-date figure, acknowledging all the pressures. Um, and this is, I take your point that we're asking now about a subset of state roads. Really, the questions we're asking the minister were about road damage across the state, the most important question because it doesn't matter whether councils are in control or the state is it's actually you know there's the fixing those things is the real challenge for the state this is a subset but we just want an updated figure for that 10-year yeah. uh, funding shortfall perhaps if i can add um and miss hayden could jump in here as well um our overall programs in terms of to how they support local government to your point mr graham in terms of the statewide network um local regional roads uh have expanded enormously in the last couple of years so if i go back to 2019 our overall investment in the local road regional road network in conjunction with council through those programs mm. and they include things like fixing local roads fixing country roads uh, natural disaster funding mm. a range of initiatives mm. was about 400 million mm -hmm. uh, that has more than doubled in the last couple of years and we're on track to have that uh, getting close to about 1.2 billion this year yeah. so we've certainly increased uh, our ca capability and our capacity to deliver in partnership with local government to support that response that's required to the statewide mm -hmm. network mm -hmm. thank you and I want to ask about one final figure before I hand to my colleague that's the um, from that same assets and services plans this is 21 22 to 20 to 203031 it identified on the page before that page 68 the maintenance backlog overall had jumped to 2.955 billion dollars by 30 June 2019 um, I'm really I so I mean that's a matter of fact I'd like an update on that figure firstly which I presume you'd you can either give us or As I say, that's about 4.9 per cent of the asset base uh, yeah. as it stands at the moment. And what is that in actual terms? I'll get that actual figure for you. On the, yeah, so you get that shortly? Yes. Great, thank you. And I just want to be clear on the... I'm clear on what you've put to me to date, but I just want to understand what's the difference between that figure and the NRMA figure. The NRMA figure only applies to roads. This is transport generally in regional transport generally, as I understand it. This is the state road network, our uh, figure. Sorry, I do have that figure. It is, it's 3.778 billion. 3.77. So 4.9% of the asset base. And at what date? As at today or as at 30 June? Uh, or? That, oh, look, I have to check the exact date for you, but that uh, is what I understand is in the uh, in the current plan. Yeah. Um, so, 
Yes, okay, so it's the most recent figure, it's fair to say. Um, but if you could get me the date, that'd be welcome. But up $700 million, up more than $700 million, nearly closer to $800 million from 2019. Correct, and uh, I'd also point out that that same plan does show a 24% reduction in that number over the life of the plan, so we are looking at yeah, clawing so that. so you're back. looking to drop it down. Yeah, by $929 million is the, uh, is right. the, the goal or the forecast in that. At the end plan. of the 10 years. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Mr Sharp, that's a confronting uh, view you're putting to us because what you're saying is uh, it'll take us 10 years to um, pay down virtually the... Uh, leap in the maintenance backlog just from the last two years is, is really what you're, if we're up 800 million and dropping it by 929, that's really the to, to the bring story it back to telling. that standard, yes, and, yeah. uh, and that, that does reflect the two years of, uh, of heavy impact sure. uh, from the, uh, uh, the weather patterns. Mm. Uh, in addition, though, what I would flag is the, um, the overall percentage increase in assets uh, has been substantial because mm. we've been investing heavily in infrastructure. Mm. So when you look at the mix of new versus old, mm. there's a bigger percentage of newer assets. Mm. Uh, so that, that's a backdrop or a context mm. to the number. Yep. There's also um, a pull forwards in the next year or two around uh, expenditure. So I think there's $100 million that's being pulled forward mm. uh, to uh, effectively accelerate some of those works as well. Yep. And, and I do uh, like to emphasise this. The safety's not uh, impacted here. Mm. All, all the critical safety-related items are invested in, uh, and we do have target road uh, conditions that we would like to uh, achieve, and that's what that work plan is geared towards. Well, that wasn't the conclusion that the um, uh, Assets and Services Plan reached in for the earlier report. This is 21-22 for the decade. It said this... Um, without with the funding shortfall put at risk, the, uh, and then I'm now quoting, the 2056 target of zero fatalities and serious trauma at risk of not being met without significant infrastructure investment to reduce the safety risk. So there is yep. safety at risk here. You're making the point that, well, mm -hmm. we are investing. Uh, they're, they're referencing specifically uh, investments in safety-related infrastructure. We have a mm. 2026 uh, safety plan, and that plan does have uh, quite substantial uh, investments in new infrastructure. Mm. If you want to talk specifically to that program, uh, we do have um, Ms McCarthy who can talk to it, mm. uh, but we've got substantial uh, investments specifically in those safety-related items, which is geared towards our net zero strategy. Mm. Mm. Yep. I, so I just want to come back to the question I was starting, uh, started out with Mr Fuller uh, because I, it may become important down the track. So I presume the NRMA is going to put out another report. Um, I just want to understand the difference between what's included in the assets and services plan calculations and what the NRMA is talking about. I think the difference, Mr Fuller, is the NRMA is talking about state and local roads, roads only. This figure that's in the plan, the bigger figure, the... 2.9 billion now up to 3.8 billion is actually state roads and other transport assets in the region. Is that correct? Uh, that would be my understanding, but we'll take the question away and we'll do an analysis of what's in the NRMA report and just make sure yeah, that yeah. that's no, um, lined it up against it. Yeah, but I think that'd be helpful, presuming they're, they're going to then put out another set of figures. Yeah, yeah um, but, uh, but as you've outlined it, that is, that is my understanding also. Thank you. Thank you. I've just got one line of question and then I'll throw it back to the opposition. And hopefully it's to close the loop on my earlier questions around the intermodal. Now, notwithstanding the Minister's comments about how most of this is to do with the Council, and notwithstanding your comments that you you didn't fund the project but you administered it, you, you essentially built it, I'm grappling with the concept that any agency who has been fiscally responsible would spend $35 million on enabling works for a project when that project doesn't have a business case, has questionable uh, financial benefits. Um, I still don't believe we have a public-facing business case for, for that. Is this common practice for your agency, Mr Sharp, mm -hmm. where you would spend <coughs> or budget for significant amount of money for to enable a project that hasn't been properly assessed. 
in terms of its benefits costs? Uh, well, the short answer is no. Uh, but uh, in this case, the uh, business case uh, I'm presuming is sitting with uh, another agency. We would provide the input and the costs into that, and there would be a BCR and uh, obviously criteria in there for the, that sum of money to be approved. Uh, we took on notice to go back mm. and uh, obtain that information. Uh, I don't. I'm, I don't have it. I'm not privy to it. Uh, but anything of this size, I can assure the committee that uh, we do actually uh, go through a formal approval process. There has to be benefits in there. And we also uh, revert, if it's our business case, on benefit realisation subsequently to see where we landed. Did we exceed it? Did, if we didn't, are there things we can do to, uh, to close the gap? Mm -hmm. So that process is part of what we do for all our projects. For, for large projects in particular, uh, that's formalised through the Infrastructure New South Wales uh, gate review process, inc including the, the benefit realisation at the end. But in this particular case, I'm suspecting we provided input. We are asked to actually build the rail, but there's probably a separate business case and we'll come back to you. Yeah, thank you. I can, I can actually add, Mr Benazia, we did, we did seek from the team during the break. Uh, the business case was prepared by Tamworth City Council and submitted yeah, to regional... It's, it still hasn't surfaced publicly, and, so... Uh, okay, well, so what we understand is that it was um, prepared by Tamworth City Council and submitted to regional New South Wales, who had provided the funds. Yeah. Um, as I said earlier, we, we were um, tasked with undertaking the rail improvements with our contracted partner on the Country Rail Network, and those, uh, those rail improvements have now been completed. Thank you. Uh, back to the opposition. Thank you. Can I ask, is it in relation to inland rail grade separations, is, is the plan still to have no um, new level crossings on the inland rail throughout New South Wales? Uh, thank you for your question, Mr Primrose. Um, essentially, our position has always been uh, to avoid uh, increasing the number of level crossings on the inland rail corridor, yes. Uh, whether that is um, what eventuates, uh, that's obviously still the decision to be taken by the inland rail uh, through ARTC and, and the federal government project. Um, we continue to advise and support inland rail with recommendations and reviews, particularly in relation to safety. Uh, as I talked about this morning when we were, um, uh, where well, the question came up about uh, Wagga and the uh, Albury to Illabo section, uh, we are often there as, I guess, a an advisor and, a, and uh, supporting community uh, at some of the community events. We uh, often make submissions uh, on the EISs that occur from the inland rail, uh, which talk to uh, our thoughts about relevant safety matters. Uh, and we use the uh, nationally recognised process to review uh, the safety of those um, proposed level crossings and uh, that helps inform those that are being prioritised for the grade separation. Um Am I correct in saying there are 22 crossings? 26. On the uh, on the state road network, there's 26. sorry, there's there's 26, and we prioritise at the moment. There's funding to prioritise four of those. Okay. Um, so, um, see, my my understanding, and you've already alluded to one council, is that. Um, several councils have interpreted earlier discussions um, and announcements that they, in relation to inland rail, that um, that basically they were going to res there was going to be some sort of funding um, to eliminate those. Um, but um, they're concerned now that they're not high on a priority list. Um, so there seems to be a bit of confusion, and you've already alluded to that. Um, it. It would probably be um, of interest to us if we could just get a list of those 26 which are currently proposed and to, to, be, um, to be funded and some idea of when or if and how um, the remainder may be eliminated. So we can at least zero in on which ones people are concerned about and which ones they shouldn't be. Sure. No, we'd be happy to do that. The, the, just to be clear, the 26 aren't currently funded. Yep. Uh, there's certainly four priority crossings that are funded. So we're talking um, 30? So, sorry. 26 plus four. 
less for. Uh, less for. So, so less there's, there's so 20, 22, 22 that are not funded. So my apologies. Yes, I should have clarified that. But of the 26, four have been prioritised for, for funding. Uh, but we'd be happy to take that away and uh, provide some more information about the list that current, currently stands. It would be valuable too, as I said, as part of that list to get some idea of a priority ordering. Um, if and, and I accept there would be ongoing discussions, but there is confusion. Uh, there are. Uh, th those 22 are in early planning phases at the moment, so we wouldn't have a prioritisation until the planning's completed and we can understand uh, the risk profiles associated with them. Uh, there would then be uh, communication and discussions with, uh, obviously, the federal government around uh, what funding uh, might be allocated. Uh, typically, that's when that prioritisation of funding would take place. Okay, I totally understand. I mean, maybe then, if um, if you could give us some comments about what factors will be taken into account when you're um, assessing that, uh, those for which what the priority would be. Okay, it just helped to understand what we're doing. Do you um, I might I might just. Um, um, come back on that set of questions we're asking there. I might check firstly, Mr Fuller, do we know um, yet which year that 3.778 or what date that $3.778 billion figure is from? Uh, it's from the current plan, which is the 2022-23 to 2031-32 um, asset and services plan as we've uh, submitted to Treasury. And does that make it June 21 then? Cynthia, could I just ask, do you have an actual date or is that just, mm. it's, our, it's our current plan, I'm just mm. clarifying whether They're often sort of backcast a little bit, so well, I'm asking about 21-22, you're giving me now 22-23, so it might even just be, might even be June 20. Could so that be right? fa it's effective as of, so we developed the plan in the prior financial year. Um, so while we developed it in 2021, um, mm -hmm. it is live and effective as of 22-23. Yes, so when did, when was the backlog? 3.778 million, at what point in time? I'll have to confirm, but it was earlier this calendar year that we finalised the plan. It's not my question. The question is, when was the backlog? Which will be when that backlog date was effective. Because right. that would be the live information when we finalised okay. the plan. All right, fantastic. So that would be really helpful, that, that date. And then um, I do just want to ask Mr Fuller, the, I mean, in talking about the difference between those figures, so one much smaller dealing with state roads, one much bigger dealing with the general regional backlog, what are the biggest assets that would be in that general regional Backlog. Just give us an idea of what. I mean, one one figure is a lot bigger than the other. Sorry, the the NRMA's figure. You mean? No, I'm this asking about the I'm asking about the um, assets and services plan for your division. Oh well, our assets uh, incorporate obviously road and rail infrastructure. Mm. Uh, they incorporate fleet. They incorporate a range of things. Mm. So, what would be the biggest contributor to that much bigger figure when you look right across your asset base to the maintenance backlog across your? I can come back to you with the exact detail. Yeah, if on it's that. not presuming it's not the roads. Um, yeah, thank you. It would it would largely be the the, the network infrastructure, I suspect, in yes. terms of road and rail. So, yeah, but okay. um, we can yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Can I just mention? Um, just going back to grade separations, I note that in estimates last year, then Minister Toole um, said that there'd be funding for five, not four. Is that, mm. is that correct or...? Yeah. Uh, I wonder, have to go back and check the records as to what uh, the then Minister, Mr Toole, said at that point. But uh, at the moment, what we've confirmed definitely is that there are there are four funded, whether something's changed in terms of uh, further assessment and development of those projects that's helped firm up those project costs. Uh, uh, if I may, that's exactly what's happened. The Minister did say five last year, and that was based on initial costs. We've now done much more detailed costings, um, and we believe the, the funding would cover four. Thank you. Um, okay, um, school drive subsidy allocation. We'll jump around a bit. Um, in answer to a question on notice from the shadow minister, um, 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 the current minister indicated that just under $9.9 .9 million, or about half, 
of the school drive subsidy allocation of $18 million per annum have been spent for the 2021-22 financial year. Can you tell us why only half has been spent? Uh, yes. Uh, so could you just uh, repeat the, the years again? For the yes. Um, it's... Um, I'm just looking at the Minister's answer. Um, uh, point 12 of his answer, 2021-22 financial year, as at 17th of June, um, $9.891 million had been spent on the subsidy out of the $18 million. Yeah, the, numbers, the, the budget mon uh, numbers that I have here for 2021 22 uh, was uh, $30.6 uh, mil uh, million. Dollars. And I don't actually have the actual expenditure here at the moment. And uh, the other thing, um, uh, you said over the last few years, of course, COVID has significantly impacted patronage as well. So I have to take on notice what the exact expenditure was, but for the different years. Okay. Um, what I'm interested in is, as I said, I'm just quoting from you know, the minister's figures, which um, I'm presumably that I worked out by you guys and then the Minister's office signed off on them. Um, um, $9.891, um, $520,028 um, as of the 17th of June out of a total subsidy program of $18 million. So The school student transport scheme? Yeah, school drive subsidy. It's a drive subsidy. There's actually uh, there are two, two schemes. Uh, there's the school subsidy and then there's also the, the drive subsidy scheme as well. Yep, um, but the budget for the school drive subsidy is $18 million per annum, according to the Minister. I would have to uh, uh, confirm that, but uh, you're right, there's, there's two types of scheme. One is the school transport scheme, and then there's also the school and the drive subsidy. the preschool drive subsidy, yeah. That, uh, I'm just quoting from the, the question um, that the um, Shadow Minister asked was about the school drive subsidy. They did talk about both projects, but the specific response was in relation correctly to the question asked by the Shadow Minister, which was in relation to the school drive subsidies. I'm very happy to take that, that, on, on, uh, that on, uh, detail on notice, how those two uh, subsidy schemes are split up and yep. uh, what the budget's first expenditure has been. Okay, so the question then is, um, why was only half the program only spent? Um, the Minister's indicated that the total program was $18 million and there's only $9.8 million. I'll also take that uh, um, notice, okay. but I also noticed that uh, during the last few years... And the COVID question then is, yep. what's happened to the rest of the funding um, and is there any scope for any excess in the program to be used to enhance school bus services? So if that could be taken on notice yep. as well. happy to take that on notice. Um, Thank you. I might... Uh, I might just um, uh, back to us. Do we have any of those financials for the um, uh, classification at the moment? No, apologies, we don't have that available yet. Okay. Um, Mr Sharp, I do want to, if we can keep trying on that, though, that would be helpful. Um, I do want to come back on that headline question to you. I think it's a, appropriate to ask you this as a secretary. The, and it's just on that question I put to the minister, and he was very uncomfortable answering. He, uh, and I don't expect you to comment on this. He gave the answer he did just about the number of roads that have been transferred um, to date under this... Um, what I put to him was a signature commitment by his government. Now, he can give whatever answer he gives. I'm not asking you to comment on that, but I do think it's fair to ask you as the Secretary of the Agency. Um, I thought it was clear that <coughs> as of today, no roads have been transferred. I understand some have been um, dealt with in the other part of the program, but no roads have yet. That is, some have been reclassified in that tranche one of the priority round, but it's correct, isn't it, that um, no roads have yet been transferred? Uh, as you rightly point out, it's a program. So the program <laughs> has a, a large number of activities, including various tranches, a panel that's reviewing. Mm. It's in respect to an actual physical transfer, uh, I'd have to take that on notice. I, I don't know uh, if you could comment. Um, I can comment that of the regional road transfers that were recommended, we haven't 
we we're in the process of actually arranging transfers. We're expecting some this financial year. The key thing is that we're working with councils to make sure that the timing allows them to complete works that are currently underway, any sort of contracts they have in place. So it's a very collaborative process with the councils to make sure that the timing for the transfer aligns with their needs. So in progress sounds the status. Yeah. No, I know, and I agree. Like, I think oh, that is a common sense description of where we're up to. <coughs> I'm making the simple additional observation that these are in progress, they're yet to happen. As of today, none have happened. No, well, I think uh, ultimately uh, it's an interesting question because if you if you look at the process, uh, even if there was an agreement to transfer, there's a number of criteria that need to be met before that occurs, including collaborative discussions around the ongoing uh, uh, funding. So I'm fully expecting this to be an initiative program over uh, an extended period because of the complexities, uh, but we do have them yeah. underway. Uh, yeah. And, and it's very active, I will say. So what we've got going on and um, working with councils is actually on the assessment of the road, on identification of any sort of remediation works and truly getting an understanding of the condition mm. of the asset. No, no, I, look, I, I, I understand the points you both made. I am going to press it, Mr Sharp, though, and it's own, you're left in this position, and don't comment on this, please, because the minister was ducking and diving. So I am going to press uh, this question, which is just as of today, you agree, based on the common sense comments of your agency official just then, that no road transfers have taken place today? by today. It, it depends what you, I think why this uh, conversation is challenging is what do you define as a transfer? So is it the ultimate end position where everything's agreed uh, or is it that there's an agreement to transfer and the process is underway? Mr. So, Sharp, so it's, it's, really, like, it's like a contractual... You're uh, really going to get yourself in trouble putting... <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to say that the ultimate transfer hasn't happened, but the, yeah. the transfer itself is, is a process. Yes. Uh, so yes. I just want to be very Can clear in yeah. the definition that you're using, because it's, it's a bit like a contract. I agree that we're, we've got the contractual terms, but then there's the actual process of, um, <laughs> of writing the contract. Uh, so at the moment, the end position where all of those items would be locked in, the answer is no. We're in various stages of the transfer yes. process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, but 16 that, that's, that's in, the uh, delineation of, I, of I, the priority I round in tranche one. 16 reclassifications have taken place. Yes, and zero transfers. Is that correct? The the transfers that are underway have not finished that transfer process. Mm -hmm. mm. Correct. That's right. So as of that's today, right. zero have concluded. Correct. We're, we're yeah. still in progress, which yeah, is what good. we said. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And I'm sorry to press it, but yeah. it is, you know, I think that's the common... I just don't want any confusion here. And, um, uh, yeah, but I, I but accept what you're there's, there's a process uh, that, that I think yeah. that's what's causing the, the challenge in terms of the yes. descriptions you're trying to, trying to land. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I might hand back to my <clears throat> colleague. Yeah, thank you. If I can just finish up on the um, <clears throat> school drive subsidy. Um, um, the Minister's answer indicated that there were 12,322 children covered by the school's drive subsidy, but I'd like to focus on the preschool drive subsidy pilot. Um, now, um, the Minister indicated um, back in July there are 81 children covered by that, um, and that $2 million have been allocated for the preschool drive subsidy pilot, including implementation and administration costs. Um, can you tell us how long um, that pilot will continue? Yeah, no, thank you for the, that question. And uh, the preschool drive uh, subsidy is a pilot and it's a joint transport for New South Wales and Department of Education initiative and uh, started in the 1922 school year. And this pilot will provide a subsidy for families living in remote and very remote areas in New South Wales. So I think their children can access uh, preschool services by offsetting part of the transport cost of driving children uh, to participate in preschool. So this is for preschool uh, children. And uh, the pilot is voluntary 
complimentary for both uh, the preschools and the families. Um, as part of the pilots, 91 preschools were identified to be eligible for the pilots, and to date, 29 preschools have agreed to participate. And uh, we have received 102 applications for semester one, covering travel for terms one and two, and they're now being processed uh, for the payments. Um, so the, the, the payment, uh, the, the subsidy is paid at the same rate as the school drive subsidy, and the main difference uh, uh, for the uh, difference for the pilots is the payments for journeys are capped at the maximum distance of 50 kilometers between home and preschool. And uh, attendance is also capped at 86 days per annum. So, uh, and then the pilot's actually being evaluated by the Department of Education. So okay. the pilot is underway at the moment. Simple, yeah, thank you. That, that's all very valuable information. I appreciate it. When, when is the pilot um, due to expire? Uh, so I have, to, um, I have to check how long the pilot will actually last for, and as I mentioned before, it will be evaluated uh, by the Department of Education. But I'll get back to you with the, the, the duration and the exact uh, budget for the, for the pilot. Okay. Uh, if, if it's really valuable and people are finding it of value, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in this, is suddenly gonna, people suddenly find they really value it and then find it stopped. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... I mean, that, that's the obvious question. Yep. So I'd, I'd be really keen, um, because there's a whole lot of questions I'd like to ask um, in relation to its operation. For instance, um, um, are bus operators, um, do they have to accept preschool students who are aged over four years of age? Um, what are the guidelines in relation to assessing independent travel readiness? Um, for example, do the students have to be toilet trained? I mean, there's a whole range of those operational things I'm just interested in, but I mean, let's begin by, and I'll come back to it if you could find out for me before we finish today, what, um, when is the pilot due to finish, um, and, um, um, and, um, um, and, and, and is there an expectation that we'll, we'll then continue? I will try to find out as soon as I can uh, how long the pilot will last. But the school drive subsidies uh, is available for New South Wales residents in areas where there's no public transport available. Yep. So uh, for part of all the way of the, the school, and uh, people then driven by to, to, to school. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sharp, I just want to return to some of those costings issues. I might ask about a different one while we're waiting for those other figures. Um, this, I'm referring now to the budget papers to page 19 of the regional um, budget statement, uh, the transport section of that uh, section. So it's that, I think it's the larger A4 um, version you might find, yeah, that regional statement. Okay. Um, so you can see there that under transport, that second bottom um, paragraph, $201.2 million, have you yes. got that one? Yeah, so that include, that's a rolled up figure for fixing country bridges for the 16 cities program and the fixing local roads program. Uh, it's, I've, it doesn't say whether that's a two year, three year or four year figure. Um, could you, or what I'm interested in is, what is the allocation to fixing local roads that, that, that the budget refers to? Yes, we'll take that on notice and break that out. Okay. How much has been spent on fixing local roads to date? It was 243 million. Mm -hmm. That was allocated across 253 projects. Round two was 150 million, allocated across 108 projects. Yep. And round three is 153 million, with, uh, an estimated 138 projects. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so across all three rounds, 248 projects have been delivered. So presumably it's the total of those three numbers. Yeah, okay. Yep. And I'm, I'm happy to do right. the maths on that. And what, um, so that's that has all been allocated and spent to date? Is that, that should all be pre-30 June 22? Yes. And but and you're gonna and we don't know or feel free to tell me that we do know how much is allocated this financial year. Uh, we'll we'll take that on notice. Just just for clarity, the the rounds reflect the the total allocation for that round. Um, the projects do have a, a two year delivery window, mm. so the expenditure yeah. will be slightly different to the allocation. So if yes. we can take that on notice, and yeah. um, we can come back with the distinction between the expenditure. Yeah, no, accepted. So you know, I, I, that's a, a good point. So then, I, but I'm really asking, what is? Of course, some of this might have slipped. Um, uh, or by, it may have been just ordinary program delivery, but what's the allocation this year? Uh, and then what, what's the allocation in the rest of the forward estimates? So with regards to this year, this will be influenced um, predominantly by round four, um, and we're going through the process at the moment. We'll be looking, hopefully, to uh, announcements around round four towards the end of this year. That will then inform what the the funding cash flow requirement is for this financial year and well, beyond. Well, no, I'm asking what... I mean, there's a budget figure here of $201.2 million, so I'm really asking what the budgeted figure is that's been allocated. So it won't be... Um, it shouldn't... It, it, uh, that's my specific question, not what you might change we, it we to. We can come back and confirm what is the funding allocation for this financial year Great. for that program. Yeah, and could you come back on notice and tell me what is then in the rest of the forward estimates for that? The fixing local roads, yes. Yeah. And I presume it will be less than the $201.2 million that is allocated for the range of projects here. That's referred to in the budget paper. Um, yeah, the reference that you all you've taken from that on page 19 mm. refers to several programs. Mm. And do you know if that's a two-year um, allocation, as the one below it is, or a four-year allocation, as the one above it is? But the budget's silent on this. I'll have to come back and confirm that if we take that on notice. Right. Okay, that would be helpful. And um, we don't. Um, but we still don't know about the roads reclassification funding. Uh, I, I'd request if we can take that on notice, mainly because I want to make sure that we're giving accurate information, particularly because we have had some expenditure that is just our day-to-day -day work, yeah. um, and make sure that we're providing accurate information of expenditure against the various tranches as well. Okay. I'm, uh, look, I will. I, can I preface this by saying I have generally found that transport officials excellent at giving information. I'm a bit frustrated to have to. Oh, this is a signature government commitment, so I'm a bit frustrated about having to take the this year's allocation on notice. Like, I would have thought that is just something that um, we can ask and is easily to hand. Having said that, I, yeah, if you could take that on notice, understood. Um, what I would like to ensure, though, is that we have that breakdown. What's been spent to date? What is in this financial year? And for each of the years that are ahead, what's the allocation? We just need yeah. that information to be able to do our jobs. Yeah, your point's noted. Thank right. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I ask just about briefly about an old topic, and that's compliance speed cameras. Um, um, I, I remember the um, then Minister, um, along with the Deputy Premier, announcing that um, motorists are supposed to be advised that their speed's being checked um, with signs on the roof of mobile speed camera vehicles across the state. Um, but there are many reports and there have been photographs, particularly on rural and regional roads, that the signs just aren't up. Um, and there's been a lot of concern. I mean, have you received many reports um, of speed camera vehicles operating without appropriate signage? Uh, I'll pass the uh, question to Mr McCarthy, but just to uh, uh, give you a sense, this is something that uh, is actually very important, and this is actually bringing the community along with these uh, enforcement measures. Uh, they do save lives, but by the same token, we do want to be uh, balanced, and we've taken community feedback. Uh, so the uh, the criteria is that if the signs are down, there's no uh, photos taken, and there's certainly no fines issued. Now, we are aware of various... Uh, photographs that have emerged, and, I'll, uh, and we've investigated uh, every single one of those, so I'll pass those across to uh, talk to some specific examples and what we've been doing about it. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, thank you. So the government gave a commitment that from the 1st of April of this year that all uh, vehicles uh, undertaking enforcement of mobile speed cameras would have signs installed. Um, those vehicles can only be in operation if the sign is in the upright position. Um, we, we have received uh, a number of reports, not that the sign wasn't in the upright position, but um, because of growth of foliage, for example, or parking in a vehicle in front or behind, that at times those signs weren't visible, um, I guess, at a distance to motorists. And uh, in response to those issues that have been raised, we've been working very closely with the two vendors uh, and we've developed uh, a number of protocols that are now very clear that they are to ensure that those vehicles are parked in a manner where the sign is visible. So we've worked with them that they need to look at the foliage, for example, they need to look at uh, any signs that might obscure them, they need to consider the distance that they park um, in front of or behind vehicles, uh, and a number of other protocols they need to report that back to their base um, as a verification check that the vehicle uh, is correctly positioned. Uh, if the site that we've allocated to them um, is unsuitable because, for example, the foliage has uh, become overgrown. Uh, they are not to operate from that site and they report that to us and we then undertake maintenance of those sites. Thank you. Can I ask um, um, if, if a motorist was able to show that that wasn't the case? You've indicated that the, the fine would be waived because if the signage wasn't there, then they shouldn't be taking photos, is that...? No, that's, that's not correct. I, I said if the sign was in the upright position, yep. then uh, that was the commitment that the government gave. And that, that was the case as of the 1st of April. The signs were installed on all vehicles and also there was livery on all the vehicles, the 143 vehicles. And if they didn't have that, they weren't to operate. Uh, what occurred over a period of time is the community raised concerns about how far ahead they could see those signs. Uh, and we have responded in an iterative manner to those concerns that have raised. Um, however, at the end of the day, if a person commits an offence, um, you know, then they've committed an offence, they always have the ability to ask for that offence to be reviewed and individual cases will be considered. Uh, but as I said, the, the main uh, initial commitment was that the sign would be installed and be in the upright position and it's, it's an iterative uh, process to respond to concerns. Could you tell me, is, is, are there, what hours do um, these um, vehicles operate? Uh, they can operate 24-7. So they could be operating in a dark street? Uh, they could, but the signs that are uh, installed on the top of the vehicles uh, are retro-reflective, so they're as visible as any sign would be at night to, to a driver, so they're, they're very visible. Um, and some people would say they're more visible at night than they are during the day. And I can assure you that that's not the case, um, having um, particularly from a number of um, people that I've spoken to, um, um, having a, um, a vehicle parked in a metropolitan street, um, in a darkened uh, street full of trees, um, doesn't um, um, doesn't exactly open them to be in, entirely visible. Um, but look, I mean, that's something for another occasion. But um, um, it, it, I think it, I think common sense would suggest that having a, a sign um, in a darkened street in the middle of the night doesn't live up to what was under the government's undertaking, but I, I won't ask you to comment on that. Um, okay. I might follow up on that just with um, a couple of additional questions, so thank you for that information. Um, I just want to clarify just a little bit of the evidence you've given. So I, I, I'm clear on the commitment, the sign should be in the upright position. Uh, can the cameras operate if it's not, or you're just saying the protocol requires that they should not? Uh, the, the cameras could operate if it's not. However, there is uh, there are a number of checks and mechanisms. So uh, the signs uh, are raised um, electronically by the operator whilst they're inside the vehicle. Uh, they are then required to take a photo um, on the of um, I guess 
uh, a light on their dashboard that indicates that the sign is in the raised position. So that light goes green. Uh, they are required to take a photo of that light to show that it's green and to transmit that photo in real time uh, before they are given the go-ahead to commence um, enforcement activity. And equally, they are required to take a photo of that light when the sign is uh, lowered. And again, transmit, transmit that photo in real time. Yeah, and they transmit it to their operator, that is their, in either of the operators, they transmit it essentially back to base, is that? That's correct. The, and they're given the go-ahead. Both go -ahead. operators have an operation centre that operates 24-7. And they're given the go-ahead by that operation centre to proceed. Uh, that's one of the things that's checked. There's obviously other things that are checked, in, as said, in relation to foliage, uh, in relation to um, how far they are from vehicles um, in front and behind them. Uh, there's numerous things that are checked uh, before that vehicle can operate. Mm. So just, just take us through those things. So foliage, distance from the vehicles, what other things? Uh, they've got to confirm that they're in the right location, so we select the locations uh, ahead of time. Um, we've undertaken a process where sites have been, uh, I guess, people have gone out and assessed those sites for their suitability. Uh, there are considerations, for example, um, we look at... Um, how far um, a vehicle's positioned from a change in speed zone, for mm. example, yes. yep. the gradient of the road, uh, the foliage, et cetera. So, um, and whether the vehicle can be safely parked um, mm. in, in that location. So one of the checks is that they are actually in the right location. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, how far from a change in speed zone could a vehicle be parked? I'd have to take that on notice. Great, thank you, if Mr. you could. Mr. Carlin may know that, no, no. Thank you. If you could take that on notice. Um, how far from another vehicle uh, could a speed camera vehicle, mobile speed camera vehicle, be parked? Uh, as part of our changing protocols, we're advising them to be, uh, well, the protocol, I shouldn't say advise, the protocol says um, that they should be about 10 to 15 metres from a vehicle. 10 to 15 and metres, and that'd be... I want to understand that's that's a protocol that's been iterative. Yeah. It wasn't in place on the 1st of April. <coughs> yeah. We've responded to community concerns. Yeah, and that, um, that's why I'm asking about it, because it has changed. So, And that's 10 to 15 metres, or presumably in front, 10 to 15 metres. That's behind. correct. Um, and are these written protocols? They are. And can you supply the protocol to the committee? Yes, I believe so, on notice. Thank you. And how many reports have you had? You've, obviously, this has come about uh, as a result of reports made where motorists felt this was... Um, the, these vehicles were not appropriately positioned. How many reports has Transport for New South Wales had? I, I'd have to take that on notice. If you could, exactly. that'd be welcome. Uh, Mr. Graham, just to clarify on that, uh, there's two ways we receive information. Some of it's very public through radio stations and others mm. just ringing in. We obviously follow those up. But we do have a hotline mm. uh, that's specifically for this. So we've been promoting it. Yep. Uh, if someone has a concern, yep. uh, they can ring that hotline and, yep. and we track that. That data will be available and we're happy to share that. Thank you. No, much really appreciate it. Thank you. And how many... I was interested in um, specifically also just this idea of main, foliage maintenance. On how many occasions will you have had to respond to a report, go out and um, deal with a foliage issue. Yeah, and I'd have to take that on notice. I think that'd be fair to ask you to take that on notice rather than uh, have that here. Um, and then to return, uh, if we could, to the evidence in the Minister's session about the cost of these upright signs, I just wanted to return to that evidence, Ms McCarthy, that you gave there. I think, uh, without going back to my notes, you said 2.6 million. That's was correct, the... yes, and that was within the existing contract. So there was... I wasn't clear on what you meant by that. So uh, the contracts have been awarded over mm. a period of three years. Mm. Um, they're for a fixed amount, which I have somewhere here. Um, yep. And um, the 2.6 million was... Um, is part of that uh, contract allocation. It's not expected that it would cause the, uh, the contract to go over the allocated amount. Mm -hmm. Now, that's partly because um, of uh, times where the, the cameras have not been able to operate the 21,000 hours that, that the contract was drawn up for um, in response to... Uh, 
the timing it took to get uh, the vehicles with livery and with mm. signage. So we said gave an undertaking that those vehicles would not uh, do enforcement until they had signs on them and they had livery from the 1st of April. Mm. So there's been variations in the delivery of the 21,000 mm. hours per month mm. um, and that's allowed that expenditure of 2.6 million mm. to be maintained within the, the mm. contract allocation. Mm. All right, so, and well, I might clarify one thing first. You said there's 140 43 vehicles operating at the moment. Correct. Good. And so essentially what you're telling us there is um, these signs cost $2.6 million to, um, uh, to install. How much was that for each operator? Uh, I'd have to take that on notice. It's on it notice, thank based you. Based obviously on the... F the on the number of vehicles the they're operating, the correct. Um, uh, the Minister in the House, this is Minister Ward now, has said, look, we're, the state's happily paying for those. But you're saying in the course of negotiations, as I understood it, the penalties that might apply for these two operators not meeting the hours that they had contracted to have been offset in some way. Is that the view you're putting? So yeah, they, they should have paid a penalty... They only get paid for the hours that they deliver. Yeah. So because they were unable to deliver the 21,000 hours at the commencement of the contract, mm. uh, then there was money available within the contract to mm. pay the $2.6 million. Mm. And was that by way of a penalty or by way of a withheld payment or...? It's a withheld payment. Yeah. And how many hours have been delivered in each month of this program? I'd have to take that on notice. Yeah, could you just um, take it on notice? Would... This, I mean, I think it's been quite... This was the subject of discussion earlier. Mr Carlin gave us some excellent information at the time, but I think it would be an appropriate point to ask oh, for I each would... month looking yeah, backwards. I would say uh, both operators have the capacity to operate 21,000 hours mm. per month now. Mm. Um, there have been other factors that have uh, impacted that. So, for example, um, the floods and, mm. and areas that were heavily impacted by floods. It was not safe, nor mm. was it appropriate to deploy mobile speed camera vehicles into mm. those communities that were suffering. Mm. Um, so that has reduced the hours that they delivered. So the numbers that we give you um, are not necessarily reflective of their capacity. They have now got enough fleet and, and mm. capacity to deliver those yeah. 21,000 hours. I think that's an important distinction. There was a time where the capacity was not there. It had been promised, contracted, and it was not there. Yes. You're making the point we're now past that. Um, but if we could ask, what is the what what is the number of hours that have been delivered for each of the operators, that is separating them out, uh, over each month, looking back perhaps over the last 12 months? Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Uh, just noting the time being 3.30, we'll now break for 15 minutes and return at 3.45. Do you guys plan to dismiss anyone or...? Oh, surely. I think we probably can if we uh, have a discussion. Yeah, yeah. Let me know. Do you want to power through? <laughs>
Okay, welcome, welcome back after that short break. Um, in that short break, the committee has resolved that we can actually release Mr. Carlin and Miss McCarthy. Um, you are free to go. We thank you for your time. Um, and, uh, with that, I'll throw back to the opposition for further questions. Okay. Um, had a slightly longer short break. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, great. Um, I might uh, just turn Mr Sharp back to those questions about the regional seniors travel card, about the issue about the low balance. If your account balance falls below $5 and you don't use it within 30 days, then uh, the funds are forfeited to Transport for New South Wales. Can you tell us? I mean, those are the operational practices. They're advert, the agency's quite upfront about that with the public. Um, can you tell us uh, where does this money go? Uh, how often has this been the case? Uh, yes, it would be uh, part of the treatment of any card that has a, uh, ultimately a low balance. If you got down to a dollar, uh, what do you do with that dollar? I'll just pass over to Mr Lecoq to see whether he's got an update on on that question. Yes, uh, sure, sure. So the regional seniors travel card, so so customers uh, are awarded that for, for a, a the tune of uh, $250 and to assist uh, in offsetting their travel costs in the regions. And um, so uh, most uh, most of the, 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 the customers actually use that, uh, uh, that amount and actually in terms of the amount of expenditure um, that people have used already is about $184 million has already been uh, inject, injected back into the regional communities and uh, about 96% or so of the, of the expenditure actually goes on to, on to fuel, uh, followed by taxi cabs and then followed by uh, train link uh, services. So the vast majority of the customers use that. And, but when the, um, the, the, the card balances reaches $5 or less, uh, people are encouraged to use that in the next 30 days and so that and uh, if the the third if the balance flow stays below five dollars for 30 days the card is uh, discontinued and that's consistent with the terms and conditions of the cards that are provided to, to the customers and where uh, understood and where does the money go so I have to, to take that on notice so how that fits into the overall envelope of the of the program uh, um, I have to take that on notice yeah, so and when and I should get all notice how much that was and, and how that is used. Yeah, good. So uh, I appreciate that. If you could, so if you could take on notice perhaps the following things where does the money go? You suggest, uh, but perhaps on notice, if you could confirm that the money is then quarantined within this program, uh, I think you'll, you I'm feel free to confirm that now. I, I, I'll have to take you, it on notice yeah, I think how the that's exact fair. treatment of yeah. that works. Yeah. Uh, for how many individuals has this occurred? That is for how many cards uh, has the balance fallen below $5 and been reclaimed? Oh uh, yeah, I'll try to get to, we'll get those uh, numbers uh, and uh, on notice. Yep. And, and perhaps if there's a distinction between, I would have thought the number of uh, low balances and the number of expired cards should be equal. You've really got to satisfy both those conditions for the um, money to be reclaimed by transport. Uh, but if that's not the case, if you could confirm separately for each of those. Uh, are you asking the question, of how, are there some cards where people actually, at the end of the, because they've got a year, uh, 18, yeah. 14 months to use it, mm. there's some people still actually just let it expire? Yeah. Is that the yeah. question? Yeah. I'll try, I'll try to take that on notice as yeah. well to see what we have. So that perhaps I, I might have $100 left, but I just haven't used it in time. I've yep. tucked the card in the back of the drawer or perhaps lost it in the washing machine. All these things, they certainly happen at our place. I'm not sure if they happen in yours. Yeah. Um, how uh, how often, so is that the case at that point that the funds are forfeited? 
I will, uh, I'll try to take that on note, that level of detail. No, I don't have that in my notes, how much that is and, and what actually happens to those funds. Mm. And finally, what is the total quantum of funds which have been reclaimed in this way, either from expired or low balance cards? I'll take that on notice as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I do want to ask about, um, we've talked about this before. I actually can't, I apologise for this. I can't recall the um, answer, but the uh, cards are provided by Westpac. What is, um, what was the quantum of fees or charges or money that Westpac was earning as a result of this program? Was it anything? Okay, could you read the last part of the question again? Uh, I'm just, what uh, is Westpac, the provider of these cards, earning any fees or charges? So um, I, I, I can't answer the question in a specific piece for the Westpac, but overall, the overall administration of, of, uh, of, this, uh, uh, um, of this scheme is about 16% mm -hmm. of the overall scheme. Mm. That includes uh, both the cost of service New South Wales, mm. uh, doing the, the customer service, as well as the arrangements uh, with uh, Westpac, but also the production and the distribution of these cards. Mm. Yeah. So perhaps you could tell us in the last financial year, what has Westpac earned out of this, either by way of fees, charges, or the contract? Mm -hmm. A, a contract payment from the state. I don't, I don't have that detail, and also I would have to, I'll take that on notice what we can yeah. provide in that space. Yeah. And my recollection is that was not particularly significant. Where there potentially was an issue was the obvious, it was the data. It's potentially very valuable to um, have access to the this data. Um, we asked some questions about this some year, well, possibly years ago now. What I really want to know now is, have there been any changes to the management of that data um, in the way this program is dealt with uh, since the program began? So really here I'm asking about, well, I mean, we're providing the names, addresses of um, seniors across the state. Um, there's some significant benefit to a financial institution in getting that information. Um, are there, have there been any changes? What are the current protocols around what they're allowed to use that data for uh, or not allowed to use that data for? Yeah, obviously, we take any customer information uh, and data uh, mm. uh, very seriously, yeah. uh, but I will have to take that on notice what the specific mm. arrangements are uh, with, uh, with third party providers. Right, thank you. Yes, can I briefly just ask you about um, um, regional rail overbridges, please. Um, now, if I can qu quote from the Tahe Strategic Asset Management Plan version 1.0 issued in December 2021 on page um, 20, uh, 22, um, quote, management of overbridges on the country rail network, including ARTC corridors, continues to be one of the many challenges. Severe corrosion to structural members and fastenings is the primary concern for the steel overbridges. The load rating investigation um, projects are underway and there is an increase in overbridges with load restrictions, end of quote. Um, so my question is, can you tell us briefly what's being done? to address this concern. Uh, thank you. Uh, those assets are, are owned uh, by Tahi. Uh, they are an asset holding company and uh, the activities uh, for uh, maintaining those assets uh, sits across Tahi and uh, Transport. Trans Transport uh, does uh, manage maintenance and uh, the asset management plan uh, is there to ensure that the safety, uh, it does, it does, um, uh, the safety parameters are maintained. Uh, as you can imagine, there's literally tens of thousands of kilometres of rail. Uh, there's also disused rail, so often uh, these over overpass bridges are actually on rail that's no longer uh, uh, operating as a corridor. Uh, you also have uh, facilities that uh, are older facilities, some of them are heritage, and so there's a, a full program underway looking across all those assets. What I can confirm is that uh, the safety critical are looked at. Uh, the management plan does highlight, though, that uh, clearly uh, if, if you're putting lower tonnage on a bridge, for example, it could have uh, implications for freight or other users of the road. And so uh, there's definitely a benefit uh, for the community in uh, reviewing these assets and ensuring that uh, you know, we're minimising the impact and that they're safe. Uh, but it is a very extensive exercise uh, given this uh, covers all of uh, regional New South Wales.
Can I ask one one thing that came to my attention was the quote, um, the June 2021 slopes audit by Deloitte assessed the standard strategies and approaches in place to manage slopes, cuttings and embankments as requiring major improvement. Uh, common condition profile and asset class strategies will be developed in the following order. And it says one slopes, two bridges, three culverts. I mean, Given the concerns that have been expressed in relation to steel bridges with corrosion being high risk, why would they be put at number two? I would uh, suggest that we're not just uh, looking at slopes uh, to the detriment of everything else. Uh, slope risk is actually uh, a here and now risk, particularly given the wet weather over the last um, two years. Uh, so slopes uh, is, is a priority area. It's one of the safety elements that keeps uh, me awake at night. Uh, in respect to bridges, I can confirm we are aware that they need uh, increased maintenance. Uh, slopes are a here and now safety issue of a slope slides. Uh, but, that, uh, but it's not, we're going to do all slopes before we start doing bridges. Uh, there are criteria there in terms of safety. Thank you. Just turning to the um, regional apprentice and uni travel card, the questions I was asking about that. Just some detailed um, questions. Now, I presume that these cards will have the same low balance or, or non-use and forfeited funds conditions. Is that the intention? So you, you, are you referring to the regional students uh, and apprentices card? To the yes, correct. Uh, so, uh, uh, as the minister said th this morning, we are still uh, in the process of uh, designing the exact uh, eligibility uh, and also working out uh, the, what the cards are and who does the, su the supply of that. So, it's too early really to 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 uh, to talk about that at this stage. Okay. Um, so that so there's not a banking partner yet that has been selected for the card. As I said before, we're still working our way through eligibility and how we how we actually do that. So it's, it's too early to, 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 to really comment on that. And does that mean there will be a tender issued for this um, service provision? Is that your expectation? Uh, again, it's a bit too early really to, to talk about um, about how we actually go do that. It's still, We're still working on all of that and ultimately it's up for a government decision so to work out what the exact uh, arrangement is. Mm. Is there a reason why a tender wouldn't be issued for this service? Well, there is. Uh, there are, of course, um, um, a, a existing banking arrangements at the whole of government level are already there, but yeah. that's really a matter for Treasury uh, to, to answer questions on that front. Yeah. Will Treasury... Ma who makes... Who made the decision about the service provider last time? Was that a Treasury or a transport decision? Well, I'm now referring to the regional seniors card. I uh, will have to take it on notice who actually uh, made that decision. Um, okay. <coughs> actually, I may, may have, have something on that. Um, actually, yes, yeah, so Westpac was selected as the banking provider for the, mm. the regional seniors travel cards after, tra after we engaged with New South Wales Treasury to ensure alignment with the state's banking provider. Right. Okay, so because Westpac provides services to the state, they were effectively in the box. And, and, and also in that, in that same space, of all the state's banking providers, uh, Westpac was the only one who had a product available that could support the requirements of the regional seniors travel card. And that contract is managed by Treasury. Right. Um, and for the regional seniors travel card. Yep, but were other people offered the chance to offer that product? Not according to that note. Uh, as, uh, as I said, as it's, uh, so there's a Treasury has a panel of mm. banking providers, but there was only one uh, provider who could actually uh, who could support the specific requirements of the, the regional seniors travel card. Okay, oh, I, I appreciate that and, information. And, and I guess and so that's, those contracts were managed through New, uh, New South Wales Treasury, so they could yeah. have to answer yeah, yeah, no. more detailed questions on that. No, I think that's fair. Okay, um, <coughs> bikes and boards on New South Wales train link regional trains. Um, um, why are bicycle and board riders forced to pay a fee of $12.10 to transport their bikes and boards on New South Wales train link regional trains when passengers on the Sydney and intercity trains can take theirs for free? Thank you for the question. Um, and, and for context, um, the two types of trains or the two environments you're talking about are very different. 
uh, in the way they operate. So for the suburban network, obviously um, high levels of patronage uh, in the Opal network and where bikes are more problematic because of the, the density of, of loading within the trains. In the regional network where you're, where you're referring to, with the current regional fleet, it's part of the business rules that that is how bikes um, are managed within our operations or our customer service delivery. So that's the, the current business rules. Um, it is uh, under review and under review as a reflection of the procurement of the new regional fleet. So who's reviewing it? Gets on the it track. Gets you. <laughs> And ask who's reviewing it? Yeah, New South Wales Train Link will do that as part of our operating model. Okay, when do you expect the review to be finished? Um, it's hard to put a date on. Um, it would be obviously a reflection of the delivery of the new regional fleet and, and the lead up to that fleet coming into service. Okay, so you, you think it could be problematic. You are reviewing it, but you don't know when it's going to be reviewed. Correct, yeah. Okay. Um, are, are we... <laughs> Okay, well, it, it's, it's, it's complicated to ask questions about something when you say it could, it's going to be reviewed at some point in the future. Um, it, it is, and, and, and um, thanks again for the... Factors do you take in, will you take into account in the review? Yeah, so it's... It, there'll be a number of factors, and that would be um, how um, stowage of the cycle is um, made safe within the train, the locations within the train, so currently... Um, bikes uh, would be, as part of our operating model and business rule, would be um, in a box within a particular part of the train. There are opportunities through the design of the new regional fleet that will give us some flexibility around different locations, but, but like I said, that would be part of the re review in the lead up to the um, deployment of the new train. Okay. So rather than pursue this one, can I ask then, so we have some idea what we're talking about, can you provide probably on notice what the quantum is of bicycle and buggage, uh, aboard luggage fees? have been paid by commuters travelling on New South Wales train link regional trains in the last financial year, please. So, so I, I want to know how much was, was actually paid by people to use, to take their boards and sure. bikes on. I'll take that on notice. Thank you. And that would give us an idea of the demand that we're talking about. Um, details on the Transport for New South Wales website advise that the new Explorer service will have only three spaces available for bicycles. Um, is that true? Um, sorry, sorry, could you just repeat the question again? Um, the, the new Explorer service will have only three spaces available for bicycles. I think, um, with, well, I think which, which document are you referring to, just for clarity? Um, the Web Transport for New South Wales website. I'll take that on notice. Um, Mr. Over's here as well, as well as um, Ms. Hayden. But my understanding is that um, as an offering, the ability to have bikes, as, as I said before, um, on our new regional fleet. And I think what's refer being referred to here is the trains that will replace the, the existing Explorer fleet. Yep. And it, parts, it takes part of that review that I just referred to before, in that they are part of the fleet that is being procured. Can I ask then, could you also please just take on <coughs> this, does the new fleet have the capacity to expand the number of spaces? Um, if, if, if it turns out that they're actually, there's a demand by consumers. We can take that on board. Um, as I said, as Ms. Drover and Ms. Hayden would know, the train is still in the design phase, early design phase. But well, we that's excellent on. because presumably then you could take account of um, possibly um, consumer demand when you, they're being designed. So can I just ask you to, I don't expect you to answer that straight away, but if you'd take it on notice, um, I have absolutely no idea what the demand would be, um, but um, uh, but if the, if as everyone expects the demand for this does increase in the future, it would be good to have have it particularly if the, some future government decides to bring equity to the whole system and allow people in regional New regional um, New South Wales to actually have bikes and um, boards on for free as their city cousins do. Yeah, we'll take that on notice. Thank you. I might turn to the matter that the minister referred to, and that was the um, what he called the, um, and I was glad he did this because I wasn't sure how to pronounce it, the Publist Review. Um, I just wanted to say so the options paper that's gone out, 23 options in four sets. Um, 
the a number of those options really look at um, the sale or third party administration of this scheme. What's the? I might just ask for the public rationale for those um, options to be put on the record. I might just first give it an opportunity for that. Yeah, I don't have specifics on it either. Um, thanks for the question, Mr. Graham. I think, um, sorry, if I could just clarify what you're asking about the Piblis review. So, obviously, I can I can speak broadly about the fact that Mr. Willits is currently in the process of undertaking yeah. the review. Look, I'm really where, where I'm. What I'm interested in, I might put these two in a different order. I might. One of the concerns that's being raised with us is really the freight industry's concerns about um, where this is heading. What they're saying is they would like to see uh, the existing scheme with some improvements remain in place. Um, firstly, I might ask, are you aware of those concerns? Is the agency aware of those? I concerns? think it's fair to say that um, both in the initial stages when Mr Willett was forming his views in terms of the options and then again more recently, uh, there has been extensive consultation uh, across the industry. There's been a number of sessions. Um, Mr Willett, I I've attended a couple of those sessions with Mr Willett's in the mm. recent couple of months uh, with all, all um, corners of the industry, including a briefing uh, that was provided through to the uh, the new Freight and Transport Advisory Committee that the Minister's formed. Right. So all sectors have had uh, quite a lot of exposure to Mr Willett's um, options paper, yep. and uh, and he's in the process of deliberating, um, clarifying some of those issues, and, mm. uh, and, mm. and between now and the end of the year, he'll be making recommendations back to government yep. on next steps. And that freight and is that freight and transport advisory council is the one chaired by um, former minister Duncan Gay, is that correct? Or? That's correct, yes. Yeah, good, yep. a very yep. good roads minister in, uh, in uh, my... Uh, I'm sure he'd be pleased to hear you say that. <laughs> um, so they've, they have reviewed it and um, uh, they've had the chance to have their input. There was an open session with Mr Willett on yep. from that Freight Transport Advisory Committee uh, where we had a number of the members participate and provide feedback, uh, but there's been a number of other, both open sessions and also requested uh, targeted sessions. And what's uh, with, the timing of that final report then to uh, the Minister? I'd have to get back to you, but it's, I know it's between now and the end of the year. I yeah. think uh, the, the suggestion was, I think, perhaps at the end of September, but is it, do you, does that sound like an accurate... Um, I think potentially there might be some uh, early recommendations made and then some, uh, I suppose, some consultation uh, mm. with government to form Mr Willett's final recommendations. Mm. And what, I mean, one of the key considerations here is really how do we drive productivity? Do you want to give us a view about where that issue is addressed? Where are the productivity incentives in the options paper from the agency's point of view? Oh, look, I think I think there's a number of options that he's put forward. Some of those are very minor in their context in terms of improvements, uh, and some of those are, you know, more major in terms of the sorts of things that you might propose to regulate. I think at the moment, uh, until we get those options back, mm. um, and then you know, government will take a position on those. I think the things that we're focusing on right now are the, uh, I suppose, the quick wins that have been more broadly assessed by industry. Uh, particularly, one of the things we've been very focused on in the last few months is just increased transparency about mm. Uh, mm. what is happening in the network, yep. how we're communicating with the industry, what some of those objectives are. Um, we've had some considerable discussions, particularly with the rail freight industry, mm. around um, you know, creating, uh, I suppose, a new expectation and uh, specifically we're, we're formulating a freight level of service that for the um, Metropolitan mm. Passenger Network that's obviously uh, mm. run and managed by Sydney Trains. So that, uh, I think that's been well received and some of the early conversations we've had with Sydney Trains with operators has uh, have been very positive. So we want to set some clear KPIs that help us One in of terms the things of productivity that's referred, measures. Thank you. One of the things that's referred to here is the uh, abolition of the minister's power to regulate surcharges. I just wanted to be clear about um, uh, precisely what we're talking about there. Is this this relates to the same powers that Minister Constance threatened to use uh, previously to regulate some of the charges? Is that are we talking about the same power to regulate I'd surcharges? I have to clarify the direct comparison, um, yeah. but uh, I, I think you know I would like to comment on 
the overarching position and, and what will be put forward until we see the recommendations from Mr Willett. He's, yeah. he's obviously created a broad net of options. Feel, feel free to not buy into the, this inflammatory language. However, my, my real question is, are these the powers that Minister Constance threatened to use to keep prices down and then did absolutely nothing about, uh, leaving these freight operators totally exposed to... Um, significant price rises. I so notice just to verify, yeah, but I think broadly speaking, um, your, your, mm -hmm. your assumption is correct. Right, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I've deliberately avoided asking any of the questions that I've been receiving from people who've been watching this today, but um, this is from a person who actually rides a bike in, in regional New South better. Wales, um, unlike me, and they say, how, how do you carry a bike box around when travelling on a train? Um, how does it actually work un under the new project? I mean, we'll, we'll, do you physically have a bike and you put it into the, the train, as happens in Sydney, or do you need to bring something with you that the bike is? Perhaps if I can start the response to that question, and I'll hand to Mr Merrick. I think um, the context at the moment is the existing regional <coughs> fleet, effectively bikes and surfboards are checked like they are on an aircraft, right? So they're kind of oversized luggage. Um, and so when Mr Merrick refers to boxing of the bike, that's ensuring that it's safe, uh, that it won't be damaged in transit and so on. In relation to the new regional fleet, uh, what has been requested and as part of the design specification uh, is for bikes to be actually taken on board in hull and, and stowed through a, a racking type arrangement so that they'll be able to be utilised in a, you know, a more modern context, if you like. Now, I don't know if Mr Merrick would like to add anything to that. Um, no, th and thanks again for the question and thanks, um, Mr Fuller. And a, a bike is considered part of the luggage um, consideration when booking a regional ticket. You won't actually have to have a bike box on your bike rack when you arrive. I mean, you can anymore. You will simply be able to bring the bike in and it'll go up onto the rack. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned before, um, the train being in the early design phases mm -hmm. um, of the project, um, bikes was one of the key considerations in the customer feedback um, uh, among many, many customer offerings. And it is being considered as part of the design how we can best accommodate bikes um, in a different way and in a way that's much more user friendly. Thank you. No, I hope that satisfies with one of the thousands of people watching the estimates this afternoon. Uh, I, um, just, just for complete um, clarity, the, it's the intercity um, new regional fleet that will have bike racks. It essentially doesn't require that um, additional process, but the long and short regional um, is what we're looking and exploring of uh, ways to sort of improve um, the storage of bikes. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask about the transport asset custodian platform, please? Um, um, when will that platform be completed? Can you I'll just repeat that again? The asset... The, uh, <coughs> um, the Tahe Strategic Asset Management Plan says, as an element of the asset information strategy, Transport for New South Wales is developing an asset register, the Transport Asset Custodian Platform, or TACP, which will become a single platform for existing and future asset data um, by communicating with operator and um, maintainer asset information systems. Um, can yes. you just tell me when that might be <laughs> Thank you for ready, that. please? Uh, as part of our um, asset management uh, uh, strategy, we're, we're on a journey to actually improve how we manage this across transport. So as you can imagine, with evolving transport, we've pulled a number of businesses and operating businesses together. Uh, a lot of the uh, mechanisms and the ways that we were managing our assets varied. And so what we're looking at doing is actually having a consistent platform or a, an IT system, if you like, uh, that actually enables us all to be talking the same language, having uh, the same mechanisms of recording this information. And uh, we have a, an area that's uh, working on uh, that. 
And uh, it, it's actually quite important for Tahi because obviously we maintain a lot of assets. And so uh, the document you would have read there is referring to the work that we're doing within transport. It, it's, uh, there's basically a, uh, a treasury budgeting uh, function as well where the life and efficient management of assets uh, does drive economic value to the community. And so we're on a, uh, a journey within transport. It was a five-year journey to actually get us to a mature state in managing assets. We're probably on about halfway on that journey at the moment. Okay, um, so about halfway. Um, before I get inundated by questions from our viewing audience, um, can you give us some idea of maybe a, a rough estimate of a completion date? I would say in about two years' time. Uh, it's a five-year program. Okay, thank you. And. Um, You've already mentioned what agencies will be able to gather information from the um, TACP. Um, can I ask you what will be the interaction with the Rail Industry Safety and Standards Board, please? Uh, look, from a safety perspective, we have um, uh, quite specific accountabilities under, under the safety regulations. Uh, so the uh, CEO of uh, Sydney Trains and uh, New South Wales Trains are uh, the accountable managers from a safety perspective. Uh, the interactions we have with the safety board uh, will vary depending on the nature of things. So if we're doing an investigation, there may be some elements we consult with them on. But also, uh, just generally, uh, we have mechanisms to keep across uh, safety processes. Uh, Mr McCarthy has uh, left, but uh, she, she could have uh, talked uh, to that uh, in some detail. What, uh, what I would say is that we've got one of our representatives right here, and uh, I'll pass to them just to give a a rail in heady view of it. Oh, thank you. And again, the question, the particulars of the question again? Well, what will be the interaction between the TACP um, and the RISSB, the Rail Industry Safety and Standards Board? So our yeah. asset management. Yeah, and, and, um, we, um, and thanks again for the question. So I'm not that familiar with the platform that's being referred to, but what I would say is a rail agency within the, the, within the sector, within transport, the relationship with the Rail Industry um, Safety Standards Board um, is ongoing and um, we are participating in many of their safety programs. Mm. I guess, it, please take this on notice because I'm, yep. I'm not being silly about it. I mean, in the development of all of these things, there's obviously a concern about duplication and if something goes wrong, who's actually responsible? Um, so my, my question is simply, I, what will be done to ensure there's no duplication? Um, and please take that on notice, if you would. Yep. Great. I might uh, turn to the $4.6 million report that was um, uh, commenced in December 2018. It's been sitting with the government since at least March 2020, and that's the McNaughton report into faster rail. Um, the, an answer on notice after we asked about this at a previous estimate said this, Transport for New South Wales is currently finalising the fast rail strategy, which will be publicly released once completed. Uh, Mr. Sharp, why hasn't the fast rail strategy been released? Uh, look, thank you. Uh, it, it is an exciting uh, project and uh, we have been talking about it for a while. Uh, the, there has been a lot of work going on with uh, uh, independent parties providing advice. Uh, we've also been developing uh, the concept papers. They are with government and uh, that question in terms of when they would announce uh, and will make an announcement is one actually for uh, government. Mm -hmm. So those concept papers, this report with government since March 2020, how long have those concept papers been with government? Uh, we've still been continuing work. Uh, we have a, a, a program in place and uh, those, uh, those teams continue to work on this. Uh, as you're aware, the federal government has also uh, been very interested in this mm. space. Uh, in fact, both, both colours of uh, parties have mm. been interested in this space. Uh, so we have been working with them as well in terms of uh, what would be the uh, early stages. Uh, mm. So this would be a long-term concept, but wh where are you going to get the value in the short term? And uh, so the work has been focusing on that. So it's not as though there was a paper prepared 
prepared 18 months ago and it's just been sitting there, mm. there's actually been a lot of conversation. Mm. Uh, as, as you're aware as well, uh, there's been quite sizeable dollars allocated uh, at the federal level. Uh, we are still waiting uh, to hear whether the 500 million that the New South Wales government has uh, put on the table, whether that will be matched uh, federally. Uh, there's a review underway at the moment uh, on the infrastructure uh, budget. But assuming it is, uh, there's uh, quite detailed plans in terms of how do we develop the business case, uh, the technical reviews that would be required. So the planning has been continuing <coughs> in regards to developing that. Uh, I would say it's imminent because the uh, budget has numbers allocated. They're quite sizeable. Mm. Uh, we, we are still uh, waiting to land the federal government funding element. Mm. Uh, so I suspect, uh, and we probably you probably heard this before, but we'd be nearing release of a strategy. Well, we, we, we certainly have heard it before. However, um, as you've correctly observed, this has been a priority. It was one of the things in the Governor General's speech for the new federal government on the 26th of July. So right. I hope you're correct. Um, what I'm interested, who do you engage with? What discussions does the agency have at the federal government level? Is that with the National Faster Rail Agency uh, or where are you plugging into the federal government discussion? Uh, it's through the um, infrastructure uh, department and so uh, we have partnership agreements uh, with them. Infrastructure Australia provide uh, uh, reviews uh, so we interact with them and provide information mm. uh, at the moment though the conversations would be also at the minister level mm. uh, so I know uh, the relative ministers within New South Wales and the federal government mm. had met mm. and had discussions mm. uh, so uh, the, the, there's clearly uh, an interest from all parties mm. in respect to this uh, the question is really one of how many dollars are going to be allocated up front and where do those dollars yeah. get spent yeah. uh, that's the current conversation yeah all right Thank you. Um, I, I think everyone can agree that there's a shortage of um, people working in a whole range of industries, and obviously one of those is um, in relation to bus drivers in regional New South Wales. Um, can I ask you what strategies are in place to assist in the recruitment of bus drivers? Uh, your observation is absolutely correct. Uh, in fact, we're seeing it uh, Australia-wide. It's an industry-wide issue. Uh, we've been engaged uh, with the industry, uh, quite specifically uh, looking to develop uh, plans. Uh, one, of, one of the challenges is, are we just uh, shuffling deck chairs in Australia? In other words, uh, if you recruit bus drivers, are you taking them off another industry and you're just simply creating some issues? So from a whole of government perspective, uh, I can confirm that, uh, that this has been a focus and uh, there, there have been conversations uh, at the uh, government level, along with the federal government, around visas, applications, immigration. Uh, at a higher level, those things have been occurring. On the ground at the grassroots, I'll pass across um, uh, to uh, get some more detail around particular bus operators, because uh, in the regional area, uh, obviously there's uh, a large number of smaller operators right through to, uh, to larger operators. Uh, Certainly, thank you. Um, in terms of things that are happening on the ground, individual operators under the contracts that we hold with the operators, it's clearly their responsibility to employ the drivers. Um, they are offering um, incentive payments to people to, to join. They're offering incentives such as taking them much earlier in the process in terms of helping them get a heavy vehicle driver licence and getting um, through some of the regulatory hoops um, that you mentioned actually earlier in terms of, say, for taxi drivers and those kinds of things. Um, bus industry representatives have put papers to transport seeking assistance with those some of those things and that those some of those regulatory options are also being looked at as well for bus drivers. Can I ask you in relation to the Bus New South Wales and those range of options to increase driver recruitment, um, are there any particular options that are currently being um, positively looked at? Uh, I would say that none of them, well, as far as I'm aware, because I'm not involved in all of the discussions, but in terms of the discussions I've been involved in, certainly um, 
we haven't ruled anything out. As Mr Sharp mentioned, a lot of it does go down to, in fact, Bus New South Wales did talk about in that submission, if we're referring to the same one from July, um, about visa categories, those kinds of things as well. Um, the and th there are, we're actually working across the entire agency, so with my colleagues in Greater Sydney as well, on working with bus operators um, quite in, in on, the, on the ground kind of way to um, see what we can do to help them, help speed up processes around driver licensing, for example. Thank you. There are some um, interesting examples though. So uh, Hunter, Hunter Valley Buses uh, has been running a, um, uh, a program, a trainee program, and they've had uh, 44 new uh, uh, people come through there over the last six months. So e e each uh, organisation is targeting uh, different initiatives, and, and some are actually been quite successful. And I do think there's some really good opportunities in the regional areas uh, to create jobs um, and, and bring in traineeships, not just on buses, but just more generally, even within transport. Yeah, um, I, I, I Obviously, um, training heavy vehicle drivers is also critical, and I understand, but I'm not going to try and confuse the, the two issues here at the moment, but they're obviously interrelated. Um, just on this, um, this matter, can I ask you to please take on notice, um, since the 1st of January of this year, on how many occasions has Transport for New South Wales um, been advised of cancelled bus services due to workforce shortages? How many of these occurrences involve school buses? And how many complaints has Transport for New South Wales received in relation to this matter over that period of time? Okay. We'll take those on notice. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd like to ask about the um, issues that have arisen from the relocation of the Heritage Train Complex at North Rothbury. Um, this has been a very strong local community issue, and obviously the Heritage Rail uh, team in many parts of the state are very passionate advocates for what they do. Uh, the real issue here, as I understand it, is the short-term uh, accommodation for these uh, rail assets while there's a longer discussion that goes on, uh, what is the agency doing to assist? Uh, thank you. Uh, we do take uh, our uh, heritage um, seriously and we've been investing in some of our heritage assets. Uh, there's uh, a large uh, facility at Trelora uh, that has been put, uh, put together. Uh, the Sydney Trains uh, organisation is actually making good the facility at the moment. It had, hadn't been used for a little while. Uh, so it's been uh, uh, been brought back to a, uh, a state where the project can actually kick on. My understanding, and I'll have to take on notice the specific details, is that we're talking a period of about 12 months. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, those assets need to be relocated. But uh, I'm not sure if uh, you're across it. No. Uh, so I'll have to take it on notice in terms of the detail, Mr Graham. Mm. OK, thank you. I th it might be um, part of the discussion is related to... I mean, the one of the immediate questions is whether or not, um, as Broadmeadow is emptied out to mm. Chalora, which is on track to occur by November 22, whether that might be a temporary... Um, Options. So that is one of the um, things that's been canvassed. So perhaps I'll notice. Yes, I'll have that. I'm not familiar with that. I, I have spoken uh, personally with uh, with the uh, heritage organisation, and uh, they were expressing some concerns around the timelines. But uh, we've given them comfort and uh, and focus that uh, we'll be supporting them in that endeavour. Uh, but I'll come back to you on the uh, interim arrangement. And just to emphasise the urgency of this, um, I understand that the writ of possessions is. Uh, which will close, effectively close the Rothbury, North Rothbury side, will be issued on the 1st of October. So there, this is obviously a pressing deadline from their point of view. Um, okay, um, Testers Hollow and um, um, yeah, Gilliston Heights, which suddenly became an island during the recent floods. Um, when is the upgrade of Cessnock Road, Testers Hollow, expected to be completed, please? Do you want me to speak? So, uh, effectively, Testers Hollow is going to be completed between now and the end of the year. I think we uh, we had some minor delays due to the weather, but I think uh, that's fair to say that December is uh, what we're targeting at the moment. Yes. 
Member. Okay, thanks. Can you tell me how much has been um, spent on the project to date and what the final um, expenditure is expected to be? I'm happy to take that question. The, the total budget for the Testers Hollow project is $17 million. Uh, that's $15 million from the federal government and $2 million from the New South Wales government. And um, what damage was sustained in the recent flood event? And was, what was the additional cost as a consequence? The damage was more to time rather than um, physical damage. It just uh, it went underwater, and it would uh, it, it it took uh, you know it took additional time, and that's what's caused the delay to the project to push it back to the end of the year. But we're still on track to meet that that budget. Okay. And have there been any alternative options considered to ensure that the Gilliston community does not become an island yet again? Yeah, it's obviously been a, a, a point of um, um, serious discussion within the community over a great, you know, over a period of time, and we've had numerous conversations with the councils involved as well. Um, the project, when it's complete, will take that road from being, from having a, a one in two year flood resistance level to one in 20. Um, it raises the road by about one and a half metres. Um, so it's a big step in the right direction. Um, the community um, has obviously still expressed their concerns about whether that's high enough. Um, but in recent conversations with council, we actually stopped and said, well, you know, this, this is the chance to talk about it. Um, and I think we all agreed it's been a long time coming, let's just get it finished. It's due to be finished in the next few months, so let's get the project done so that the community can actually enjoy a more reliable piece of road. Um, and the conversation has now commenced about are there alternative routes for, you know, for, for other potential um, flooding situations in the future if that were to occur. Okay, I'm advised by one of our viewers that there's been three complete isolations since 2007 for the 7,000 people who live there, so obviously it, it's critical. Um, <coughs> is it the case that they've run out of rain days in the contract? And what would be the effect of that if that's the case? Uh, yeah, we are getting close to the, the, the rain contingency <coughs> in the contract, um, but yeah, the project is, is well, well on its way to completion and we will get it done. <coughs> Thank you. I might turn to an issue at the Point Clare railway station. This station's being upgraded. Uh, the issue that's been caused is the recent removal of temporary ramps. The planned accessible <coughs> lifts are not operational until later this year, and that's causing real community concerns. To give you some sense of the community concerns, uh, recently an 82-year-old woman was struggling to get up the newly installed stairs. She was almost in tears struggling to get to her chemist. Uh, Rex Brown, another Point Clare local, is aged 85. He's got a mobility scooter. He now cannot get to his doctor due to the stairs. Um, being put in place. Angela Tun, a mother of three with a newborn in a pram, um, is finding it difficult to use two elevators just to get from one station to the other. Um, these are the sorts of issues that are being created at the moment. What is the agency doing to deal with these community concerns? I'm happy to take that as well with, with Ms Drover. Um, it, it's not ideal, we agree, um, and there have been a couple of um, a couple of issues with this project. One being that we haven't communicated as effectively with the community as we should have, and we have apologised for that. Um, with specific regard to uh, the removal of the old ramps, the, the old ramps are in exactly the same place where the lift is going to go. Mm -hmm. Um, this happens, and it and it has happened with, with other projects as we as we've moved through the transport access program. Um, there has been a, a delay in the amount of time it's going to take us to install the new lifts and get it working. Um, and as a result of that, what we're doing is um, we are making sure that our team are on hand to assist in helping people get from one side of of the station to the other. It's certainly not an ideal mm. situation, but. We're now just trying to get it done as quickly as we can. If I can just add, the lifts are planned to be operational by October, um, and then the, the rest of the project finished in November. Um, unfortunately, because of the protected industrial action, we are two months late or further late on that project. Uh, but, Ms Driver, you're not blaming this 
on the union. No, absolutely. No, uh, as my colleague said, we, we accept um, yeah. the, the, uh, the ramp issue has been problematic for the communities, but we are endeavouring to finish the project as quickly as possible. And I, I appreciate you giving us that date as well. That's Thank you. It's an operational workaround. Again, it's not ideal, but it does exist mm. in terms of people can ring a hotline mm. and get um, help um, to access the railway station whilst we finish. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I appreciate the um, the fact you've been upfront about it not being ideal. I, th I think that is welcome. Uh, the Minister put out a statement which was really quite, oh, look, I thought it was quite unusual um, in that it said um, this, it came to my attention that the final design had deviated from the original designs that went to community consultation and I directed my department to revisit the design to ensure the upgraded station is accessible to all customers. Well, what, how did this happen that the Minister's got to issue a directive like that? Well, we actually took the issue to the Minister mm. where, when, it, yep. when it became okay. apparent um, to make sure that he was aware of it. Um, we initially put out for consultation an initial design. Um, we received the community feedback. Mm. Uh, we then made some alterations to that design, working with some um, disability experts who advise us. We changed the design. Where we went wrong is we didn't go back out to re-communicate yep, the, the proposed know. changes. Yeah, yeah. Um, we still believe that the new, the new design is in fact a, a, a more suitable design and it's in line with a number of the other projects that, that we've built around the state, but we should have gone back out to communicate and we didn't do that. Right, thank you both for those answers. Right. Um, I'm just writing out this name for Hansard. Can I ask you about the um, um, Gobba Gomboland or Gobba Bridge at Wagga Wagga, please? Um, the, um, now, my understanding is that there was an investigation a few years ago to duplicate the bridge. That then morphed into a study and then a business case. And then after seven years, the government produced a transport plan which once again called for an investigation to be undertaken. Um, given all the various reports, nothing as far as I can tell is actually reading through the materials actually happened. Um, and there have now been two, at least two rollover accidents on the approach to the uh, Gobba Bridge within the past few weeks. Can you, someone give us an update on what's actually going to happen there, please? Yeah, sure. I'm um, happy to start with that and uh, Mr Hayes might be uh, able to add as well because I know he's been um, uh, active in the Southern District recently. We um, Transport at the moment is uh, working with the Council. As you say, there has been a, a transport plan for Wagga that has been circulated. Um, the Gobba Bridge, uh, in, in, sorry, in relation to that plan and some of the things that are going on at the moment, there was an announcement um, made by Government for a $30 million package of work uh, to be undertaken in the Wagga region, uh, which included uh, upgrade works to the intersection of Gobba Bridge, which uh, at the moment the team are working on and uh, coming up with proposals so that uh, hopefully we can get uh, some activity happening around the Gobba Bridge and uh, get a better resolution for the Wagga community. Uh, Mr Hayes, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like yeah, to add. There's to not that. a great deal to add to that. The, the, the primary focus is on making the bridge safe and fit for purpose. Um, the analysis that we've done suggests um, that um, the feedback we've had regarding duplication of the bridge, um, that's not necessary at this time. Um, so the focus is on making the current bridge safe. Okay. Um, can you give us um, an, um, an idea when, um, when some action may actually be physically taken? Well, I think detailed design is in the process of being undertaken and I think the expectation is we'll have that wrapped up uh, by the end of October. So on that basis, uh, we should be in a position to be back out communicating with the uh, community in terms of what a program of work might look like and timeframes. And just to give you some information, we're looking at the traffic lights, um, the road surface, the soil subsurface, the placement of utilities to make sure that it's effective. Is any of this information public information? I'm just wondering whether we could receive some, just a summary of what's actually being proposed at the moment. I, I don't want to go into details. But sure, no. So through our uh, southern director uh, in that region, we'd be happy to provide the community with an update of where we're at, no problem at all. Yep. Yep. Can you can you make that available to us and that, that would be... Absolutely. Absolutely. So I can, 
I can say um, to our thousands of viewers again at the moment um, that um, we'd expect um, can you on, Peter? something to be, um, something will be um, announced and towards the end of the year. We'll, we'll provide an update on the work as to where we're at and then we'll come back to the community once we've done that detailed cool. design Thank work further Jake between that. now and the end of the year, okay. certainly. Yes. Okay. John? Uh, I might turn to the um, outcome report of the Burrell Lake Princess Highway co-design co -design process. Um, this has been repeatedly delayed. There were hopes in November 21. Was first, there was then promised for release in early 2022, uh, then mid-2022. When will Transport for New South Wales release the report on the preferred route? Me again, if I, if I may. Sure. Um, th this has been a challenging one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but we believe we're nearly there and we are intending to recommence conversations with the Brill Lake community uh, in September. Um, the, the challenge has been to try and find the solution to the Milton Ulladulla bypass, which the communities of Milton and Ulladulla are obviously you know, very positive about. But when we set up the, the co-design committee, <coughs> they raised a number of um, very important concerns. Um, and it was important for us to stop and understand or well, listen to those concerns and then look for appropriate solutions. Um, the community are obviously very concerned about maintaining the, the feel of their, their village or the, the feel of their community, um, and we agree. Um, some of the proposed solutions um, involved um, bypasses of Beryl to the west, which would have had some fairly significant environmental impacts, so they weren't necessarily mm. great solutions either. So we've actually spent quite a bit of time trying to find the right solution um, that that allows us to go ahead with the Milton Ulladulla bypass as a priority project, but um, will hopefully um, provide um, a, an adequate solution for the people of Burra Lake. Mm. And so that's, so, so promising work hopefully, given the difficulties, acknowledging the difficulties, this has been heavily contested. Um, does that mean that you've reopened the consultation process or is this all internal work? Is that, uh, there's a community view on the 1st of July when the minister was there that um, the commitment was there, that the consultation process would be recommenced. No, we, we intend to go back out now and, right. and but there was no point turning up to the community yeah, without a until you to put in front of them. Yep, I, so, I and we can, yeah. we can present the, the report from the co-design committee, but if we don't have yeah, yeah, no, solutions sensible. or an appropriate response, it, it would seem a bit half-hearted. Yeah, so, so you'll have a new view, and, but you intend to go back and consult yes. um, fully on that. When will that occur? Yeah, <laughs> yep, um, in September, so within the next in few September. weeks. September, great. Yep. And, um, Will, the, will you be going back with a preferred route or expanding the scope of the potential routes or just give us some sense, will there be one option on the table here that's really preferred that you think threads the needle well, well, and or again, a few options? Not, not up to me to be announcing what it is, yeah. obviously that, that's for the Minister, but yes, we, we've landed on what we believe is an appropriate solution. Yes, yeah, okay, so we're, yes, all right, uh, thank you for that answer. Um, okay. Um, Country Passenger Transport Infrastructure Grants. Um, now, I, I understand that these grants provide subsidies to support the construction or upgrade of bus stop infrastructure, generally owned and maintained by local councils across country New South Wales. Um, the, my question is that councils in Newcastle, Wollongong and the Central Coast have been excluded from accessing funds to upgrade public transport infrastructure. Um, what's the policy rationale for that? Actually, my apologies, I think that is me. <laughs> can, I, can I ask for a little bit more detail on, on your question? Well, if I, I look at the... Um, Newcastle, Wollongong and Central Coast Councils are not eligible for funding under the Country Passenger Transport Infrastructure Grant Scheme, um, and, um, you know, which provides um, funding um, to upgrade you know, local bus stops and, and facilities. And I'm just trying to understand why, why that's the case. I would, I would need to go and look at the terms of, of, of reference for the, for the CTIPS program. Um, I don't have that in front of me now, but I'd be, be happy to take that on notice. 
If, if you would, I mean, for instance, a person with disability living in Port Stephens can catch a bus in Raymond Terrace, but can't get off in Newcastle as there may not be appropriate facilities. Mm. This doesn't seem. Um, Central Coast has 35% of its population over the age of 65 um, years. Um, and so, but how can Central Coast Council fund upgrades to bus stops that are necessary for all of these clients? Um, buses go over the border of Maitland at Woodbury into Newcastle at Beresfield on an hourly basis. Why shouldn't a person with disability from Woodbury who wants to go to the shops at Beresfield be able to benefit from funding from the government to make their trip possible just because the two suburbs are in different local government areas? So I don't think it's an unreasonable question. Um, to ask what, what is the, not the political decision, but what's the policy basis on why um, one LGA has been included but another hasn't when there doesn't seem to be any real disparate um, 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 reason as to from one location or another. I'm not talking about something in the middle of Sydney. I'm talking about a region where. So if you could take that on notice. Yes, but happy to take that on notice. What's the policy basis for that? Yep. OK. Shall do. Now, I'm going to do two. Yep. So I'm going to do these. OK. Um, I just want to ask about the um, changes that were made to uh, the registration costs, given the changes that were made to the definition for primary producers. This was uh, part of a um, legislative change. Uh, I think it happened in 2021. It would have been October. Um, this was supported by both um, sides of politics. Um, but it, changed, it tightened effectively the definition of primary producers. Uh, for my, I just had two questions here, I think. Firstly, for people who formerly would have had a vehicle that was uh, within that definition of primary producers but now do not, what is the assessment now about how much extra uh, they're paying for their heavy vehicle registration? Uh, I'm afraid I'll have to take that on notice. Um, uh, Ms McCarthy uh, is, <laughs> is the person who uh, let so is across that go, one, but uh, <laughs> happy to we, uh, revert on that. OK. That I'm aware useful. of it, but I'm not, not across the detail, I'm afraid. And uh, I do want to ask this question as well. What is the quantum of funding that will be raised by these changes? We'll take that on notice and revert to you. Yes, yeah, and I, I yep. do want... Uh, Secretary, want to put that question strongly because I asked about this at the time, uh, around the time of the changes, in fact, in the debate, and the government was putting the view that um, they had no idea what this, they were unable to inform the parliament what the uh, what this would mean. Um, I mean, we supported the changes, but there were obvious concerns that it might be revenue raising. Um, I'm now, we're now significantly on from that October 2021 debate. What we want to know is, looking back, what has this meant? Has this raised money or not? What's the quantum? Um, yes, but, I, uh, I understand the context. Uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, and then I'll put, uh, I might ask you to do that one, and then I'll come back. Oh, you're done? OK, let me just uh, pause. I wanted to ask about the community transport contract negotiations. Where are we up to with these negotiations? I'll just hand over to Ms Wise. Thank you. Certainly. Um, the community transport contracts, we have put them in place from the 1st of July this year, so there are, yep. they're in place. They're in place until um, June of next year, which is all we had an indication from the Commonwealth at the time of the signing of the contracts, which was um, actually during the federal <coughs> government caretaker period in May and June of this mm. year. Since then, the Commonwealth has come out and um, indicated that they would extend the existing funding programs for, for community transport for a further year in line with the Aged Care Royal Commission recommendations. Mm. Mm. Um, obviously, we can't extend any further contracts with 
community transport providers until such time as the Commonwealth gives us something to sign mm. ourselves, sure. assuming they wish to contract with us um, to do that, rather than going directly with the to the operators. Mm. So the contracts are in place until uh, 2023, June 2023. June, so to the end of June 2023. Yep. And um, do you have a, any sense of when you might get that answer, that answer in those discussions with the Commonwealth that would allow you to um, then extend that support? Um, I can only go on what has been past practice, and past practice has left it pretty late in yes. the, in the yeah. year to, to be able to do that. Um, so it was not until May, for example, of this year that we were able to confirm um, anything for, mm. f f for this year. So yeah, and that obviously has a whole lot of knock-on impacts on yeah. staffing. and It, yeah, it does all, make all it quite challenging at, yeah. at that time to um, get things in place in time. Yeah, okay. Is there anything that could be done to um, improve that dynamic, in your view? Um, I, it would be speculative. I, it will depend to some extent on what decision the new federal government wanted to do with the program or if they're going to make any significant policy mm. change or not. Yeah. And I can't really comment on that. Right. Can I just ask some brief questions about community transport contracts, please? Um, um, yep, yep, yep. Um, we discussed this um, briefly this morning. Um, there seem to be a number of differing contracts that all finish in 2024. Um, are there going to be significant um, cuts? And I mean, what, what's proposed? Um, um, and what what pro um, changes are proposed to those contracts for 2024, if any? For community transport, yep. um, uh, for the majority of the funding, it, it's actually up to the Commonwealth to make that decision. So I can't really comment. Okay. I think we might just have one more um, session, but then we're, um, we may be in a position to conclude. I just want to check. Um, okay. All right. I think we're, um, Chair, in a position to um, thank the officials for the answers today. We've, that has um, been very helpful from our point of view, so I, I really want to thank you for the answers you've been able to give today. Coming back from sending them all away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. We've got a supplementary, don't worry. About that. <laughs> yeah, no. All right. No worries. Well, that uh, concludes, uh, well, unless the government wants to use their 15 minutes of time. Very comprehensive. Oh, excellent. Um, so that concludes uh, today's session. We thank everyone for their time. Um, and in terms of questions, I notice the committee secretary will be in staff uh, in contact with you, and you'll have 21 days to get back to us. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. The table documents. Been a, been a move. The table documents. Yeah.